the seven deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle to my parents, who gave me everything and asked for nothing. My sister, first and fiercest of my readers from the bumblebees onwards. And my wife, whose love, encouragement and reminders to look up from my keyboard once in a while, made this book so much more than I thought it could be. Contents 1, Day 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9, Day 2 10, Day 3 11, Day 4 12 13, Day 2, Continued, 14, Day 4, Continued, 15 16 17 18 19 20 21, Day 2, Continued, 22, Day 5 23 24 25 26 27, Day 2, Continued, 28, Day 5, Continued, 29 30 31 32, Day 6 33, Day 2, Continued, 34, Day 6, Continued, 35 36 37 38 39, Day 2, Continued, 40, Day 6, Continued, 41 42, Day 2, Continued, 43, Day 7 44 45 46 47 48 49 50 51 52, Day 3, Continued, 53, Day 8 54 55 56 57, Day 2, Continued, 58, Day 8, Continued, 59 60 Acknowledgements A note on the author you are cordially invited to Blackheath House for the masquerade introducing your hosts. The Hardcastle family Lord Peter Hardcastle and Lady Helena Hardcastle and their son, Michael Hardcastle their daughter, Evelyn Hardcastle notable guests Edward Dance, Christopher Pettigrew and Philip Sutcliffe, family solicitors Grace Davies and her brother, Donald Davies, socialites Commander Clifford Harrington, naval officer, retired, Millicent Derby and her son, Jonathan Derby, socialites Daniel Coleridge, professional gambler. Lord Cecil Ravencourt, Banker Jim Rashton, Police Officer Dr. Richard, Dickey, Acker Dr. Sebastian Bell Ted Stanwin Principal Household Staff The Butler, Roger Collins The Cook, M.R.S. Drudge First Maid, Lucy Harper Stabla Master, Alf Miller Artist in Residence, Gregory Gold Lord Ravencourt's Valet, Charles Cunningham Evelyn Hardcastle's Lady's Maid, Madeline Aubert We ask all guests to kindly refrain from discussing Thomas Hardcastle and Charlie Carver, as the tragic events surrounding them still grieve the family greatly one day when I forget everything between footsteps. Anna I finished shouting, snapping my mouth shut in surprise. My mind has gone blank. I don't know who Anna is or why I'm calling her name. I don't even know how I got here. I'm standing in a forest shielding my eyes from the spitting rain. My heart's thumping, I reek of sweat and my legs are shaking. I must have been running but I can't remember why. How did I'm cut short by the sight of my own hands? They're bony, ugly. A stranger's hands. I don't recognize them at all. Feeling the first touch of panic, I try to recall something else about myself, a family member, my address, age, anything but nothing's coming. I don't even have a name. Every memory I had a few seconds ago is gone. My throat tightens, breaths coming loud and fast. The forest is spinning, black spots inking my sight. Be calm. I can't breathe, I gasp, blood roaring in my ears as I sink to the ground, my fingers digging into the dirt. You can breathe, you just need to calm down. There's comfort in this inner voice, cold authority. Close your eyes, listen to the forest. Collect yourself. Obeying the voice, I squeeze my eyes shut but all I can hear is my own panicked wheezing. For the longest time it crushes every other sound, but slowly, ever so slowly, I work a hole in my fear, allowing other noises to break through. Raindrops are tapping the leaves, branches rustling overhead. There's a stream away to my right and crows in the trees, their wings cracking the air as they take flight. Something scurrying in the undergrowth, the thump of rabbit feet passing near enough to touch. One by one I knit these new memories together until I've got five minutes of past to wrap myself in. It's enough to staunch the panic, at least for now. I get to my feet clumsily, surprised by how tall I am, 
how far from the ground I seem to be. Swaying a little, I wipe the wet leaves from my trousers, noticing for the first time that I'm wearing a dinner jacket, the shirt splattered with mud and red wine. I must have been at a party. My pockets are empty and I don't have a coat, so I can't have strayed too far. That's reassuring. Judging by the light, it's morning, so I've probably been out here all night. No one gets dressed up to spend an evening alone, which means somebody must know I'm missing by now. Surely, beyond these trees, a house is coming awake in alarm, search parties striking out to find me. My eyes roam the trees, half expecting to see my friends emerging through the foliage, pats on the back and gentle jokes escorting me back home, but daydreams won't deliver me from this forest, and I can't linger here hoping for rescue. I'm shivering, my teeth chattering. I need to start walking, if only to keep warm but I can't see anything except trees. There's no way to know whether I'm moving towards help, or blundering away from it. At a loss, I return to the last concern of the man I was. Anna. Whoever this woman is, she's clearly the reason I'm out here, but I can't picture her. Perhaps she's my wife, or my daughter. Neither feels right, and yet there's a pull in the name. I can feel it trying to lead my mind somewhere. Anna. I shout, more out of desperation than hope. Help me, a woman screams back. I spin, seeking the voice, dizzying myself, glimpsing her between distant trees, a woman in a black dress running for her life. Seconds later, I spot her pursuer crashing through the foliage after her. You there, stop, I yell, but my voice is weak and weary, they trample it underfoot. Shock pins me in place, and the two of them are almost out of sight by the time I give chase, flying after them with a haste I'd never have thought possible from my aching body. Even so, no matter how hard I run, they're always a little ahead. Sweat pours off my brow, my already weak legs growing heavier until they give out, sending me sprawling into the dirt. Scrambling through the leaves, I heave myself up in time to meet her scream. It floods the forest sharp with fear, and is cut silent by a gunshot. Anna. I call out desperately. Anna. There's no response, just the fading echo of the pistol's report. Thirty seconds. That's how long I hesitated when I first spotted her and that's how far away I was when she was murdered. Thirty seconds of indecision, thirty seconds to abandon somebody completely. There's a thick branch by my feet and, picking it up, I swing it experimentally, comforted by the weight and rough texture of the bark. It won't do me very much good against a pistol, but it's better than investigating these woods with my hands in the air. I'm still panting, still trembling after the run, but guilt nudges me in the direction of Anna's scream. Wary of making too much noise, I brush aside the low-hanging branches, searching for something I don't really want to see. Twigs crack to my left. I stop breathing listening fiercely. The sound comes again, footsteps crunching over leaves and branches, circling around behind me. My blood runs cold, freezing me in place. I don't dare look over my shoulder. The cracking of twigs moves closer, shallow breaths only a little behind me. My legs falter, the branch dropping from my hands. I would pray, but I don't remember the words. Warm breath touches my neck. I smell alcohol and cigarettes, the odor of an unwashed body. East, a man rasps, dropping something heavy into my pocket. The presence recedes, his steps retreating into the woods as I sag, pressing my forehead to the dirt, inhaling the smell of wet leaves and rot, tears running down my cheeks. My relief is pitiable, my cowardice lamentable. I couldn't even look my tormentor in the eye. What kind of man am I? It's some minutes before my fear thaws sufficiently for me to move and even then I'm forced to lean against a nearby tree to rest. The murderer's gift jiggles in my pocket and dreading what I might find I plunge my hand inside, withdrawing a silver compass. Oh. I say, surprised. The glass is cracked and the metal scuffed, the initials SB engraved on the underside. I don't understand what they mean, but the killer's instructions were clear. 
I'm to use the compass to head east. I glance at the forest guiltily. Anna's body must be near, but I'm terrified of the killer's reaction should I arrive upon it. Perhaps that's why I'm alive, because I didn't come any closer. Do I really want to test the limits of his mercy? Assuming that's what this is. For the longest time, I stare at the compass's quivering needle. There's not much I'm certain of anymore, but I know murderers don't show mercy. Whatever game he's playing, I can't trust his advice and I shouldn't follow it, but if I don't. I search the forest again. Every direction looks the same, trees without end beneath a sky filled with spite. How lost do you have to be to let the devil lead you home? This lost, I decide. Precisely this lost. Easing myself off the tree, I lay the compass flat in my palm. It yearns for north, so I point myself east, against the wind and cold, against the world itself. Hope has deserted me. I'm a man in purgatory, blind to the sins that chased me here. To the wind howls, the rain has picked up and is hammering through the trees to bounce ankle high off the ground as I follow the compass. Spotting a flash of color among the gloom, I wade towards it, coming upon a red handkerchief hammered to a tree the relic of some long-forgotten child's game I'd guess. I search for another, finding it a few feet away, then another and another. Stumbling between them, I make my way through the murk until I reach the edge of the forest, the trees giving way to the grounds of a sprawling Georgian manor house, its red brick facade entombed in ivy. As far as I can tell it's abandoned. The long gravel driveway leading to the front door is covered in weeds, and the rectangle lawns either side of it are marshland, their flowers left to wither in the verge. I look for some sign of life, my gaze roaming the dark windows until I spot a faint light on the first floor. It should be a relief, yet still I hesitate. I have the sense of having stumbled upon something sleeping, that uncertain light the heartbeat of a creature vast and dangerous and still. Why else would a murderer gift me this compass, if not to lead me into the jaws of some greater evil? It's the thought of Anna that drives me to take the first step. She lost her life because of those thirty seconds of indecision and now I'm faltering again. Swallowing my nerves, I wipe the rain from my eyes and cross the lawn, climbing the crumbling steps to the front door. I hammer it with a child's fury, dashing the last of my strength on the wood. Something terrible happened in that forest, something that can still be punished if I can only rouse the occupants of the house. Unfortunately, I cannot. Despite beating myself limp against the door, nobody comes to answer it. Cupping my hands, I press my nose to the tall windows either side, but the stained glass is thick with dirt, reducing everything inside to a yellowy smudge. I bang on them with my palm stepping back to search the front of the house for another way in. That's when I notice the bell pull, the rusty chain tangled in ivy. Wrenching it free, I give it a good yank and keep going until something shifts behind the windows. The door's opened by a sleepy-looking fellow so extraordinary in his appearance that for a moment we simply stand there, gawping at each other. He's short and crooked, shriveled by the fire that scarred half his face. Over large pajamas hang off a coat hanger frame, a ratty brown dressing gown clinging to his lopsided shoulders. He looks barely human, a remnant of some prior species lost in the folds of our evolution. Oh, thank heavens, I need your help, I say, recovering myself. He looks at me, mouth agape. Do you have a telephone? I try again. We need to send for the authorities. Nothing. Don't just stand there, you devil. I cry, shaking him by the shoulders, before pushing past him into the entrance hall, my jaw dropping as my gaze sweeps the room. Every surface is glittering, the checked marble floor reflecting a crystal chandelier adorned with dozens of candles. Framed mirrors line the walls, a wide staircase with an ornate railing sweeping up towards a gallery, a narrow red carpet flowing down the steps like the blood of some slaughtered animal. A door bangs at the rear of the room, and half a dozen servants appear from deeper in the house, their arms laden with pink and purple flowers, the scent just about covering the smell of hot wax. All conversation stops when they notice the nightmare panting by the door. 
one by one they turned towards me, the hall holding its breath. Before long, the only sound is the dripping of my clothes on their nice clean floor. Plink! 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 Sebastian! A handsome blonde fellow in a cricket sweater and linen trousers is trotting down the staircase two steps at a time. He looks to be in his early fifties, though age has left him decadently rumpled rather than weary and worn. Keeping his hands in his pockets, he crosses the floor towards me, cutting a straight line through the silent servants, who part before him. I doubt he even notices them so intent are his eyes upon me. My dear man, what on earth happened to you? he asks, concern crumpling his brow. Last I saw we must fetch the police, I say, clutching his forearm. Anna's been murdered. Shocked whispers spring up around us. He frowns at me, casting a quick glance at the servants, who've all taken a step closer. Anna, he asks in a hushed voice. Yes, Anna, she was being chased. By whom? Some figure in black we must involve the police. Shortly, shortly, let's go up to your room first, he soothes, ushering me towards the staircase. I don't know if it's the heat of the house, or the relief of finding a friendly face, but I'm beginning to feel faint, and I have to use the banister to keep from stumbling as we climb the steps. A grandfather clock greets us at the top, its mechanism rusting, seconds turn to dust on its pendulum. It's later than I thought. Almost 10.30 a.m. passages either side of us lead off into opposite wings of the house, although the one into the east wing is blocked by a velvet curtain that's been hastily nailed to the ceiling, a small sign pinned to the material proclaiming the area under decoration. Impatient to unburden myself of the morning's trauma, I try again to raise the issue of Anna, but my Samaritan silences me with a conspiratorial shake of the head. These damnable servants will smear your words up and down the house in half a minute he says, his voice low enough to scoop off the floor. Best we talk in private. He's away from me in two strides, but I can barely walk in a straight line, let alone keep pace. My dear man, you look dreadful, he says, noticing that I've fallen behind. Supporting my arm, he guides me along the passage, his hand at my back, fingers pressed against my spine. Though it's a simple gesture, I can feel his urgency as he leads me along a gloomy corridor with bedrooms either side, maids dusting inside. The walls must have been recently repainted for the fumes are making my eyes water, further evidence of a hurried restoration gathering as we progress along the passage. Mismatched stain is splashed across the floorboards, rugs laid down to try and muffle creaking joints. Wing-back chairs have been arranged to hide the cracks in the walls, while paintings and porcelain vases attempt to lure the eye from crumbling cornices. Given the extent of the decay, such concealment seems a futile gesture. They've carpeted a ruin. Ah, this is your bedroom, isn't it, says my companion, opening a door near the end of the corridor. Cold air slaps me in the face, reviving me a little, but he walks ahead to close the raised window it's pouring through. Following behind, I enter a pleasant room with a four-poster bed sitting in the middle of the floor, its regal bearing only slightly let down by the sagging canopy and threadbare curtains, their embroidered birds flying apart at the seams. A folding screen has been pulled across the left side of the room, an iron bathtub visible through the gaps between the panels. Other than that, furniture sparse just a nightstand and a large wardrobe near the window, both of them splintered and faded. About the only personal item I can see is a King James Bible on the nightstand, its cover worn through and pages dog-eared. As my Samaritan wrestles with the stiff window, I come to stand beside him, the view momentarily driving all else from my mind. Dense forest surrounds us, its green canopy unbroken by either a village or a road. Without that compass, without a murderer's kindness, I'd never have found this place and yet I cannot shake the feeling that I've been lured into a trap. After all, why kill Anna and spare myself, if there wasn't some grander plan behind it? What does this devil want from me that he couldn't take in the forest? Slamming the window shut, my companion gestures to an armchair next to a subdued fire, and, passing me a crisp white towel from the cupboard, he sits down on the edge of the bed, 
tossing one leg across the other. Start at the beginning, old love, he says. There isn't time, I say, gripping the arm of the chair. I'll answer all your questions in due course, but we must first call for the police and search those woods. There's a madman loose. His eyes flicker across me, as though the truth of the matter is to be found in the folds of my soiled clothing. I'm afraid we can't call anybody, there's no line up here, he says, rubbing his neck. But we can search the woods and send a servant to the village should we find anything. How long will it take you to change? You'll need to show us where it happened. Well, I'm wringing the towel in my hands it's difficult, I was disorientated. Descriptions then, he says, hitching up a trouser leg, exposing the grey sock at his ankle. What did the murderer look like? I never saw his face, he was wearing a heavy black coat. And this Anna? She was also wearing black, I say, heat rising into my cheeks as I realize this is the extent of my information. I, well, I only know her name. Forgive me, Sebastian, I assumed she was a friend of yours. No. I stammer. I mean, perhaps. I can't be certain. Hands dangling between his knees, my Samaritan leans forward with a confused smile. I'm missing something, I think. How can you know her name, but not be certain my memory is lost, damn it, I interrupt, the confession thudding on the floor between us. I can't remember my own name, let alone those of my friends. Skepticism billows up behind his eyes. I can't blame him even to my ears, this all sounds absurd. My memory has no bearing on what I witnessed, I insist, clutching at the tatters of my credibility. I saw a woman being chased, she screamed and was silenced by a gunshot. We have to search those woods. I see, he pauses, brushing some lint from a trouser leg. His next words are offerings, carefully chosen and even more carefully placed before me. Is there a chance the two people you saw were lovers? Playing a game in the woods, perhaps? The sound might have been a branch cracking, even a starter's pistol. No, no, she called for help, she was afraid, I say, my agitation sending me leaping from the chair, the dirty towel thrown on the floor. Of course, of course, he says reassuringly, watching me pace. I do believe you, my dear fellow but the police are so precise about these things and they do delight in making their betters look foolish. I stare at him helplessly, drowning in a sea of platitudes. Her killer gave me this, I say, suddenly remembering the compass, which I tug from my pocket. It's smeared with mud, forcing me to wipe it clean with my sleeve. There are letters on the back, I say, pointing a trembling finger towards them. He views the compass through narrowed eyes turning it over in methodical fashion. S.B., he says slowly, looking up at me. Yes. Sebastian Bell. He pauses, weighing my confusion. That's your name, Sebastian. These are your initials. This is your compass. My mouth opens and closes, no sound coming out. I must have lost it, I say, eventually. Perhaps the killer picked it up. Perhaps, he nods. It's his kindness that knocks the wind out of me. He thinks I'm half mad, a drunken fool who spent the night in the forest and came back raving. Yet instead of being angry, he pities me. That's the worst part. Anger's solid, it has weight. You can beat your fists against it. Pity's a fog to become lost within. I drop into the chair, my head cradled in my hands. There's a killer on the loose and I have no way of convincing him of the danger. A killer who showed you the way home? I know what I saw, I say. You don't even know who you are. I'm sure you do, says my companion, mistaking the nature of my protest. I stare at nothing, thinking only of a woman called Anna lying dead in the forest. Look, you rest here, he says, standing up. I'll ask around the house see if anybody's missing. Maybe that will turn something up. His tone is conciliatory, but matter of fact. 
Kind as he's been to me, I cannot trust his doubt will get anything done. Once that door closes behind him, he'll scatter a few half-hearted questions among the staff, while Annalise abandoned. I saw a woman murdered, I say, getting to my feet wearily. A woman I should have helped, and if I have to search every inch of those woods to prove it, I'll do so. He holds my gaze a second, his skepticism faltering in the face of my certainty. Where will you start, he asks. There are thousands of acres of forest out there, and for all your good intentions, you could barely make it up the stairs. Whoever this Anna is, she's already dead and her murderers fled. Give me an hour to gather a search party and ask my questions. Somebody in this house must know who she is and where she went. We'll find her, I promise, but we have to do it the right way. He squeezes my shoulder. Can you do as I ask? One hour, please. Objections choke me, but he's right. I need to rest, to recover my strength, and as guilty as I feel about Anna's death, I do not want to stalk into that forest alone. I barely made it out of there the first time. I submit with a meek nod of the head. Thank you, Sebastian, he says. A bath's been run. Why don't you clean yourself up? I'll send for the doctor and ask my valet to lay out some clothes for you. Rest a little, we'll meet in the drawing room at lunchtime. I should ask after this place before he leaves, my purpose here, but I'm impatient for him to start asking his questions so we can get on with our search. Only one question seems important now and he's already opened the door by the time I find the words to ask it. Do I have any family in the house? I ask. Anybody who might be worried about me. He glances at me over his shoulder, wary with sympathy. You're a bachelor, old man. No family to speak of beyond a dotty aunt somewhere with a hand on your purse strings. You have friends, of course, myself among them, but whoever this Anna is, you've never mentioned her to me. Truth be told, until today, I've never even heard you say the name. Embarrassed. He turns his back on my disappointment and disappears into the cold corridor, the fire flickering uncertainly as the door closes behind him. Three I'm out of my chair before the draft fades, pulling open the drawers in my nightstand, searching for some mention of Anna among my possessions, anything to prove that she isn't the product of a lurching mind. Unfortunately, the bedroom is proving remarkably tight-lipped. Aside from a pocketbook containing a few pounds, the only other personal item I come across is a gold embossed invitation, a guest list on the front and a message on the back, written in an elegant hand. Lord and Lady Hardcastle request the pleasure of your company at a masquerade ball celebrating the return of their daughter, Evelyn, from Paris. Celebrations will take place at Blackheath House over the second weekend of September. Owing to Blackheath's isolation, Transport to the house will be arranged for all of our guests from the nearby village of Aberley. The invitation is addressed to Dr. Sebastian Bell, a name it takes me a few moments to recognize as my own. My Samaritan mentioned it earlier, but seeing it written down, along with my profession, is an altogether more unsettling affair. I don't feel like a Sebastian, let alone a doctor. A wry smile touches my lips. I wonder how many of my patients will stay loyal when I approach them with my stethoscope on upside down. Tossing the invitation back into the drawer, I turn my attention to the Bible on the nightstand, flipping through its well-thumbed pages. Paragraphs are underlined, random words circled in red ink, though for the life of me I can't make sense of their significance. I'd been hoping to find an inscription or a letter concealed inside, but the Bible's empty of wisdom. Clutching it in both hands, I make a clumsy attempt at prayer, hoping to rekindle whatever faith I once possessed, but the entire endeavor feels like foolishness. My religion has abandoned me along with everything else. The cupboard is next and though the pockets of my clothes turn up nothing, I discover a steamer trunk buried beneath a pile of blankets. It's a beautiful old thing, the battered leather wrapped in tarnished iron bands, a heavy clasp protecting the contents from prying eyes. A London address my address presumably is written in the slip, though it stirs no recollection. Taking off my jacket, I heave the trunk onto the bare floorboards, 
the contents clinking with every jolt. A murmur of excitement escapes me as I press the button on the clasp, transforming into a groan when I discover the damned thing is locked. I tug at the lid, once, twice, but it's unyielding. I search the open drawers and sideboard again, even dropping to my stomach to look under the bed, but there's nothing under there but pellets of rat poison and dust. The key isn't anywhere to be found. The only place I haven't searched is the area around the bathtub, and I round the folding screen like a man possessed, nearly leaping out of my skin when I discover a wild-eyed creature lurking on the other side. It's a mirror. The wild-eyed creature looks as abashed as I at this revelation. Taking a tentative step forward, I examine myself for the first time, disappointment swelling within me. Only now, staring at this shivering, frightened fellow, do I realize that I had expectations of myself. Taller, shorter, thinner, fatter, I don't know, but not this bland figure in the glass. Brown hair, brown eyes and no chin to speak of, I'm any face in a crowd, just the Lord's way of filling in the gaps. Quickly tiring of my reflection, I continue searching for the key to my trunk but aside from some toiletries and a jug of water, there's nothing back here. Whoever I used to be, it appears I tidied myself away before disappearing. I'm on the verge of howling in frustration when I'm interrupted by a knock on the door, an entire personality conveying itself in five hearty raps. Sebastian, are you there, says a gruff voice. My name's Richard Acker. I'm a doctor. I was asked to look in on you. I open the door to find a huge grey moustache on the other side. It's a remarkable sight, the tips curling off the edge of the face they're theoretically attached to. The man behind it is in his sixties, perfectly bald, with a bulbous nose and bloodshot eyes. He smells of brandy, but cheerfully so, as though every drop went down smiling. Lord, you look dreadful, he says. And that's my professional opinion. Taking advantage of my confusion, he strolls past me, tossing his black medical case onto the bed and having a good look around the room, paying particular attention to my trunk. Used to have one of these myself, he says, running an affectionate hand across the lid. Lavolel, isn't it? Took me to the Orient and back when I was in the army. They say you shouldn't trust a Frenchman but I couldn't do without their luggage. He gives it an experimental kick, wincing as his foot bounces off the obstinate leather. You must have bricks in there, he says, cocking his head at me expectantly, as though there's some sensible response to such a statement. It's locked, I stammer. Can't find the key, hmm. I, no. Dr. Acker, I call me Dicky. everybody else does, he says briskly going to the window to peer outside. I've never enjoyed the name truth be told, but I can't seem to shake it. Daniel says you've suffered a misfortune. Daniel. I ask, just about holding on to the back of the conversation as it streaks away from me. Coleridge. Chap who found you this morning. Right, yes. Dr. Dickey beams at my bafflement. Memory loss, is it? Well. Not to worry, I saw a few of these cases in the war and everything came back after a day or so, whether the patient wanted it to or not. He shoes me towards the trunk, making me sit down on top of it. Tilting my head forward, he examines my skull with a butcher's tenderness, chuckling as I win CE. Oh, yes, you've a nice bump back here. He pauses, considering it. Probably banged your head at some point last night. I'd imagine that's when it all spilled out, so to speak. Any other symptoms, headaches, nausea, that sort of thing? There's a voice, I say, a little embarrassed by the admission. A voice. In my head. I think it's my voice, only, well, it's very certain about things. I see, he says thoughtfully. And this, voice, what does it say? It gives me advice. Sometimes it comments on what I'm doing. Dickie's pacing behind me, tugging his mustache. This advice, is it, how should I say, all above board? Nothing violent, nothing perverse. Absolutely not, 
I say, riled by the inference. And are you hearing it now? No trauma, he says abruptly, raising a finger in the air. That's what it'll be, very common in fact. Somebody bangs their head and all manner of strange things start going on. They see smells, taste sounds, hear voices. Always passes in a day or two, month at the outside. A month. I say, spinning on the trunk to look at him. How am I going to manage like this for a month? Perhaps I should visit a hospital. God no, terrible things, hospitals, he says, aghast. Sickness and death swept into corners, diseases curled up in the beds with the patients. Take my advice and go for a stroll, root through your belongings, talk to some friends. I saw you and Michael Hardcastle sharing a bottle at dinner last night, several bottles actually. Quite an evening by all accounts. He should be able to help, and mark my words, once your memories return, that voice will be no more. He pauses, tutting. I'm more concerned by that arm. We're interrupted by a knock on the door, Dickie opening it before I can protest. It's Daniel's valet delivering the pressed clothes he promised. Sensing my indecision, Dickie takes the clothes, dismisses the valet and lays them out on the bed for me. Now, where were we, he says. Ah, yes, that arm. I follow his gaze to find blood drawing patterns on my shirt sleeve. Without preamble, he tugs it up to reveal ugly slashes and tattered flesh beneath. They look to have scabbed over, but my recent exertions must have reopened the wounds. After bending my stiff fingers one by one, he fishes a small brown bottle and some bandages from his bag, cleaning my injuries before dabbing them in iodine. These are knife wounds, Sebastian, he says in a concerned voice, all his good cheer turned to ash. Recent ones, too. It looks like you held your arm up to protect yourself, like so. He demonstrates with a glass dropper from his medical bag, slashing violently at his forearm which he's raised in front of his face. His reenactment is enough to bring me out in goosebumps. Do you recall anything of the evening, he says, binding my arm so tightly that I hiss in pain. Anything at all. I push my thoughts towards my missing hours. Upon waking I'd assumed everything was lost, but now I perceive this isn't the case. I can sense my memories just out of reach. They have weight and shape like shrouded furniture in a darkened room. I've simply misplaced the light to see them by. With a sigh, I shake my head. Nothing's forthcoming, I say. But this morning I saw a woman murdered, interrupts the doctor. Yes, Daniel told me. Doubt stains every word, but he knots my bandage without voicing any objection. Either way, you need to inform the police immediately, he says. Whoever did this was trying to cause you significant harm. Lifting his case from the bed, he clumsily shakes my hand. Strategic retreat, my boy, that's what's required here, he says. Talk to the Stabla master, he should be able to arrange transport back to the village, and from there you can rouse the constabulary. In the meantime, it's probably best you keep a weather eye out. There are twenty people staying in Blackheath this weekend and thirty more arriving for the ball tonight. Most of them aren't above this sort of thing, and if you've offended them, well he shakes his head be careful, that's my advice. He lets himself out and I hurriedly take the key from the sideboard to lock the door after him, my shaking hands causing me to miss the hole more than once. An hour ago, I'd thought myself a murderer's plaything, tormented, but beyond any physical threat. Surrounded by people, I felt safe enough to insist we try recovering Anna's body from the forest, thereby spurring the search for her killer. That's no longer the case. Somebody's already tried to take my life, and I have no intention of staying long enough for them to try again. The dead cannot expect a debt from the living, and whatever I owe Anna will have to be paid at distance. Once I've met with my Samaritan in the drawing room, I'm going to follow Dickie's advice and arrange transport back to the village. It's time I went home. Four water slops over the edges of the bathtub as I quickly slough off the second skin of mud and leaves coating me. 
I'm inspecting my scrubbed pink body for birthmarks or scars, anything that might trigger a memory. I'm due downstairs in 20 minutes, and I know nothing more of Anna than when I first stumbled up Blackheath's steps. Banging into the brick wall of my mind was frustrating enough when I thought I'd be helping with the search, but now my ignorance could scupper the entire endeavor. By the time I'm finished washing, the bathwater is as black as my mood. Feeling despondent, I towel myself dry and inspect the pressed clothes the valet dropped off earlier. His selection of attire strikes me as rather prim, but peering at the alternatives in the wardrobe, I immediately understand his dilemma. Belle's clothing for truly, I can't yet reconcile us consists of several identical suits, two dinner jackets, hunting wear, a dozen shirts and a few waistcoats. They come in shades of grey and black, the bland uniform of what appears thus far to be an extraordinarily anonymous life. The idea that this man could have inspired anybody to violence is becoming the most outlandish part of this morning's events. I dress quickly, but my nerves are so ragged. It takes a deep breath and a stern word to coax my body towards the door. Instinct prompts me to fill my pockets before I leave, my hand leaping towards the sideboard only to hover there uselessly. I'm trying to collect possessions that aren't there and I can no longer remember. This must be Belle's old routine, a shadow of my former life haunting me still. The pull is so strong, I feel damn queer coming away empty-handed. Unfortunately, the only thing I managed to carry back from the forest was that damnable compass but I can't see it anywhere. My Samaritan the man Dr. Dickey called Daniel Coleridge must have taken it. Agitation pricks me as I step into the corridor. I only have a morning's worth of memories and I can't even keep hold of those. A passing servant directs me to the drawing room, which turns out to be on the far side of the dining hall, a few doors down from the marble entrance hall I entered this morning. It's an unpleasant place, the dark wood and scarlet drapes bringing to mind an over-large coffin, the coal fire breathing oily smoke into the air. A dozen people are gathered, and though a table's been laid with cold cuts, most of the guests are flopped in leather armchairs or standing at the leaded windows, staring mournfully at the frightful weather, while a maid, with jam stains on her apron, slips unobtrusively among them gathering dirty plates and empty glasses onto a huge silver tray she can barely hold. A rotund fellow in green hunting tweeds has set himself up on the pianoforte in the corner and is playing a body tune that causes offense only for the ineptness of its delivery. Nobody is paying much attention to him, though he's doing his best to rectify that. It's almost midday, but Daniel is nowhere to be seen and so I busy myself inspecting the various decanters in the drinks cabinet without any clue as to what they are, or what I enjoy. In the end, I pour myself something brown and turn to stare at my fellow guests, hoping for a flash of recognition. If one of these people is responsible for the wounds on my arm, their irritation at seeing me hale and healthy should be obvious. And, surely, my mind wouldn't conspire to keep their identity secret should they choose to reveal themselves? Assuming of course my mind can find some way of telling them apart. Nearly every man is a braying, beef-faced bully in hunting tweeds, while the women are dressed soberly in skirts, linen shirts and cardigans. Unlike their boisterous husbands, they move in hushed tones, finding me from the corner of their eyes. I have the impression of being surreptitiously observed, like a rare bird. It's terribly unsettling, though understandable I suppose. Daniel couldn't have asked his questions without revealing my condition in the process. I'm now part of the entertainment, whether I like it or not. Nursing my drink, I attempt to distract myself by eavesdropping on the surrounding conversations, a sensation akin to sticking my head into a rose bush. Half of them are complaining, the other half are being complained at. They don't like the accommodation, the food, the indolence of the help, the isolation, or the fact they couldn't drive up themselves, though heaven knows how they would have found the place. Mostly though, their ire is reserved for the lack of a welcome from Lady Hardcastle, who has yet to surface despite many of them having arrived in Blackheath last night a fact they appear to have taken as a personal insult. Excuse me, Ted, says the maid, trying to squeeze past a man in his fifties. He's broad-chested and sunburnt beneath a thinning crop of red hair. 
hunting tweeds stretch around a thick body that's slipping towards fat, his face lit by bright blue eyes. Ted, he says angrily, grabbing her wrist and squeezing hard enough to make her win CE. Who the hell do you think you're talking to, Lucy? It's Mr. Stanwin to you, I'm not downstairs with the rats anymore. She nods, shocked, searching our faces for help. Nobody moves, even the piano bites its tongue. They're all terrified of this man, I realize. To my shame, I'm little better. I'm frozen in place, watching this exchange from the corner of my lowered eyes, desperately hoping his vulgarity doesn't turn in my direction. Let her go, Ted, says Daniel Coleridge from the doorway. His voice is firm, cold. It clatters with repercussions. Stanwin breathes through his nose, staring at Daniel out of narrowed eyes. It shouldn't be a contest. Stanwin is squat and solid and spitting venom. Yet there's something in the way Daniel stands there, hands in his pockets, head tilted, that gives Stanwin pause. Perhaps he's wary of being hit by the train Daniel appears to be waiting for. A clock drums up its courage and ticks. With a grunt, Stanwin releases the maid, brushing past Daniel on his way out, muttering something I can't quite hear. The room breathes, the piano resumes, the heroic clock carrying on as though nothing happened. Daniel's eyes weigh us one by one. Unable to face his scrutiny, I stare at my reflection in the window. There's disgust on my face, revulsion at the endless shortcomings of my character. First the murder in the woods, and now this. How many injustices will I allow to walk by before I pluck up the courage to intervene? Daniel approaches. A ghost in the glass. Bell, he says softly, laying a hand on my shoulder. Do you have a minute? Hunched beneath my shame, I follow him into the study next door, every pair of eyes at my back. It's even gloomier in here, untrimmed ivy shrouding the leaded windows, paintings in dark oils soaking up what little light manages to squirm through the glass. A writing desk has been arranged with a view onto the lawn, and looks recently vacated a fountain pen leaking ink onto a torn piece of blotting paper, a paper knife beside it. One can only imagine the missives written in such an oppressive atmosphere. In the opposite corner, near a second door out of the room, a puzzled young man in hunting tweets is peering down the speaker of a phonograph, clearly wondering why the spinning record isn't flinging sound into the room. A single term at Cambridge and he thinks he's Isambard Kingdom Brunel, says Daniel, causing the young man to look up from his puzzle. He's no more than twenty-four, with dark hair and wide, flattened features that give the impression of his face being pressed up against a pane of glass. Seeing me, he grins broadly, the boy and the man appearing as if through a window. Belly, you bloody idiot, there you are, he says, squeezing my hand and clapping me on the back at the same time. It's like being caught in an affectionate vice. He searches my face expectantly, his green eyes narrowing at my lack of recognition. It's true then, you can't remember a thing, he says, tossing a quick glance at Daniel. You lucky devil. Let's get to the bar so I can introduce you to a hangover. News travels fast in Blackheath, I say. Boredom's very flat ground, he says. Name's Michael Hardcastle. We're old friends though I suppose we're better described as recent acquaintances now. There's no hint of disappointment in the statement. In fact, he seems amused by it. Even at first meeting, it's evident Michael Hardcastle will be amused by most things. Michael was sat next to you at dinner last night, says Daniel, who's taken up Michael's inspection of the gramophone. Come to think of it, that's probably why you went out and coshed yourself on the head. Play along, Belly, we're hoping one day he'll accidentally say something funny, says Michael. There's an instinctive pause for my rejoinder, the rhythm of the moment collapsing under the weight of its absence. For the first time since I woke up this morning, I feel a yearning for my old life. I miss knowing these men. I miss the intimacy of this friendship. My sorrow is mirrored on the faces of my companions, an awkward silence digging a trench between us. Hoping to recover at least some of the trust we must once have shared, 
I roll up my sleeve to show them the bandages covering my arm, blood already beginning to seep through. I wish I had coshed myself on the head, I say. Dr. Dickey believes somebody attacked me last night. My dear fellow, gasps Daniel. This is because of that damn note, isn't it, says Michael, his eyes tracing my injuries. What are you talking about, Hardcastle, asks Daniel, raising his eyebrows. Are you saying you know something about this? Why didn't you say so earlier? There's not much to it, says Michael sheepishly, digging at the thick carpet with the toe of his shoe. A maid brought a note to the table during our fifth bottle of wine. Next thing I know Belly's making his excuses and trying to remember how doors work. He looks at me, shamefaced. I wanted to go with you, but you were adamant you had to go alone. I assumed you were meeting some woman or other so I didn't press the issue, and that was the last I saw of you until now. What did the message say? I ask. Haven't the foggiest, old bean, I didn't see it. Do you remember the maid who brought it, or if Belle mentioned anybody called Anna, asks Daniel. Michael shrugs, wrapping his entire face around the memory. Anna. Doesn't ring any bells, I'm afraid. As for the maid, well, he puffs up his cheeks, blowing out a long breath. Black dress, white apron. Oh, dash it all, Coleridge, be reasonable. There's dozens of them, how's a man meant to keep track of their faces? He hands each of us a helpless look, Daniel meeting it with a disgusted shake of the head. Don't worry, old boy, we'll get to the bottom of all this, he says to me, squeezing my shoulder. And I've an idea how. He motions towards a framed map of the estate hanging on the wall. It's an architectural drawing, rain spotted and yellowing at the edges, but quite beautiful in its depiction of the house and grounds. As it turns out, Blackheath is a huge estate with a family graveyard to the west and a stable to the east, a trail winding down to a lake with a boathouse clinging to the bank. Aside from the driveway, which is actually a stubborn road cutting straight towards the village, Everything else is forest. As the view from the upper windows suggests, we're quite alone among the trees. A cold sweat prickles my skin. I was meant to disappear in that expanse, as Anna did this morning. I'm searching for my own grave. Sensing my disquiet, Daniel glances at me. Lonely sort of place, isn't it? He murmurs, tapping a cigarette loose from a silver case. It dangles from his lower lip as he searches his pockets for a lighter. My father brought us out here when his political career keeled over, says Michael, lighting Daniel's cigarette and taking one for himself. The old man fancied himself a country squire. Didn't work out quite the way he'd hoped, of course. I raise a questioning eyebrow. My brother was murdered by a chap called Charlie Carver, one of our groundskeepers, says Michael calmly as though declaring the racing results. Aghast that I could forget something so horrific, I stammer out an apology. I'm... I'm sorry, that must have been a terribly long time ago, interrupts Michael, a hint of impatience in his voice. Nineteen years, in fact. I was only five when it happened, and truthfully, I can barely recall it. Unlike most of the gutter press, adds Daniel. Carver and another fellow drank themselves into a mania and grabbed Thomas near the lake. They half drowned him, then finished the job with a knife. He was seven or so. Ted Stanwin came running and drove them off with a shotgun, but Thomas was already dead. Stanwin? I ask, struggling to keep the shock from my voice. The loud from lunch. Oh, I wouldn't go saying that too loudly, says Daniel. He's very well thought of by my parents as old Stanwin, says Michael. He was a lowly gamekeeper when he tried to save Thomas, but father gave him one of our African plantations and thanks and the blighter made his pile. What happened to the murderers? I ask. Carver swung, says Daniel, tapping ash onto the carpet. The police found the knife he used under the floorboards in his cottage, along with a dozen pilfered bottles of brandy. His accomplice was never caught. Stanwin says he clipped him with the shotgun, 
but no one turned up at the local hospital with an injury and Carver refused to give him up. Lord and Lady Hardcastle were hosting a party that weekend, so it could have been one of the guests, but the family were adamant that none of them knew Carver. Rum business all round, says Michael tonelessly, his expression black as the clouds crowding the windows. So the accomplice is still out there. I say, dread creeping up my spine. A murder 19 years ago and a murder this morning. Surely that can't be a coincidence. Does make you wonder what the police are for, doesn't it, says Daniel, falling silent. My eyes find Michael, who's staring into the drawing room. It's emptying out as the guests drift towards the entrance hall, carrying their conversations with them. Even from here, I can hear the stinging, swirling swarm of insults touching on everything from the rundown state of the house, to Lord Hardcastle's drunkenness, and Evelyn Hardcastle's icy demeanor. Poor Michael, I can't imagine how it must feel to have one's family so openly ridiculed, in their own home no less. Look, we didn't come here to bore you with ancient history, says Daniel, fracturing the quiet. I've been asking around after Anna. It's not good news, I'm afraid. Nobody knows her. There isn't anybody by that name among the guests or the staff, says Michael. More to the point, nobody's missing from Blackheath. I open my mouth to protest, but Michael holds his hand up, silencing me. You never let me finish, Belly. I can't gather a search party, but the chaps are going hunting in about ten minutes. If you give me a vague idea where you woke up this morning, I'll make sure we head in that direction and keep our eyes open. Fifteen of us are going out, so there's a good chance we'll spot something. Gratitude swells in my chest. Thank you, Michael. He smiles at me through a cloud of cigarette smoke. I've never known you to overegg the pudding, Belly, can't imagine you're doing it now. I stare at the map, eager to do my part but I have no clue where I spotted Anna. The murderer pointed me east and the forest disgorged me towards the front of Blackheath, but I can only guess for how long I walked or where I may have started from. Taking a breath and trusting to Providence, I prod the glass with my fingertip as Daniel and Michael hover over my shoulder. Michael nods, rubbing his chin. I'll tell the chaps. He looks me up and down. You'd better get changed. We'll be leaving soon. I'm not coming, I say, my voice strangled by shame. I have to. I just can't, the young man shifts awkwardly. Come now use your head, Michael, interrupts Daniel, clapping a hand on my shoulder. Look what was done to him. Poor Bell barely got out of that forest, why would he want to go back? His tone softens. Don't you worry, Bell. We'll find your missing girl, and the man who murdered her. It's in our hands now. Get yourself as far away from this mess as you can. Five I stand at the leaded window, half concealed by the velvet drapes. Out on the driveway, Michael is mingling with the other men. They're heaving beneath their thick coats, shotguns crooked over their elbows, laughing and chatting, cold breath escaping their lips. Freed from the house with a slaughter to enjoy they seem almost human. Daniel's words were comforting, but they can't absolve me. I should be out there with them, searching for the body of the woman I failed. Instead, I'm running away. The very least I can do is endure the shame of watching them set off without me. Dogs pass by the window, straining at leads their masters are struggling to hold. The two commotions merge, striking off across the lawn towards the forest in precisely the direction I indicated to Daniel, although I can't see my friend among them. He must be joining the group later. I wait for the last of them to disappear among the trees before returning to the map on the wall. If it's correct, the stables aren't too far from the house. Surely that's where I'll find the Stabla master. He can arrange a carriage to the village and from there I'll catch a train home. I turn for the drawing room only to find the doorway blocked by a huge black crow. My heart leaps, and so do I, straight into the sideboard, sending family photographs and trinkets clattering to the floor. You don't need to be afraid, says the creature, taking a half step out of the gloom. 
it's not a bird at all. It's a man dressed as a medieval plague doctor, his feathers a black greatcoat, the beak belonging to a porcelain mask, glinting in the light of a nearby lamp. Presumably this is his costume for the ball tonight, though that doesn't explain why he's wearing such sinister garb in the middle of the day. You startled me, I say, clutching my chest and laughing in embarrassment as I try to shake off my fright. He cocks his head, examining me as if I'm a stray animal he's found sitting on the carpet. What did you bring with you, he asks. I'm sorry. You woke up with a word on your lips, what was it? Do we know each other? I ask, glancing through the door into the drawing room, hoping to see another guest. Unfortunately, we're alone, which was almost certainly his intention, I realize with growing alarm. I know you, he says. That's enough for now. What was the word, please? Why not take off the mask so we might speak face to face, I say. My mask is the least of your concerns, Dr. Bell, he says. Answer the question. Though he's said nothing threatening, the porcelain muffles his voice, adding a low animal rumble to every sentence. Anna, I say, clamping my hand on my thigh to stop my leg from jogging. He sighs. That's a pity. Do you know who she is? I say, hopefully. Nobody else in the house has ever heard of her. I'd be surprised if they had, he says, waving away my question with a gloved hand. Reaching into his coat, he pulls out a golden pocket watch, tutting at the time. We'll have work to do before long, but not today and not while you're in this state. We'll speak again soon, when everything's a little clearer. In the meantime, I'd advise you to acquaint yourself with Blackheath and your fellow guests. Enjoy yourself while you can, doctor, the footman will find you soon. The footman. I say, the name ringing an alarm bell somewhere deep within me. Is he responsible for Anna's murder, or the wounds on my arm? I very much doubt it, says the plague doctor. The footman isn't going to stop with your arm. There's a tremendous thump behind me and I spin towards the noise. A small splash of blood smears the window, a dying bird thrashing the last of its life away among the weeds and withered flowers below. The poor thing must have flown into the glass. I'm startled by the pity I feel, a tear creeping into my eye at this wasted life. Resolving to bury the bird before I do anything else, I turn around, intending to make my excuses to my enigmatic companion, but he's already left. I look at my hands. They're clutched so tightly my fingernails are digging into my palms. The footman, I repeat to myself. The name means nothing, but the feeling it evokes is unmistakable. For some reason, I'm terrified of this person. Fear carries me over to the writing desk and the letter opener I saw earlier. It's small, but sharp enough to draw blood from the tip of my thumb. Sucking the wound, I pocket the weapon. It's not much, but it's enough to stop me barricading myself in this room. Feeling a touch more confident, I head for my bedroom. Without the guests to distract from the decor, Blackheath is a melancholy pile indeed. Aside from the magnificent entrance hall, the other rooms I pass through are musty, thick with mildew and decay. Pellets of rat poison have been piled up in the corners, dust covering any surface too high for a maid's short arm to reach. The rugs are threadbare, the furniture scratched, the smeared silver crockery arranged behind the dirty glass of display cabinets. As unpleasant as my fellow guests seem, I miss the thrum of their conversations. They're the lifeblood of this place, filling up the spaces where otherwise this grim silence would fall. Blackheath's only alive so long as people are in it. Without them, it's a depressing ruin waiting on the mercy of a wrecking ball. I collect my coat and umbrella from my bedroom and make my way outside where rain is bouncing off the ground, the air smothered by the stink of rotten leaves. Uncertain of which window the bird crashed against, I follow the verge until I locate its body, and, using the paper knife as a makeshift shovel, I bury it in a shallow grave, soaking my gloves in the process. Already shivering, I consider my route. The cobbled road to the stable skirts the bottom edge of the lawn. I could cut across the grass, 
but my shoes seem ill-suited to the venture. Instead, I take the safer option, following the gravel driveway until the road appears on my left. Unsurprisingly, it's in a terrible state of repair. Tree roots have overturned the stones, untrimmed branches hang low like pilfering fingers. Still unsettled by my meeting with the strange man in the plague doctor costume, I clutch the paper knife and move slowly, wary of losing my footing, afraid of what might spring out at me from the woods if I do. I'm not sure what his game is, dressing up like that, but I can't seem to shrug off his warnings. Somebody murdered Anna, and gave me a compass. It's doubtful that same person attacked me last night only to save me this morning, and now I must contend with this footman. Who must I have been to assemble so many enemies? At the end of the road is a tall, red brick arch with a shattered glass clock at the center, and beyond that a courtyard, stables and outbuildings arranged around its edge. Troughs overflow with oats, and carriages stand wheel to wheel, draped in green canvas covers to keep the weather off. The only things missing are the horses. Every stable is empty. Hello. I call out tentatively, my voice echoing around the yard but meeting no response. A plume of black smoke is escaping from the chimney of a little cottage and, finding the door unlocked, I chase my hollered greetings inside. No one's home, which is curious as a fire's burning in the hearth, porridge and toast laid out on the table. Removing my soggy gloves, I hang them on the kettle pole above the fire, hoping to spare myself a little discomfort on the walk back. Touching the food with a fingertip, I discover it's lukewarm, so not long abandoned. A saddle lies discarded beside a leather patch, suggesting an interrupted repair. I can only assume whoever lives here has rushed out to deal with some emergency and I consider waiting for them to return. It's not an unpleasant refuge, though the air's thick with burning coal and smells rather strongly of polish and horsehair. Of greater concern is the cottage's isolation. Until I know who attacked me last night, everybody in Blackheath must be treated with caution including the Stabla master. I will not meet him alone, if it can be helped. A work rota hangs on a nail by the door, a pencil dangling from a piece of string beside it. Taking it down, I turn the sheet over intending to leave a message requesting a ride to the village, but there's a note already written there. Don't leave Blackheath, more lives than your own are depending on you. Meet me by the mausoleum in the family graveyard at 10.20 p.m. and I'll explain everything. Oh, and don't forget your gloves, they're burning. Love, and a smoke fills my nostrils and I swing round to see my gloves smoldering above the fire. Snatching them down, I stamp the ashes out, eyes wide and heart pounding, as I search the cottage for some indication as to how the trick might have come to pass. Why don't you ask Anna when you meet her tonight? Because I saw her die, I snarl at the empty room, embarrassing myself. Recovering my composure, I read the note once more, the truth of it no nearer at hand. If Anna's survived, she'd have to be a cruel creature to play such games with me. More likely after word of this morning's misadventure spread around the house, somebody has decided to play a trick on me. Why else would they choose such a sinister location and hour for the meeting? Is this somebody a fortune teller? It's a foul day, anybody could have predicted I'd dry my gloves once I arrived. The cottage listens politely, but even to my ears that reasoning's desperate. Almost as desperate as my urge to discredit the message. So defective is my character, I'd happily abandon any hope of Anna being alive in order to flee this place with a clean conscience. Feeling miserable, I pull on my singed gloves. I need to think and walking seems to help. Heading around the stables, I come upon an overgrown paddock, the grass grown waist high and the fences so badly rotted they've all but collapsed. On the far side, two figures huddle beneath an umbrella. They must be following a hidden path as they're moving easily, arm in arm. Heaven knows how they spot me, but one of them raises a hand in greeting. I return the gesture, sparking a brief moment of distant kinship before they disappear into the gloom of the trees. Lowering my hand, I make my decision. I told myself that a dead woman could lay no claim to me, and that's why I was free to leave Blackheath. It was a coward's reason, 
but at least it had a ring of truth to it. If Anna's alive, that's no longer the case. I failed her this morning, and it's all I've thought about since. Now that I have a second chance, I cannot turn my back. She's in danger and I can help, so I must. If that's not enough to keep me at Blackheath, I don't deserve the life I'm so fearful of losing. Come what may, I must be in the graveyard at 10.20 p.m. 6. Somebody wants me dead. It feels strange to say it out loud, as though I'm calling fate down upon myself, but if I'm to survive until this evening, I'll need to face down this fear. I refuse to spend any more time cowering in my bedroom. Not while there are so many questions to answer. I'm walking back to the house, scouring the trees for any sign of danger, my mind running back and forth across the morning's events. Over and over again I wonder about the slashes on my arm and the man in the plague doctor costume, the footman, and this mysterious Anna, who now appears to be alive and well, and leaving enigmatic notes for me to find. How did she survive in the forest? I suppose she could have written the note earlier this morning, before she was attacked, but then how did she know I'd be in that cottage, drying my gloves over the fire? I didn't tell anybody about my plans. Did I speak out loud? Could she have been watching? Shaking my head, I take a step away from that particular rabbit hole. I'm looking too far forward, when I need to be looking back. Michael told me that a maid delivered a note to the dinner table last night, and that was the last he saw of me. Everything started with that. You need to find the servant who brought the note. I'm barely through Blackheath's doors when voices pull me towards the drawing room which is empty aside from a couple of young maids clearing the lunchtime detritus onto two huge trays. They work side by side, heads bowed in hushed gossip, oblivious to my presence at the door. Henrietta said she'd gone mad, says one girl, brown curls tumbling free of her white cap. It's not right to say that about Lady Helena, Beth, scolds the older girl. She's always been good to us, treated us fair, hasn't she? Beth weighs this fact against the wealth of her gossip. Henrietta told me she was raving, she continues. Screaming at Lord Peter. Said it was probably on account of being back in Blackheath after what happened to Master Thomas. Does funny things to a person, she said. She says a lot of things does Henrietta, I'd put them out of your mind. Not like we haven't heard them fighting before, is it? Besides, if it were serious Lady Helena would tell M.R.S. Drudge, wouldn't she? Always does. M.R.S. Drudge can't find her, says Beth triumphantly, the case against Lady Helena well and truly proven. Hasn't seen her all morning, but my entrance slaps the words out of the air, the maids attempting startled curtsies that swiftly devolve into a tangle of arms, legs and blushes. Waving away their confusion, I ask after the servants who served dinner last night, prompting only blank stares and mumbled apologies. I'm on the verge of giving up, when Beth ventures that Evelyn Hardcastle is entertaining the ladies in the sunroom towards the rear of the house and would certainly know more. After a brief exchange, one of them leads me through a communicating door into the study where I met Daniel and Michael this morning. There's a library beyond it, which we cross briskly exiting the room into a dim connecting passage. Darkness stirs to greet us, a black cat drifting out from beneath a small telephone table, its tail dusting the wooden floor. On silent feet, it pads up the corridor, slipping through a door left slightly ajar at the far end. A warm orange light is seeping through the gap, voices and music on the other side. Miss Evelyn's in there, sir, says the maid. Her tone succinctly describes both the room and Evelyn Hardcastle, neither of which she seems to hold in particularly high regard. Brushing off her scorn, I open the door, the heat of the room hitting me full in the face. The air is heavy, sweet with perfume, stirred only by a scratchy music that soars and glides and stuns itself against the walls. Large leaded windows look out over the garden at the rear of the house, grey clouds piling up beyond a cupola. Chairs and chaise longs have been gathered around the fire, young women draped over them like wilted orchids, smoking cigarettes and clinging to their drinks. The mood in the room is one of restless agitation rather than celebration. 
About the only sign of life comes from an oil painting on the far wall, where an old woman with coals for eyes sits in judgment of the room, her expression rather eloquently conveying her distaste for this gathering. My grandmother, Heather Hardcastle, says a woman from behind me. It's not a flattering picture, but then she wasn't a flattering woman by all accounts. I turn to meet the voice, reddening as a dozen faces swim up through their boredom to inspect me. My name runs laps of the room, a sudden excited buzz chasing it like a swarm of bees. Sitting either side of a chess table are a woman I must assume to be Evelyn Hardcastle and an elderly, extremely fat man wearing a suit that's a size too small for him. They're an odd couple. Evelyn's in her late twenties, and rather resembles a shard of glass with her thin, angular body and high cheekbones, her blonde hair tied up away from her face. She's wearing a green dress, fashionably tailored and belted at the waist, its sharp lines mirroring the severe expression on her face. As for the fat man, he can't be less than sixty-five, and I can only imagine what contortions must have been necessary to persuade his enormous bulk behind the table. His chair's too small for him, too stiff. He's a martyr to it. Sweat is gleaming on his forehead, the soaking wet handkerchief clutched in his hand testifying to the duration of his suffering. He's looking at me queerly, an expression somewhere between curiosity and gratitude. My apologies, I say. I was Evelyn slides upon forward without looking up from the board. The fat man returns his attention to the game, engulfing his knight with a fleshy fingertip. I surprise myself by groaning at his mistake. You know chess? Evelyn asks me, her eyes still fixed on the board. It appears so, I say. Then perhaps you would play after Lord Ravencourt. Ignorant of my warning, Ravencourt's knight swaggers into Evelyn's trap, only to be cut down by a lurking rook. Panic takes hold of his play as Evelyn urges her pieces forward, hurrying him when he should be patient. The game's over in four moves. Thank you for the diversion, Lord Ravencourt, says Evelyn, as he topples his king. Now, I believe you had somewhere else to be. It's a curt dismissal and with an awkward bow, Ravencourt disentangles himself from the table and limps out of the room, offering me the slightest of nods on the way. Evelyn's distaste chases him through the door, but it evaporates as she gestures to the seat opposite. Please, she says. I'm afraid I can't, I say. I'm looking for a maid who brought me a message at the dinner table last night, but I know nothing more of her. I was hoping you could help. Our butler could, she says, restoring the pieces of her bedraggled army to their line. Each is placed precisely at the center of a square, its face turned towards the enemy. Clearly, there's no place for cowards on this board. Mr. Collins knows every step every servant takes in this house, or so he leads them to believe, she says. Unfortunately, he was assaulted this morning. Dr. Dickey had him moved to the gatehouse so he could rest more comfortably. I've actually been meaning to look in on him myself, perhaps I could escort you. I momentarily hesitate, weighing the danger. One can only assume that if Evelyn Hardcastle intended me harm, she wouldn't announce our intention to go off together in front of an entire room of witnesses. That would be very kind, I respond, earning a flicker of a smile. Evelyn stands either not noticing or pretending not to notice the curious glances nudging us. There are French doors onto the gardens, but we forego them, departing instead from the entrance hall, so we might collect our coats and hats from our bedrooms first. Evelyn's still tugging hers on as we step out of Blackheath into the blustery, cold afternoon. May I ask what happened to Mr. Collins? I say, wondering if perhaps his assault might be linked to my own last night. Apparently he was set upon by one of our guests, an artist named Gregory Gold, she says, nodding her thick scarf. It was an unprovoked attack by all accounts, and Gold managed to thrash him pretty soundly before somebody intervened. I should warn you, doctor, Mr. Collins has been heavily sedated, so I'm not sure how helpful he'll be. We're following the gravel driveway that leads to the village and, once again, I'm struck by the peculiarity of my condition. At some point in the last few days, I must have arrived along this very road, 
happy and excited, or perhaps annoyed at the distance and isolation. Did I understand the danger I was in, or did it come later during my stay? So much of me is lost, memories simply blown aside like the leaves on the ground, and yet here I stand, remade. I wonder if Sebastian Bell would approve of this man I've become. If we'd even get along? Without a word, Evelyn links an arm through my own, a warm smile transforming her face. It's as though a fire has been kindled within, her eyes sparkling with life, banishing the shrouded woman of earlier. It's so good to be out of that house, she cries, tipping her face to meet the rain. Thank goodness you came along when you did, doctor. Honestly, a minute later and you'd have found me with my head in the grate. Lucky I stopped by then, I say, somewhat startled by her change in mood. Sensing my confusion, Evelyn laughs lightly. Oh, don't mind me, she says. I loathe getting to know people, so whenever I meet somebody I like, I just assume a friendship immediately. It saves a great deal of time in the long run. I can see the appeal, I say. May I ask what I did to earn a favorable impression? Only if you allow me to be frank in my answer. You're not being frank now. I was trying to be polite, but, you're right, I never seem to land on the right side of the fence, she says with mock regret. Well, to be frank, I like your pensiveness, doctor. You strike me as a man who'd much rather be somewhere else, a feeling I can wholeheartedly sympathize with. Am I to assume you're not enjoying your homecoming? Oh, this hasn't been my home in a very long time, she says, skipping over a large puddle. I've lived in Paris for the last 19 years, ever since my brother was killed. What about the women I saw you with in the sunroom, are they not your friends? They arrived this morning and, truth be told, I didn't recognize a single one of them. The children I knew have shed their skins and slithered into society. I'm as much a stranger here as yourself. At least you're not a stranger to yourself, Miss Hardcastle, I say. Surely you can take some solace in that. Quite the contrary, she says, looking at me. I imagine it would be rather splendid to wander away from myself for a little while. I envy you. Envy. Why not, she says, wiping the rain from her face. You're a soul-stripped bear, doctor. No regrets, no wounds, none of the lies we tell ourselves so we can look in the mirror each morning. Your she bites her lip, searching for the word honest. Another word for that is exposed, I say. Am I to take it you're not enjoying your homecoming? There's a crook in her smile, a slight twist of the lips that could easily be damning, yet somehow comes across as conspiratorial. I'm not the man I'd hoped to be, I say quietly, surprised by my own candor. Something about this woman puts me at ease though for the life of me I can't tell what it is. How so? she asks. I'm a coward, Miss Hardcastle, I sigh. Forty years of memories wiped away and that's what I find lurking beneath it all. That's what remains to me. Oh, do call me Evie, that way I can call you Sebastian and tell you not to fret about your flaws. We all have them, and if I were newly born into this world, I might be cautious too, she says squeezing my arm. You're very kind, but this is something deeper, instinctive. Well, so what if you are, she asks. There are worse things to be. At least you're not mean-spirited or cruel. And now you get to choose, don't you? Instead of assembling yourself in the dark like the rest of us so that you wake up one day with no idea of how you became this person you can look at the world, at the people around you and choose the parts of your character you want. You can say, I'll have that man's honesty, that woman's optimism, as if you're shopping for a suit on Savile Row. You've made my condition into a gift, I say, feeling my spirits lift. Well, what else would you call a second chance, she asks. You don't like the man you were, very well, be somebody else. There's nothing stopping you, not anymore. As I said, I envy you. The rest of us are stuck with our mistakes. I have no response to that, 
though one is not immediately required. We've arrived upon two giant fence posts, fractured angels blaring their noiseless horns on top. The gatehouse is set back among the trees on our left, splashes of its red tile roof showing through the dense canopy. A path leads towards a peeling green door, which is swollen with age and riddled with cracks. Ignoring it, Evelyn pulls me by the fingers towards the back of the house, pushing through branches so overgrown they're touching the crumbling brickwork. The back door is held fast with a simple latch, and undoing it, she lets us into a dank kitchen, a layer of dust coating the countertops, the copper pans still out on the hob. Once inside, she pauses, listening intently. Evelyn. I say. Motioning for quiet, she takes a step closer to the corridor. Unsettled by this sudden caution, my body tenses, but she breaks the spell with laughter. I'm sorry, Sebastian, I was listening out for my father. Your father? I say, puzzled. He's staying here, she says. He's supposed to be out hunting, but I didn't want to risk bumping into him if he was running late. I'm afraid we don't like each other terribly much. Before I have the chance to ask any more questions, she beckons me into a tiled hallway and up a narrow staircase the bare wooden steps shrieking beneath our feet. I keep to her heels, snatching backward glances every few steps. The gatehouse is narrow and crooked, doors set into the walls at odd angles like teeth grown wild in a mouth. Wind whistles through the windows carrying with it the smell of the rain, the entire place seeming to rattle on its foundations. Everything about this house seems designed to unseat the nerves. Why put the butler all the way out here? I ask Evelyn who's trying to choose between the doors either side of us. There must have been somewhere more comfortable. All the rooms in the main house are full, and Dr. Dickey ordered peace and quiet, and a good fire. Believe it or not, this might be the best place for him. Come on, let's try this one, she says, rapping lightly on a door to our left, pushing it open when there's no response. A tall fellow in a charcoal-stained shirt is bound by his wrists and dangling from a hook on the ceiling, his feet only barely touching the floor. He's unconscious, a head full of dark curly hair slumped against his chest, blood speckling his face. Nope, must be the other side, says Evelyn, her voice bland and unconcerned. What the devil? I say, taking a step back in alarm. Who is this man, Evelyn? This is Gregory Gold, the fellow who assaulted our butler, says Evelyn, eyeing him as one would a butterfly pinned to a corkboard. The butler was my father's batman during the war. Seems father's taken the assault rather personally. Personally? I say. Evie, he's been strung up like a pig. Father's never been a subtle man, or a particularly clever one, she shrugs. I suspect the two things go hand in hand. For the first time since I awoke, my blood is boiling. Whatever this man's crimes, justice can't be served by a length of rope in a locked room. We can't leave him like this, I protest. It's inhuman. What he did was inhuman, says Evelyn, her chill touching me for the first time. Mother commissioned Gold to tidy up a few of the family portraits, nothing more. He didn't even know the butler and yet this morning he took after him with a poker and beat him half to death. Believe me, Sebastian, he deserves worse than what's happening to him here. What's to become of him? I ask. A constable is coming from the village, says Evelyn, ushering me out of the small room, and closing the door behind us, her mood brightening immediately. Father wants to let Gold know of his displeasure in the meantime, that's all. Ah, this must be the one we wanted. She opens another door on the opposite side of the hall, and we enter a small room with whitewashed walls and a single window blinded by dirt. Unlike the rest of the house, there's no draft in here and a good fire's burning in the grate, plenty of wood stacked nearby to feed it. There's an iron bed in the corner, the butler shapeless beneath a grey blanket. I recognize this chap. It's the burnt man who let me in this morning. Evelyn was right, he's been cruelly treated. His face is hideously bruised and livid with cuts, dried blood staining the pillowcase. 
I might have mistaken him for dead if it weren't for his constant murmuring, distress poisoning his sleep. A maid is sitting beside him in a wooden chair, a large book open in her lap. She can't be more than twenty-three, small enough to tuck into a pocket, with blonde hair spilling from beneath her cap. She looks up as we enter, slamming the book closed and leaping to her feet when she realizes who we are, hastily smoothing out her white apron. Miss Evelyn, she stammers, eyes on the floor. I didn't know you'd be visiting. My friend here needed to see Mr. Collins, says Evelyn. The maid's brown eyes flick towards me, before pinning themselves to the ground once more. I'm sorry, miss, he hasn't stirred all morning, says the maid. The doctor gave him some tablets to help him sleep. And he can't be woken. Haven't tried, miss, but you made an awful racket coming up them stairs and he didn't bat an eyelid. Don't know what else would do it if that didn't. Dead to the world, he is. The maid's eyes find me once again, lingering long enough to suggest some sort of familiarity, before resuming their former contemplation of the floor. I'm sorry, but do we know each other? I ask. No, sir, not really, it's just. I served you at dinner last night. Did you bring me a note? I ask excitedly. Not me. Sir, it was Madeline. Madeline. My lady's maid, interrupts Evelyn. The house was short-staffed so I sent her down to the kitchen to help out. Well, that's fortunate she checks her wristwatch she's taking refreshments out to the hunters, but she'll be back around 3 p.m. We can question her together when she returns. I turn my attention back to the maid. Do you know anything more about the note? I ask. Its contents, perhaps. The maid shakes her head, wringing her hands. The poor creature looks quite on the spot, and, taking pity on her, I offer my thanks and leave. Seven we're following the road to the village, the trees drawing closer with every step. It's not quite what I'd anticipated. The map in the study conjured images of some grand labor, a boulevard hewn from the forest. The reality is little more than a wide dirt track, wretched with potholes and fallen branches. The forest hasn't been tamed so much as bartered with, the hard castles winning the barest of concessions from their neighbor. I don't know our destination, but Evelyn believes we can intercept Madeline on her way back from the hunt. Secretly, I suspect she's simply looking for an excuse to prolong her absence from the house. Not that any subterfuge is necessary. This last hour in Evelyn's company is the first time since waking that I've felt myself a whole person, rather than the remnants of one. Out here, in the wind and rain, with a friend by my side, I'm happier than I have been all day. What do you believe Madeline can tell you, asks Evelyn, picking a branch off the path and tossing it into the forest. The note that she brought me last night lured me out into the woods so somebody could attack me, I say. Attack? interrupts Evelyn, shocked. Here. Why? I don't know, but I'm hoping Madeline can tell me who sent the note. She might even have peeked at the message. There's no might about it, says Evelyn. Madeline was in Paris with me. She's loyal and she makes me laugh, but she's an atrocious maid. She probably considers peeking at other people's mail a perk of the job. That's very lenient of you, I say. I have to be, I can't pay very well, she says. And after she's revealed the contents of the message, what then? I tell the police, I say. And hopefully put this matter to bed. Turning left at a crooked signpost, we follow a small trail into the woods, dirt tracks crisscrossing each other until the way back is impossible to discern. Do you know where you are going? I ask nervously swiping a low-hanging branch from my face. The last time I entered this forest my mind never made it back. We're following these, she says, tugging at a fragment of yellow material nailed to a tree. It's similar to the red one I found when I stumbled upon Blackheath this morning, the memory only serving to unsettle me further. They're markers, she says. The groundskeepers use them to navigate in the woods. Don't worry. I'll not lead you too far astray. 
The words are barely out of her mouth when we enter a small clearing with a stone well at its center. The wooden shelter has collapsed, the iron wheel that once raised the bucket now left to rust in the mud, almost buried by fallen leaves. Evelyn claps in delight, laying an affectionate hand on the mossy stone. She's clearly hoping I haven't noticed the slip of paper tucked between the cracks, or the way her fingers are now covering it. Friendship compels me to play along and I hastily avert my attention when she looks back towards me. She must have some suitor in the house and I'm ashamed to say I'm jealous of this secret correspondence and the person on the other side of it. This is it, she says with a theatrical sweep of her arm. Madeline will be passing through this clearing on her way back to the house. Shouldn't be too long now. She's due back at the house by three to help finish setting up the ballroom. Where are we? I ask, looking around. It's a wishing well, she says, leaning over the edge to peer into the blackness. Michael and I used to come here when we children. We'd make our wishes with pebbles. And what sorts of things did young Evelyn Hardcastle wish for? I ask. She wrinkles her brow, the question flummoxing her. You know, for the life of me, I can't remember, she says. What does a child who has everything want? More, just like everybody else. I doubt I could have told you even when I did have my memories, I say, smiling. Dusting the grime from her hands, Evelyn looks at me quizzically. I can see the curiosity burning inside her, the joy at encountering something unknown and unexpected in a place where everything is familiar. I'm out here because I fascinate her, I realize with a flash of disappointment. Have you thought about what you'll do if your memories don't return? She asks, softening the question with the gentleness of her tone. Now it's my turn to be flummoxed. Since my initial confusion passed, I've tried not to dwell upon my condition. If anything, the loss of my memories has proven a frustration rather than a tragedy, my inability to recall Anna being one of the few moments when it seemed anything more than an inconvenience. Thus far in the excavation of Sebastian Bell I've unearthed two friends, an annotated Bible and a locked trunk. Precious little return for forty years on this earth. I don't have a wife weeping for our lost time together, or a child worrying that the father she loved might not return. At this distance, Sebastian Bell's life seems an easy one to lose and a difficult one to mourn. A branch snaps somewhere in the forest. Footman, says Evelyn my blood immediately running cold as I recall the plague doctor's warning. What did you say? I ask, frantically searching the forest. That noise, it's a footman, she says. They're collecting wood. Shameful, isn't it? We don't have enough servants to stock all the fireplaces, so our guests are having to send their own footmen to do it. They. How many are there? One for every family visiting and there's more coming, she says. I'd say there's already seven or eight in the house. Eight. I say in a strangled voice. My dear Sebastian, are you quite all right, says Evelyn, catching my alarm. Under different circumstances I would welcome this concern, this affection, but here and now her scrutiny only embarrasses me. How can I explain that a strange chap in a plague doctor costume warned me to keep an eye out for a footman a name which means nothing to me, and yet fills me with a crippling fear every time I hear it? I'm sorry, Evie, I say, shaking my head ruefully. There's more I need to tell you, but not here, and not quite yet. Unable to hold her questioning stare, I look around the clearing for a distraction. Three trails intersect before striking off into the forest one of them cutting a straight path through the trees towards water. Is that a lake, says Evelyn, looking past me. The lake, I suppose you'd say. That's where my brother was murdered by Charlie Carver. A shiver of silence divides us. I'm sorry, Evie, I say at last, embarrassed by the poverty of the sentiment. You'll think me awful, but it happened so long ago it barely seems real, she says. I can't even remember Thomas's face. Michael shared a similar sentiment, I say. That's not surprising, he was five years younger than me when it happened. She's hugging herself, her tone distant. 
I was supposed to be looking after Thomas that morning, but I wanted to go riding and he was always pestering me, so I arranged a treasure hunt for the children and left him behind. If I hadn't been so selfish, he'd never have been at the lake in the first place, and Carver wouldn't have got his filthy hands on him. You can't imagine what that thought does to a child. I didn't sleep, barely ate. I couldn't feel anything that wasn't anger or guilt. I was monstrous to anybody who tried to console me. What changed? Michael she smiles wistfully I was vile to him, positively horrid, but he stayed by my side, no matter what I said. He saw I was sad and he wanted to make me feel better. I don't even think he knew what was happening, not really. He was just being nice, but he kept me from drifting away completely. Is that why you went to Paris, to get away from it all? I didn't choose to leave, my parents sent me away a few months after it happened, she says, biting her lip. They couldn't forgive me and I wouldn't have been allowed to forgive myself if I'd stayed. I know it was supposed to be a punishment, but exile was a kindness, I think. And yet you came back. You make it sound like a choice, she says bitterly, tightening her scarf as the wind carves through the trees. My parents ordered my return, they even threatened to cut me out of the will should I refuse. When that didn't work, they threatened to cut Michael out of the will instead. So here I am. I don't understand, why would they behave so despicably and then throw you a party? A party, she says, shaking her head. Oh, my dear man, you really have no idea what's happening here, do you? Perhaps if you my brother was murdered 19 years ago tomorrow, Sebastian. I don't know why, but my parents have decided to mark the occasion by reopening the house where it happened and inviting back the very same guests who were here that day. Anger is rising in her voice, a low throb of pain I'd do anything to make go away. She's turned her head to face the lake, her blue eyes glossy. They're disguising a memorial as a party and they've made me the guest of honor, which I can only assume means something dreadful is coming for me, she continues. This isn't a celebration, it's a punishment, and there'll be fifty people in their very finest clothes watching it happen. Are your parents really so spiteful? I ask, shocked. I feel much as I did when that bird hit the window earlier this morning, a great swell of pity mingled with a sense of injustice at life's sudden cruelties. My mother sent me a message this morning, asking me to meet her by the lake, she says. She never came and I don't think she ever meant to. She just wanted me to stand out there, where it happened, remembering. Does that answer your question? Evelyn. I. I don't know what to say. There's nothing to say, Sebastian. Wealth is poisonous to the soul and my parents have been wealthy a very long time as have most of the guests who will be at this party, says Evelyn. Their manners are a mask, you'd do well to remember that. She smiles at my pained expression, taking my hand. Her fingers are cold, her gaze warm. She has the brittle courage of a prisoner walking their final steps to the gallows. Oh, don't fret, dear heart, she says. I've done all the tossing and turning it's possible to do. I see little benefit in your losing sleep over it also. If you want, you could make a wish in the well on my behalf though I'd understand if you have more pressing concerns. From her pocket she pulls out a small coin. Here, she says, handing it to me. I don't think our pebbles did much good. The coin travels a long way, hitting rock rather than water at the bottom. Despite Evelyn's advice, I hitch no hopes for myself to its surface. Instead, I pray for her deliverance from this place, for a happy life and freedom from her parents' machinations. Like a child I close my eyes in the hopes that when I open them again, the natural order will be overturned, the impossible made plausible by desire alone. You've changed so much, mutters Evelyn, a ripple of emotion disturbing her face, the slightest indication of discomfort when she realizes what she's said. You knew me before. I say, surprised. Somehow it never occurred to me that Evelyn and I might have had a relationship prior to this one. I shouldn't have said anything, she says, walking away from me. Evie, 
I've been in your company for over an hour, which makes you my best friend in this world, I say. Please, be honest with me. Who am I? Her eyes crisscross my face. I'm not the right person to say, she protests. We met two days ago, and only briefly. Most of what I know is innuendo and rumor. I'm sitting at an empty table, I'll take whatever crumbs I'm fed. Her lips are tight. She's tugging her sleeves down awkwardly. If she had a shovel, she'd dig herself an escape tunnel. The deeds of good men are not related so reluctantly, and I'm already beginning to dread what she has to tell me. Even so, I cannot let this go. Please, I plead. You told me earlier I could choose who I wanted to be, but I cannot do that without knowing who I was. Her obstinacy flickers, and she looks up at me from under her eyelashes. Are you certain you wish to know, she asks. The truth isn't always a kindness. Kind or not, I need to understand what's been lost. Not a great deal in my opinion, she sighs, squeezing my hand in both of hers. You were a dope dealer, Sebastian. You made your living alleviating the boredom of the idle rich, and quite a living it was too, if your practice on Harley Street is anything to go by. I'm a, dope dealer, she repeats. Laudanum's the fashion I believe, though from what I understand, your trunk of tricks has something to cater to every taste. I slump within myself. I wouldn't have believed I could be so wounded by the past, but the revelation of my former profession tears a hole right through me. Though my failings were numerous, against them was always stacked the small pride of being a doctor. There was nobility in that course, honor even. But no, Sebastian Bell took the title and twisted it to his own selfish ends, making it perverse, denying what little good remained to him. Evelyn was right, the truth isn't always a kindness, but no man should discover himself this way, like an abandoned house stumbled upon in the darkness. I shouldn't worry about it says Evelyn, cocking her head to catch my averted eye. I see little of that odious creature in the man before me. Is that why I'm at this party? I ask quietly. To sell my wares. Her smile is sympathetic. I suspect so. I'm numb, two steps behind myself. Every strange glance over the course of the day, every whisper and commotion as I walked into a room is explained. I thought people were concerned for my well-being, but they were wondering when my trunk would reopen for business. I feel such a fool. I have to, I'm moving before I understand how that sentence ends, my body carrying me back through the forest at an ever-increasing pace. I'm almost running by the time I arrive on the road. Evelyn's at my heels, struggling to keep up. She's trying to anchor me with words, reminding me of my desire to meet Madeline but I'm impervious to reason, consumed by my hatred for the man I was. His flaws I could accept, perhaps even overcome, but this is a betrayal. He made his mistakes and fled, leaving me holding the tatters of his scorched life. Blackheath's door stands open and I'm up the staircase and into my room so quickly the smell of damp earth still clings to me, as I stand panting over the trunk. Is this what drove me into the forest last night? Is this what I spilled blood for? Well, I'm going to smash it all, and with it any connection to the man I was. Evelyn arrives to find me ransacking my bedroom for something heavy enough to break the lock. Intuiting my purpose, she ducks into the corridor, returning with the bust of some Roman emperor or other. You're a treasure, I say, using it to hammer the lock. When I yanked the trunk out of the cupboard this morning, it was so heavy it took all my strength to lift, but now it's sliding backwards with each blow. Once again Evelyn comes to the rescue, sitting on the trunk to keep it in place, and after three enormous strikes, the lock clatters to the floor. Tossing the bust on the bed, I lift the heavy lid. The trunk's empty. Or at least mostly empty. In a dark corner is a solitary chess piece with Anna's name carved into the base. I think it's time you told me the rest of your story, says Evelyn. A darkness presses up against my bedroom window, its cold breath leaving frost on the glass. The fire hisses in response, the swaying flames my only light. 
Steps hurry down the corridor beyond my closed door, a jumble of voices on their way to the ball. Somewhere in the distance I hear the tremble of a violin coming awake. Stretching my feet towards the fire, I wait for silence. Evelyn asked me to attend both dinner and the party, but I can't mingle with these people, knowing who I am and what it is they really want from me. I'm tired of this house, their games. I'm going to meet Anna at 10.20 p.m. in the graveyard, and then I'll have a stable hand take us to the village, away from this madness. My gaze returns to the chess piece I found in the trunk. I'm holding it up to the light in the hopes of worrying loose some further memories. Thus far it's kept quiet and there's little about the piece itself to illuminate my memory. It's a bishop, hand-carved and freckled with white paint, a far cry from the expensive ivory sets I've seen around the house, and yet, it means something to me. Regardless of any memory there's a feeling associated with it, a sense of comfort almost. Holding it brings me courage. There's a knock on the door, my hand tightening around the chess piece as I start from the chair. The closer I come to the meeting in the graveyard the more highly strung I've become, practically leaping out of the window every time the fire pops in the grate. Belly, you in there, asks Michael Hardcastle. He knocks again. It's insistent. A polite battering ram. Placing the chess piece on the mantel above the fireplace, I open the door. The hall's awash with people in costume, Michael wearing a bright orange suit and fiddling with the straps of a giant sun mask. There you are, he says, frowning at me. Why aren't you dressed yet? I'm not coming. I say. It's been, a wave towards my head, but my sign language is too vague for him. Are you feeling faint? He asks. Should I call Dickie? I just saw him I have to catch Michael's arm to prevent him from flying off down the corridor in search of the doctor. I simply don't feel up to it, I say. Are you sure? There are going to be fireworks and I'm certain my parents have been cooking up a surprise all day. Seems a shame to honestly, I'd rather not. If you're certain, he says reluctantly, his voice as crestfallen as his face. I'm sorry you've had such a wretched day, Belly. Here's hoping tomorrow will be better, with fewer misunderstandings, at least. Misunderstandings. I say. The murdered girl. He smiles in confusion. Daniel told me it was all a big mistake. I felt a right bloody fool calling off the search halfway through. No harm done, though. Daniel? How could he possibly have known Anna was alive? It was a mistake, wasn't it? He asks, noting my bafflement. Of course, I say brightly. Yes, terrible mistake. I'm sorry to have bothered you with it. Not to worry, he says slightly dubiously. Think no more about it. His words are stretched thin, like overburdened elastic. I can hear his doubt, not only in the story, but in the man standing before him. After all, I'm not the person he knew and I think he's coming to realize that I no longer wish to be. This morning I'd have done almost anything to repair the fracture between us, but Sebastian Bell was a drug peddler and a coward, the consort of vipers. Michael was a friend of that man, so how could he ever be a friend of mine? Well, I'd best be off, he says, clearing his throat. Feel better, old man. Wrapping the doorframe with his knuckle, he turns away, following the rest of the guests on their way to the party. I watch him go, digesting the news. I'd quite forgotten about Anna's flight through the woods this morning, our imminent meeting in the graveyard sapping much of the horror from my first memory. And yet, something momentous clearly happened even if Daniel has been telling people it didn't. I'm certain of what I witnessed, the gunshot and the fear. Anna was chased by a figure in black, whom I must now assume to have been the footman. Somehow she survived, as did I after my assault last night. Is that what she wants to talk about? Our mutual enemy, and why he wants us dead. Perhaps he's after the drugs? They're clearly valuable. Maybe Anna's my partner and she removed them from the trunk to keep them out of his hands? That would, at least, explain the presence of the chess piece. 
maybe it's some sort of calling card? After taking my coat from the wardrobe, I wrap myself in a long scarf and slip my hands into a thick pair of gloves, pocketing the paper knife and chess piece on the way out. I'm rewarded by a crisp, cold night. As my eyes adjust to the gloom, I breathe in the fresh air, still damp with the storm, and follow the gravel path around the house towards the graveyard. My shoulders are tense, my stomach unsettled. I'm frightened of this forest, but I'm more frightened by this meeting. When I first awoke I wanted nothing more than to rediscover myself, but last night's misadventure now seems a blessing. Injury has given me the chance to start again, but what if meeting Anna brings all my old memories flooding back? Can this higgledy-piggledy personality I've cobbled together over the course of the day survive such a deluge, or will it be washed away entirely? Will I be washed away? The thought is almost enough to turn me around by the shoulders, but I cannot confront the person I was by running from the life he built. Better to make a stand here, confident of whom I wish to become. Gritting my teeth, I follow the path through the trees, coming upon a small gardener's cottage, the windows dark. Evelyn's leaning against the wall, smoking a cigarette, a lantern burning by her feet. She's wearing a long beige coat and Wellington boots, an outfit somewhat at odds with the blue evening dress beneath it and the diamond tiara sparkling in her hair. She's really quite beautiful, though she carries it awkwardly. She notices me noticing. I didn't have time to change after dinner, she says defensively, tossing her cigarette away. What are you doing here, Evie? I ask. You're supposed to be at the ball. I slipped away. You didn't think I'd miss all the fun, she says, grinding the cigarette beneath her heel. It's dangerous. Then it would be foolish for you to go alone, besides I brought some help. From her handbag. She pulls out a black revolver. Where on earth did you find that? I ask, feeling shocked and slightly guilty. The idea that my problem has put a weapon in Evelyn's hand seems like a betrayal somehow. She should be warm and safe in Blackheath, not out here in harm's way. It's my mother's, so the better question might be where she found it. Evie, you can't Sebastian. You're my only friend in this dreadful place and I'm not going to let you stroll into a graveyard alone, without knowing what's waiting for you. Somebody's already tried to kill you once. I have no intention of letting them try again. A lump of gratitude lodges itself in my throat. Thank you. Don't be silly, it's either this or I stay in that house with everybody's eyes upon me, she says, lifting the lantern into the air. I should be thanking you. Now, shall we go? There'll be hell to pay if I'm not back for the speeches. Darkness weighs heavy on the graveyard, the iron fence buckled, trees bent low over crooked gravestones. Thick piles of rotting leaves smother the plots, the tombs cracked and crumbling, taking the names of the dead with them. I spoke with Madeline about the note you received last night, says Evelyn, pushing open the squeaking gate and leading us inside. I hope you don't mind. Of course, I don't, I say, looking around nervously. It slipped my mind, truth be told. What did she say? Only that the note was given to her by M.R.S. Drudge, the cook. I spoke to her separately, and she told me it had been left in the kitchen, though she couldn't say by whom. There was too much coming and going. And did Madeline read it? I ask. Of course, says Evelyn, wryly. She didn't even blush when she admitted to it. The message was very brief, it asked you to come immediately to the usual spot. That was all. No signature. I'm afraid not. I'm sorry Sebastian, I'd hoped to have better news. We've reached the mausoleum at the far end of the graveyard, a large marble box watched over by two broken angels. A lantern hangs from one of their beckoning hands and though it flickers in the gloom, there's nothing of note to illuminate. The graveyard's empty. Perhaps Anna's running a little late, says Evelyn. Then who left the lantern burning? I ask. My heart is racing, damp seeping up my trousers as I wade through ankle-deep leaves. Evelyn's watch assures us of the time, but Anna's nowhere to be seen. 
there's just that damnable lantern, squeaking as it sways in the breeze, and for fifteen minutes or more, we stand stiff beneath it, the light draping our shoulders, our eyes searching for Anna and finding her everywhere, in the shifting shadows and stirring leaves, the low-hanging branches disturbed by the breeze. Time and again one of us taps the other on the shoulder, drawing their attention to a sudden sound or startled animal darting through the underbrush. As the hour grows later, it's difficult to keep one's thoughts from venturing to more frightening places. Dr. Dickey believed the wounds on my arms were defensive in nature, as though I'd been fending off an assault with a knife. What if Anna isn't an ally, but an enemy? Perhaps that's why her name was fixed in my mind? For all I know, she penned the note I received at the dinner table, and has now lured me out here to finish the job started yesterday evening. These thoughts spread like cracks through my already brittle courage, fear pouring into the hollowness behind. Only Evelyn's presence keeps me upright, her own courage pinning me in place. I don't think she's coming, says Evelyn. No, I rather think not, I say, speaking quietly to mask my relief. Perhaps we should head back. I think so, she says. I'm so sorry, dear heart. With an unsteady hand, I take the lantern down from the angel's arm, and follow Evelyn towards the gate. We've only taken a couple of steps when Evelyn clutches my arm, lowering her flame towards the ground. Light splashes the leaves, revealing blood splattered across their surface. Kneeling down, I rub the sticky substance between my thumb and forefinger. Here, says Evelyn quietly. She's followed the drips to a nearby tombstone where something glitters beneath the leaves. Sweeping them aside, I find the compass that led me out of the forest this morning. It's blood-stained and shattered, yet still unwavering in its devotion to North. Is that the compass the killer gave you, says Evelyn, her voice hushed. It is, I say, weighing it in my palm. Daniel Coleridge took it from me this morning. And then it appears somebody took it from him. Whatever danger Anna intended to warn me about, it seems to have found her first and Daniel Coleridge was involved somehow. Evelyn lays a hand on my shoulder as she squints warily into the darkness beyond the glow of the lantern. I think it's best we get you out of Blackheath, she says. Go to your room and I'll send a carriage to fetch you. I have to find Daniel, I protest weakly. And Anna. Something awful is happening here, she hisses. The slashes on your arm, the drugs, Anna, and now this compass. These are pieces in a game neither of us knows how to play. You must leave, for me, Sebastian. Let the police deal with all of this. I nod. I've not the will to fight. Anna was the only reason I stayed in the first place, the shreds of my courage convincing me there was some honor to be found in obeying a request delivered so cryptically. Without that obligation, the ties binding me to this place have been severed. We return to Blackheath in silence, Evelyn leading the way, her revolver poking at the darkness. I trail behind quietly, little more than a dog at her heel, and before I know it I'm saying goodbye to my friend and opening the door into my bedroom. All is not how I left it. There's a box sitting on my bed, wrapped in a red ribbon that comes loose with a single tug. Sliding away the lid, my stomach flips, bile rushing into my throat. Stuffed inside is a dead rabbit with a carving knife stabbed through its body. Blood has congealed at the bottom, staining its fur and almost obscuring the note pinned to its ear. From your friend, the footman. Black swims up into my eyes. A second later I faint. Nine day two a deafening clanging jolts me upright, my hands flying to my ears. Wincing. I look around for the source of the noise to find I've been moved in the night. Instead of the airy bedroom with the bathtub and welcoming fire, I'm in a narrow room with whitewashed walls and a single iron bed, dusty light poking through a small window. There's a chest of drawers on the opposite wall beside a ratty brown dressing gown hanging from a door peg. Swinging my legs from the bed, my feet touch cold stone, a shiver dancing up my spine. After the dead rabbit, I immediately suspect the footman of perpetrating some new devilry, but this incessant noise is making it impossible to concentrate. I pull on the dressing gown, 
nearly choking on the smell of cheap cologne, and poke my head into the corridor beyond. Cracked tiles cover the floor, whitewashed walls ballooning out with damp. There are no windows, only lamps staining everything with a dirty yellow light that never seems to settle. The clanging is louder out here and, covering my ears, I follow the din until I reach the bottom of a splintered wooden staircase, leading up into the house. Dozens of large tin bells are attached to a board on the wall, each with a plaque beneath it naming a section of the house. The bell for the front door is shaking so hard I'm worried it's going to unsettle the foundations. Hands pressed to my ears, I stare at the bell, but short of ripping it from the wall, there's no obvious way of quietening the clamor beyond answering the door. Belting the dressing gown tight, I rush up the stairs, emerging at the rear of the entrance hall. It's much quieter here, the servants moving through in a calm procession, their arms filled with bouquets of flowers and other decorations. I can only assume they're too busy clearing away the detritus of last night's party to have heard the noise. With an annoyed shake of the head, I open the door to find myself confronted by Dr. Sebastian Bell. He's wild-eyed and dripping wet, shivering with cold. I need your help, he says, spitting panic. My world empties. Do you have a telephone, he continues, the desperation terrible in his eyes. We need to send for the authorities. This is impossible. Don't just stand there, you devil, he cries out shaking me by the shoulders, the cold of his hands seeping through my pajamas. Unwilling to wait for a response, he pushes past me into the entrance hall, searching for aid. I try to make sense of what I'm seeing. This is me. This is me yesterday. Somebody is speaking to me, tugging on my sleeve, but I can't focus on anything except the imposter dripping on the floor. Daniel Coleridge has appeared at the top of the staircase. Sebastian, he says, descending with one hand on the banister. I watch him for the trick, some flicker of rehearsal, of jest, but he pads down the steps exactly as he did yesterday, just as light of foot, just as confident and admired. There's another tug on my arm, a maid placing herself in my eyeline. She's looking at me with concern, her lips moving. Blinking away my confusion, I focus on her finally hearing what she's saying. Mr. Collins, you all right, Mr. Collins. Her face is familiar, though I can't place it. I look over her head to the stairs, where Daniel is already ushering Belle up to his room. Everything's happening precisely as it did yesterday. Pulling free of the maid, I rush to a mirror on the wall. I can barely look at it. I'm badly burnt, my skin mottled and rough to the touch like fruit left too long in the sweltering sun. I know this man. Somehow, I've awoken as the butler. My heart hammering, I turn back to the maid. What's happening to me? I stammer, clutching at my throat, surprised by the hoarse northern voice coming out of it. Sir. How did, but I'm asking the wrong person. The answers are caked in dirt and trudging up the stairs to Daniel's room. Picking up the edges of my dressing gown, I hurry after them, following a trail of leaves and muddy rainwater. The maid is calling my name. I'm halfway up when she bolts past me, planting herself in the way with both hands pressed against my chest. You can't go up there, Mr. Collins, she says. There'll be merry hell to pay if Lady Helena catches you running around in your smalls. I try to go around her, but she steps sideways, blocking me again. Let me pass, girl. I demand, immediately regretting it. This isn't how I speak, blunt and demanding. You're having one of your turns, Mr. Collins, that's all, she says. Come down to the kitchen, I'll make us a pot of tea. Her eyes are blue, earnest. They flick over my shoulder self-consciously, and I look behind me to find other servants gathered at the bottom of the stairs. They're watching us, their arms still laden with flowers. One of my turns. I ask, doubt opening its mouth and swallowing me. On account of your burns, Mr. Collins, she says quietly. Sometimes you say things, or see things that ain't right. A cup of tea's all it takes, 
a few minutes and you're right as rain. Her kindness is crushing, warm and heavy. I'm reminded of Daniel's pleas yesterday, his delicate way of speaking, as though I might fracture if pressed too hard. He thought I was mad, as this maid does now. Given what's happening to me, what I think is happening to me, I can't be certain they're wrong. I offer her a helpless look and she takes my arm, guiding me back down the steps, the crowd parting to let us through. Cup of tea, Mr. Collins, she says reassuringly. That's all you need. She leads me like a lost child, the soft grip of her calloused hand as calming as her tone. Together we leave the entrance hall, heading back down the servant's staircase and along the gloomy corridor into the kitchen. Sweat stands up on my brow, heat rushing out of ovens and stoves, pots bubbling over open flames. I smell gravy, roasted meats and baking cakes, sugar and sweat. Too many guests and too few working ovens, that's the problem. They've had to start preparing dinner now to make sure everything goes out on time later. The knowledge bewilders me. It's true, I'm certain of it, but how could I know that unless I really am the butler? Maids are rushing out carrying breakfast, scrambled eggs and kippers heaped on silver platters. A white-hipped, ruddy-faced elderly woman is standing by the oven bellowing instructions, her pinafore covered in flour. No general ever wore a chest full of medals with such conviction. Somehow she spots us through the commotion, her iron glare striking the maid first, then myself. Wiping her hands on her apron, she strides over to us. I'm sure you've somewhere to be, haven't you, Lucy, she says with a stern look. The maid hesitates, considering the wisdom of objecting. Yes, M.R.S. Drudge. Her hand releases me, leaving a patch of emptiness on my arm. A sympathetic smile and she's gone, lost among the din. Sit yourself down, Roger, says M.R.S. Drudge, her tone aspiring to gentleness. She has a split lip, bruising beginning to show around her mouth. Somebody must have struck her, and she winces when she speaks. There's a wooden table at the center of the kitchen, its surface covered in platters of tongue, roasted chickens and hams piled high. There are soups and stews, trays of glistening vegetables, with more being added all the time by the harassed kitchen staff, most of whom look to have spent an hour in the ovens themselves. Pulling out a chair, I sit down. M.R.S. Drudge slides a tray of scones from the oven, putting one on a plate with a small curl of butter. She brings it over, placing the plate in front of me and touching my hand. Her skin's hard as old leather. Her gaze lingers, kindness wrapped in thistle, before she turns away bellowing her way back through the crowd. The scone is delicious, the melting butter dripping off the sides. I'm only a bite into it when I see Lucy again, finally remembering why she's familiar. This is the maid who will be in the drawing room at lunchtime the one who will be abused by Ted Stanwin and rescued by Daniel Coleridge. She's even prettier than I recall, with freckles and large blue eyes, red hair straying from beneath her cap. She's trying to open a jam jar her face screwed up with effort. She had jam stains all over her apron. It happens in slow motion, the jar slipping from her hands and hitting the floor, glass spraying across the kitchen, her apron splattered with dripping jam. Oh, bloody hell, Lucy Harper, somebody cries, dismayed. My chair clatters to the floor as I dart from the kitchen, racing down the corridor and back upstairs. I'm in such a rush that as I turn the corner onto the guest corridor, I collide with a wiry chap, curly black hair spilling down his brow, charcoal staining his white shirt. Apologizing, I look up into the face of Gregory Gold. Fury wears him like a suit, his eyes empty of all reason. He's livid, trembling with rage, and only too late do I remember what comes next, how the butler looked after this monster did his work. I attempt to back away but he takes hold of my dressing gown with his long fingers. You don't need my vision blurs, the world reduced to a smudge of color and a flash of pain as I crash into a wall, then drop to the floor, blood trickling from my head. He's looming over me, an iron poker in his hand. Please, I say, trying to slide backwards, away from him. 
I'm not he kicks me in the side, emptying my lungs. I reach out a hand, trying to speak, beg, but that only seems to infuriate him further. He's kicking me faster and faster until there's nothing I can do but curl up in a ball as he pours his wrath upon me. I can barely breathe, barely see. I'm sobbing, buried beneath my pain. Mercifully, I pass out. Ten day three it's dark, the net on the window fluttering in the breath of a moonless night. The sheets are soft, the bed comfortable and canopied. Clutching the eiderdown, I smile. It was a nightmare, that's all. Slowly, beat by beat, my heart quietens, the taste of blood fading with the dream. It takes me a few seconds to remember where I am, another to pick out the dim shape of a large man standing in the corner of the room. My breath catches in my throat. Sliding my hand through the covers towards the bedside table, I reach for the matches, but they seem to slither away from my searching fingers. Who are you? I ask the darkness, unable to keep the tremor from my voice. A friend. It's a man's voice, muffled and deep. Friends don't lurk in the gloom, I say. I didn't say I was your friend, Mr. Davies. My blind fumbling almost knocks the oil lamp off the bedside table. Attempting to steady it, my fingers find the matches cowering at its base. Don't worry about the light, says the darkness. It will little profit you. I strike the match with a trembling hand, touching it to the lamp. Flame explodes behind the glass driving the shadows deep into the corners and illuminating my visitor. It's the man in the plague doctor costume I met earlier, the light revealing details I'd missed in the gloom of the study. His greatcoat is scuffed and tattered at the edges, a top hat and porcelain beak mask covering all of his face except for the eyes. Gloved hands rest on a black cane, an inscription inlaid in sparkling silver down the side, though the writing's much too small to read at this distance. Observant good, remarks the plague doctor. Footsteps sound from somewhere in the house, and I wonder if my imagination is sufficient to conjure the mundane details of such an extraordinary dream. What the hell are you doing in my room? I demand, surprising myself with this outburst. The beak mask ceases its exploration of the room, fixing on me once again. We have work to do, he says. I have a puzzle which requires a solution. I think you've mistaken me for somebody else, I say angrily. I'm a doctor. You were a doctor, he says. Then a butler, today a playboy, tomorrow a banker. None of them is your real face, or your real personality. Those were stripped from you when you entered Blackheath and they won't be returned until you leave. Reaching into his pocket, he pulls out a small mirror and tosses it onto the bed. See for yourself. The glass shakes in my hand, reflecting a young man with striking blue eyes and precious little wisdom behind them. The face in the glass isn't that of Sebastian Bell, or the burnt butler. His name's Donald Davies, says the plague doctor. He has a sister called Grace and a best friend called Jim, and he doesn't like peanuts. Davies will be your host for today, and when you wake up tomorrow, you'll have another. That's how this works. It wasn't a dream after all, it really happened. I lived the same day twice in the bodies of two different people. I talked to myself, berated myself, and examined myself through somebody else's eyes. I'm going mad, aren't I? I say, looking at him over the top of the mirror. I can hear the cracks in my voice. Of course not, says the plague doctor. Madness would be an escape and there's only one way to escape Blackheath. That's why I'm here, I have a proposition for you. Why have you done this to me? I demand. That's a flattering notion, but I'm not responsible for your predicament, or Blackheath's for that matter. Then who is? Nobody you'd care to meet or need to, he says, dismissing the notion with a wave of his hand. Which brings me back to my proposition I must speak with them, I say. Speak with whom? The person who brought me here, whoever can free me, I say through gritted teeth, struggling to keep hold of my temper. Well, the former is long gone, and the latter is before you, he says, 
tapping his chest with both hands. Perhaps it's the costume, but the movement seems somehow theatrical, almost rehearsed. I suddenly have the sense of taking part in a play in which everybody knows their lines but me. Only I know how you can escape Blackheath, he says. Your proposition. I say suspiciously. Precisely, though Riddle might be closer to the truth of it, he says, lifting out a pocket watch and checking the time. Somebody's going to be murdered at the ball tonight. It won't appear to be a murder and so the murderer won't be caught. Rectify that injustice and I'll show you the way out. I stiffen, gripping the sheets. If freeing me is within your power, why not just do it, damn you? I say. Why play these games? Because eternity is dull, he says. Or maybe because playing is the important part. I'll leave you to speculate. Just don't procrastinate for too long, Mr. Davies. This day will be repeated eight times, and you'll see it through the eyes of eight different hosts. Bell was your first, the butler your second and Mr. Davies the third. That means you only have five hosts left to discover. If I were you, I would move quickly. When you have an answer, bring it to the lake, along with proof, at 11 p.m. I'll be waiting for you. I will not play these games for your amusement, I snarl leaning towards him. Then fail out of spite, but know this, if you don't solve this problem by midnight in your final host, we'll strip your memories and return you to the body of Dr. Bell and this will all begin again. He checks his watch, dropping it into his pocket with an irritated tut. Time runs away from us. Cooperate and I'll answer more of your questions next time we meet. A breeze slips through the window, extinguishing the light and draping us in darkness. By the time I find the matches and relight it, the plague doctor is gone. Confused and afraid, I jump out of bed as though stung, throwing open the bedroom door and stepping into the cold. The corridor's black. He could be standing five paces away and I'd never see him. Closing the door, I fly towards the wardrobe, dressing myself in whatever comes to hand first. Whoever I'm wearing, he's skinny and short with a penchant for the garish and when I'm finished I'm splashed in purple trousers, an orange shirt and a yellow waistcoat. There's a coat and scarf at the back of the cupboard and I pull them on, before heading out. Murder in the morning and costumes at night, cryptic notes and burnt butlers, whatever's happening here, I will not be yanked around like some puppet on a string. I must escape this house. The grandfather clock at the top of the stairs points its weary arms at 3.17 a.m., tutting at my haste. Though I'm loath to wake the Stabla Master at such a frightful hour, I can see no other choice if I'm to escape this madness, so I take the staircase two steps at a time, nearly tripping over this peacock's ridiculously tiny feet. It wasn't like this with Bell or the butler. I feel myself pressed up against the walls of this body, straining at its seams. I'm clumsy, almost drunk. Leaves scatter inside as I open the front door. It's blowing a gale outside, rain swirling in the air, the forest cracking and swaying. It's a filthy night, the color of tossed soot. I'll need more light if I'm to find my way without falling and breaking my neck. Retreating inside, I head down the servant's staircase at the rear of the entrance hall. The wood of the banister is rough to the touch, the steps rickety. Thankfully, the lamps are still leaking their rancid light, though the flames burn low and quiet their flicker indignant. The corridor is longer than I remember, the whitewashed walls sweating with condensation, the smell of earth spilling through the plaster. Everything's damp, rotten. I've seen most of Blackheath's dirty edges, but none so purposefully neglected. I'm surprised the place has any staff at all, given how little regard they appear to be held in by their masters. In the kitchen I bounce between the stacked shelves until I find a hurricane lamp and matches. Two strikes to light it and I'm bounding back up the stairs and through the front door into the storm. The lamp claws at the darkness, the rain stinging my eyes. I follow the driveway to the cobbled road leading up to the stables, the forest heaving around me. Slipping over the uneven stones, I strain my eyes for the stable master's cottage, but the lamp's too bright 
concealing much of what it should reveal. I'm beneath the arch before I see it, sliding on horse manure. As before, the yard is a crush of carriages, each covered in a rippling canvas sheet. Unlike earlier, the horses are in the stables, snorting in their sleep. Shaking the manure from my feet, I throw myself on the mercy of the cottage, banging the knocker. The light comes on after a few minutes, the door opening a crack to reveal the sleepy face of an old man in his long johns. I need to leave, I say. At this hour, sir, he asks dubiously, rubbing his eyes and glancing at the pitch black sky. You'll catch your death. It's urgent. He sighs, taking in the scene, then gestures me inside, opening the door fully. Putting on a pair of trousers, he tugs the braces over his shoulders, moving in that sluggish daze that marks someone roused unaccountably from their sleep. Taking his jacket from the peg, he drags himself outside, motioning for me to stay where I am. I must confess I do so happily. The cottage bulges with warmth and homeliness, the smell of leather and soap a solid, comforting presence. I'm tempted to check the rota by the door to see if Anna's message is already written there, but no sooner have I reached out my hand than I hear a god-awful commotion, lights blinding me through the window. Stepping into the rain, I find the old Stablamaster sitting in a green automobile, the entire thing coughing and shuddering as if afflicted by some terrible disease. Here you go, sir, he says, getting out. I got her started for you. But, I'm at a loss for words, a guest at the contraption before me. Are there no carriages? I ask. There are, but the horses are skittish around thunder, sir, he says, reaching under his shirt to scratch an armpit. With respect, you couldn't keep hold of them. I can't keep hold of this, I say, staring at the dreadful mechanical monster, horror strangling my voice. Rain is pinging off the metal and making a pond of the windscreen. Easy as breathing it is, he says. Grip the wheel and point it where you want to go, then press the pedal to the floor. You'll make sense of it in no time. His confidence pushes me inside as firmly as any hand, the door closing with a soft click. Follow this cobbled road until the end, and then turn left onto the dirt track, he says, pointing into the darkness. That will lead you to the village. It's long and straight, a bit uneven, mind. Takes anywhere between 40 minutes and an hour, depending on how carefully you drive, but you can't miss it, sir. If you wouldn't mind, leave the automobile somewhere obvious and I'll have one of my boys collect it first thing in the morning. With that, he's gone, disappearing back into his cottage, the door slamming shut behind him. Gripping the wheel, I stare at the levers and dials, trying to find some semblance of logic in the controls. I tentatively press the pedal, the dreaded contraption lurches forward, and, applying a little more pressure, I urge the automobile beneath the arch and along the bumpy cobbled road, until we reach the left turn the Stablamaster mentioned. Rain blankets the glass, forcing me to lean out of the window to see where I'm going. The headlamps shine on a dirt track littered with leaves and fallen branches, water cascading across its surface. Despite the danger, I keep the accelerator pedal pinned to the floor, elation replacing my unease. After everything that's happened, I'm finally escaping Blackheath, each mile of this bumpy track taking me further from its madness. Morning arrives in a smudge, a grey half-light that taints rather than illuminates, though it at least brings an end to the rain. As promised the road continues straight, the forest unending. Somewhere among those trees, a girl is being murdered and Belle is coming awake to see it. A killer will spare his life with a silver compass that points to a place that doesn't make sense and like a fool he'll think himself saved. But how can I be in that forest and in this car and a butler in between? My hands tighten around the wheel. If I was able to talk to the butler when I was Sebastian Bell, then presumably, Whoever I'll be tomorrow is already walking around Blackheath. I might even have met him. And not just tomorrow, but the man I'll be the day after that and the day after that. If that's the case, what does that make me? Or them? Are we shards of the same soul, responsible for each other's sins, 
or entirely different people, pale copies of some long-forgotten original? The fuel gauge nudges red as fog comes rolling out of the trees, thick upon the ground. My earlier sense of triumph has waned. I should have arrived at the village long ago, but there's no chimney smoke in the distance and no end to the forest. Finally, the car shudders and stills, its dying breath a screech of grinding parts as it comes to a stop mere feet from the plague doctor, whose black greatcoat is in stark contrast to the white fog he's emerging from. My legs are stiff and my back sore, but anger propels me out of the car. Have you got this foolishness out of your system yet, asks the plague doctor, both hands resting on his cane. You could have done so much with this host, instead you waste him on this road, accomplishing nothing. Blackheath won't let you go, and while you're tugging on your lead, your rivals are pressing ahead with their investigations. And now I have rivals, I say contemptuously. It's one trick after another with you, isn't it? First you tell me I'm trapped here, and now it's a competition to escape. I'm marching towards him, fully intending to beat an exit out of him. Don't you understand, yet? I say. I don't care about your rules, because I'm not going to play. Either you let me leave, or I'll make you sorry I stayed. I'm two steps away when he points his cane at me. Though it hovers an inch from my chest, no cannon was ever so threatening. The silver lettering along the side is pulsing, a faint shimmer rising from the wood, burning away the fog. I can feel the heat of it through my clothes. If he desired, I'm certain this benign-looking stick could rip a hole straight through me. Donald Davies is always the most childish of your hosts, he tuts, watching me take a nervous step backwards. But, you don't have time to indulge him. There are two other people trapped in this house, wearing the bodies of guests and servants, just like you. Only one of you can leave, and it will be whoever brings me the answer first. Now, do you see? Escape isn't to be found at the end of this dirt road, it's through me. So run if you must. Run until you can't stand, and when you wake up in Blackheath again and again, do so in the knowledge that nothing here is arbitrary, nothing overlooked. You'll stay here until I decide otherwise. Lowering the cane, he tugs loose his pocket watch. We'll speak again soon, when you've calmed down a little, he says, putting the watch away again. Try to use your hosts more wisely from now on. Your rivals are more cunning than you can imagine, and I guarantee they won't be so frivolous with their time. I want to charge him fists flying, but now the red mist has passed, I can see it's a preposterous idea. Even taking away the bulk of his costume, he's a large man, more than capable of weathering my assault. Instead, I veer around him, the plague doctor heading back to Blackheath, as I press into the fog ahead. There may be no end to this road, no village to be found, but I can't give up until I know for sure. I won't return willingly to a madman's game. Eleven day four I awake wheezing, crushed beneath the tremendous monument of my new host's stomach. The last thing I remember is collapsing exhausted on the road after walking for hours, howling in desperation at a village I couldn't reach. The plague doctor was telling the truth. There's no escape from Blackheath. A carriage clock by the bed tells me it's 10.30 a.m., and I'm about to rise when a tall man enters through a connecting room carrying a silver tray which he lays on the sideboard. He's in his mid-thirties, I'd guess, dark-haired and clean-shaven, blandly attractive without being memorable in any way. A pair of glasses have slipped down his small nose, his eyes fixed on the curtains he's walking towards. Without saying a word, he draws them and pushes open the windows, revealing views of the garden and forest. I watch him in fascination. There's something oddly precise about this man. His actions are small and quick, without any wasted effort. It's as though he's saving his energy for some great labor ahead. For a minute or so, he stands at the window with his back to me, letting the room breathe cold air. I feel as though something is expected of me, that this pause has been manufactured for my benefit, but for the life of me I can't guess what I should be doing. No doubt sensing my indecision, he abandons his vigil slipping his hands under my armpits and tugging me into a sitting position. 
I pay for his assistance in shame. My silk pajamas are soaked through with sweat and the odor rising from my body is so pungent it brings tears to my eyes. Oblivious to my embarrassment, my companion retrieves the silver tray from the sideboard and places it on my lap, lifting the dome cover. The platter beneath is piled high with eggs and bacon, a side helping of pork chops, a pot of tea and a jug of milk. Such a meal should be daunting, but I'm ravenous and tear into it like an animal, while the tall man who I can only assume is my valet disappears behind an oriental screen, the sound of pouring water issuing forth. Pausing for breath, I take this opportunity to examine my surroundings. In contrast to the frugal comforts of Belle's bedroom, this place is awash in wealth. Red velvet drapes flow down the windows, piling up on a thick blue carpet. Art spots the walls, the lacquered mahogany furniture polished to a shine. Whoever I am, he's held in high esteem by the Hardcastle family. The valet returns to find me mopping grease from my lips with a napkin, panting with the effort of eating. He must be disgusted. I am disgusted. I feel like a pig in a trough. Even so, no flicker of emotion shows on his face as he removes the tray and slides my arm across his shoulders to better help me out of bed. God only knows how many times he's been through this ritual, or what he's paid to do it, but once is enough for me. Like a wounded soldier, he half walks, half drags me behind the screen where a steaming hot bath has been prepared. That's when he begins to undress me. I have no doubt this is all part of the routine, but the shame's too much to bear. Though this isn't my body, I'm humiliated by it, appalled by the waves of flesh lapping against my hips, the way my legs rub together as I walk. I shoo my companion away, but it's pointless. My lord, you can't, he pauses, collecting his words together carefully, you're not going to be able to get in and out of the bath alone. I want to tell him to go hang, to leave me in peace, but he is, of course, correct. Squeezing my eyes shut, I nod my submission. In practiced motions he unbuttons my pajama top and pulls down the bottoms, lifting my feet one at a time so I don't become tangled in them. In a few seconds I'm naked, my companion standing at a respectful distance. Opening my eyes, I find myself reflected in a full-length mirror on the wall. I resemble some grotesque caricature of the human body, my skin jaundiced and swollen, a flaccid penis peeking out of an unkempt crop of pubic hair. Overcome by disgust and humiliation, I let out a sob. Surprise lights up the valet's face and then, just for a moment, delight. It's a patch of raw emotion, gone as quickly as it appeared. Hurrying over, he helps me into the bathtub. I remember the euphoria I felt climbing into the hot water as Belle, but there's none of that now. My immense weight means the joy of getting into a warm bath is eclipsed by the certain humiliation of getting out of it again. Will you require the reports this morning? Lord Ravencourt, asks my companion. Sitting stiff in the bath, I shake my head, hoping he'll leave the room. The house has prepared a few activities for the day, hunting, a forest walk, they asked. I shake my head again, staring at the water. How much more must I endure? Very well, then it's just the appointments. Cancel them, I say quietly. Cancel them all. Even with Lady Hardcastle, my lord. I find his green eyes for the first time. The plague doctor claimed I must solve a murder to depart this house, and who better than the lady of the house to help me sift through its secrets? No, not that one, I say. Remind me where we're meeting again. In your parlor, my lord. Unless you wanted me to change it. No, that will suffice. Very well, my lord. The last of our business concluded, he departs with a nod, leaving me to wallow in peace, alone with my misery. Closing my eyes, I rest my head on the edge of the bath, trying to make sense of my situation. Finding their soul cut loose from their body would suggest death to some, but deep down I know this isn't the afterlife. Hell would have fewer servants and better furnishings, and stripping a man of his sins seems a poor way to sit in judgment on him. No. I'm alive, though not in any state I recognize. This is something next to death, 
something more devious, and I'm not alone. The plague doctor claimed there are three of us competing to escape Blackheath. Could the footman who left me the dead rabbit be trapped as I am? That would explain why he's trying to scare me. After all, a race is hard to win if you're afraid of reaching the finishing line. Perhaps this is what the plague doctor considers entertainment, setting us against each other, like half-starved dogs in a pit. Maybe you should trust him. So much for trauma, I mutter at the voice. I thought I'd left you in Bell. I know it's a lie even as I say it. I'm connected to this voice in the same way I'm connected to the plague doctor and the footman. I can feel the weight of our history, even if I can't remember it. They're part of everything that's happening to me, pieces of this puzzle I'm scrambling to solve. Whether they're friends or enemies I can't be certain, but whatever the voice's true nature, it hasn't led me astray so far. Even so, trusting my captor strikes me as naivety at best. The idea that all of this will end should I solve a murder seems preposterous. Whatever the plague doctor's intent, he came concealed by mask and midnight. He's wary of being seen, which means there's leverage to be found in ripping that mask free. I glance at the clock, weighing my options. I know he'll be in the study talking with Sebastian Bell a previous me, I still can't quite wrap my head around it. After the hunt departs, which would seem an ideal time to intercept him. If he wishes me to solve a murder, I'll do so but it won't be my only task today. If I'm to ensure my freedom, I must know the identity of the man who has taken it from me, and for that I'm going to need some help. By the plague doctor's count, I've already wasted three of my eight days in this house, those belonging to Sebastian Bell, the butler, and Donald Davies. Including myself, that means I have five remaining hosts, and if Bell's encounter with the butler is any guide, they're walking around Blackheath, as I am. That's an army in waiting. I just need to work out who they're wearing. Twelve the water's long cold, leaving me blue and shivering. Vainglorious though it may be, I can't bear the thought of Ravencourt's valet lifting me out of this bath like a sodden sack of potatoes. A polite knock on the bedroom door relieves me of the decision. Lord Ravencourt, is all well, he calls, entering the room. Quite well, I insist, my hands numb. His head appears around the edge of the screen, his eyes taking hold of the scene. After a moment's scrutiny, he approaches without my beckoning, rolling up his sleeves to pull me out of the water with a strength that belies his thin frame. This time I do not protest. I have too little pride left to salvage. As he helps me out of the bathtub, I spot the edge of a tattoo poking from beneath his shirt. It's smeared green, the details lost. Noticing my attention, he hurriedly pulls his sleeve down. Folly of youth, my lord, he says. For ten minutes I stand there, quietly humiliated, as he towels me dry, mothering me into my suit, one leg then the next, one arm then the other. The clothes are silk, beautifully tailored but tugging and pinching like a roomful of elderly ants. They're a size too small, fitting Ravencourt's vanity rather than his body. When all is done, the valet combs my hair, rubbing coconut oil into my fleshy face before handing me a mirror that I might better inspect the results. The reflection is nearing sixty, with suspiciously black hair and brown eyes the color of weak tea. I search them for some sign of myself, the hidden man working Ravencourt's strings, but I'm obscured. For the first time I wonder who I was before coming here, and the chain of events that led me into this trap. Such speculation would be intriguing if it weren't so frustrating. As with Belle, my skin prickles when I see Ravencourt in the mirror. Some part of me remembers my real face and is perplexed by this stranger staring back. I hand the mirror to the valet. We need to go to the library, I say. I know where it is, my lord, he says. Shall I fetch you a book? I'm coming with you. The valet pauses, frowning. He speaks hesitatingly, his words testing the ground they're tiptoeing across. It's a fair walk, my lord. I fear you may find it, tiring. I'll manage, besides I need the exercise. Arguments cue behind his teeth, 
but he fetches my cane and an attaché case and leads me into a dark corridor, oil lamps spilling their warm light across the walls. We walk slowly, the valet tossing news at my feet, but my mind is fixed on the ponderousness of this body I'm dragging forward. It's as though some fiend has remade the house overnight, stretching the rooms and thickening the air. Wading into the sudden brightness of the entrance hall, I'm surprised to discover how steep the staircase now appears. The steps I sprinted down as Donald Davies would require climbing equipment to surmount this morning. Little wonder Lord and Lady Hardcastle lodged Ravencourt on the ground floor. It would take a pulley, two strong men and a day's pay to hoist me into Bell's room. Requiring frequent rests at least allows me to observe my fellow guests as they make their way around the house, and it's immediately evident that this is not a happy gathering. Whispered arguments spill out of nooks and crannies, raised voices moving hurriedly up the stairs only to be cut off by slamming doors. Husbands and wives go to each other, drinks gripped too tightly, faces flushed red with barely controlled rage. There's a needle in every exchange, the air prickly and dangerous. Perhaps it's nerves, or the hollow wisdom of foresight, but Blackheath seems fertile ground for tragedy. My legs are trembling by the time we arrive at the library, my back aching with the effort of holding myself erect. Unfortunately, the room offers scant reward for such suffering. Dusty, overburdened bookshelves line the walls, a moldy red carpet smothering the floor. The bones of an old fire lie in the grate, opposite a small reading table with an uncomfortable wooden chair placed beside it. My companion sums up his feelings in a single tut. One moment, my lord, I'll fetch you a more comfortable chair from the drawing room, he says. I'll need it. My left palm is blistered where it's rubbed against the top of the cane and my legs are wobbling beneath me. Sweat has soaked through my shirt, leaving my entire body itchy. Crossing the house has left me a wreck, and if I'm to reach the lake tonight before my rivals, I'm going to need a new host, preferably one capable of conquering a staircase. Ravencourt's valet returns with a wing-back chair, placing it on the floor in front of me. Taking my arm, he lowers me into the green cushions. May I ask our purpose here, my lord? If we're very lucky, we're meeting friends, I reply, mopping my face with a handkerchief. Do you have a piece of paper to hand? Of course. He retrieves some fool's cap and a fountain pen from his attaché case standing ready to take dictation. I open my mouth to dismiss him, but one look at my sweaty, blistered hand dissuades me. In this instance, pride is a poor cousin to legibility. After taking a minute to arrange the words in my head, I begin speaking aloud. It's logical to believe that many of you have been here longer than I and possess knowledge of this house, our purpose here and our captor, the plague doctor, that I do not. I pause listening to the scratching of the pen. You have not sought me out, and I must assume there's a good reason for that, but I ask you now to meet me in the library at lunchtime and help me apprehend our captor. If you cannot, I ask you to share what you've learned by writing it on this paper. Whatever you know, no matter how trivial, may be of use in helping speed our escape. They say two heads are better than one, but I believe in this case our combined head may be sufficient. I wait for the scribbling to end, then look up at my companion's face. It's mystified, though also a touch amused. He's a curious fellow this one, not at all the straight edge he first appears. Should I post this, my lord, he asks. No need, I say, pointing towards the bookshelf. Slide it within the pages of the first volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica, they'll know where to find it. He eyes me then the note, before doing as I ask, the page slipping neatly inside. It seems a fitting home. And when should we expect a response, my lord? Minutes, hours, I can't be certain. We'll have to keep checking back. And until then, he asks, wiping the dust from his hands with a pocket square. Talk to the servants, I need to know if any of the guests has a medieval plague doctor costume in their wardrobe. My lord. Porcelain mask, black greatcoat, that sort of thing, I say. In the meantime I'm going to have a nap. Here, my lord. 
indeed. He watches me with a frown, trying to stitch together the scraps of information scattered before him. Should I light a fire, he asks. No need, I'll be quite comfortable, I say. Very well, he says, hovering. I'm not sure what he's waiting for but it never arrives and with a final look he leaves the room, his confusion creeping out quietly behind him. Placing my hands on my stomach, I close my eyes. Every time I've slept I've woken up in a different body, and while it's risky sacrificing a host this way, I can't see what more I can accomplish in Raven Court. With any luck, when I awaken my other selves will have made contact through the encyclopedia and I'll be among them. 13 Day 2, Continued, Agony I scream, tasting blood. I know, I know, I'm sorry, says a woman's voice. A pinch, a needle enters my neck. Warmth melts the pain. It's hard to breathe, impossible to move. I can't open my eyes. I hear rolling wheels, hooves on cobbles, a presence by my side. I, I start coughing. Shush. Don't try and talk. You're back in the butler, says the woman in an urgent whisper, laying a hand on my arm. It's been fifteen minutes since Gold attacked you, and you're being taken by carriage to the gatehouse to rest. Who are? I croak. A friend, it doesn't matter, yet. Now, listen, I know you're confused, tired, but this is important. There are rules to all of this. There's no use trying to abandon your hosts the way you did. You get a full day in each of them, whether you want it or not. That's from whenever they wake up until midnight. Understand. I'm dozing, struggling to stay awake. That's why you're back here, she continues. If one of your hosts falls asleep before midnight, you'll jump back into the butler and carry on living this day. When the butler falls asleep, you'll be returned. If the host slept past midnight, or if they died, you'll jump into somebody new. I hear another voice. Ruffer. From the front of the carriage. Gatehouse coming up. Her hand touches my forehead. Good luck to you. Too tired to hold on, I slip back into the dark. Fourteen day four, continued, a hand rocks my shoulder. Blinking my eyes open. I find myself back in the library, back in Raven Court. Relief washes over me. I'd thought nothing could be worse than this bulk, but I was wrong. The butler's body felt like a bag of broken glass, and I'd live a lifetime as Raven Court before I'd go back to that torment, though it doesn't appear I have a choice. If the woman in the carriage is telling the truth, I'm destined to be pulled back there again. Daniel Coleridge is looking down at me through a cloud of yellow smoke. A cigarette dangles from his lip, a drink in his hand. He's wearing the same scuffed hunting clothes as when he talked with Sebastian Bell in the study. My eyes flick to the clock, it's twenty minutes before lunchtime. He must be on his way to that meeting now. He hands me the drink and sits down on the edge of the table opposite, the encyclopedia now lying open beside him. I believe you were looking for me, says Daniel, blowing smoke from the corner of his mouth. He sounds different through Ravencourt's ears, the softness shed like an old skin. Before I can answer him, he begins reading from the encyclopedia. It's logical to believe that many of you have been here longer than I and possess knowledge of this house, our purpose here and our captor, the plague doctor, that I do not. He closes the book. You called and I answered. I search the shrewd eyes fixed upon me. You're like me, I say. I am you, just four days ahead, he says, pausing to let my mind ram itself against the idea. Daniel Coleridge is your final host. Our soul, his body, if you can make any sense of that. Unfortunately, it's his mind, too he taps his forehead with his forefinger which means you and I think differently. He holds up the encyclopedia. Take this, for example, he says, letting it drop on the table. Coleridge would never have thought to write to our other hosts asking for help. It was a clever idea, very logical, very Raven Court. His cigarette flares in the gloom, 
illuminating the hollow smile beneath. This is not the Daniel of yesterday. There's something colder, harder in his gaze, something trying to pry me open so it might peer inside. I don't know how I didn't see it when I was Belle. Ted Stanwin did, when he backed down in the drawing room. The thug's cleverer than I gave him credit for. So you've already been me, this me, Ravencourt, I mean. I say. And those who follow him, he says. They're a difficult bunch, you should enjoy Ravencourt while you can. Is that why you're here, to warn me about my other hosts? The notion seems to amuse him, a smile touching his lips before drifting away with the cigarette smoke. No. I've come because I remember sitting where you are and being told what I'm about to tell you. Which is? There's an ashtray on the far side of the table and he reaches across, drawing it towards him. The plague doctor has asked you to solve a murder, but he didn't mention the victim. It's Evelyn Hardcastle, that's who's going to die at the ball tonight, he says, tapping ash into the ashtray. Evelyn. I say, struggling to sit upright splashing a little of my forgotten drink across my leg. Panic has hold of me, a terror of my friend being hurt, a woman who went out of her way to be kind to me even as her own parents filled the house with cruelty. We must warn her. I demand. To what end, asks Daniel, dousing my alarm with his calm. We cannot solve the murder of somebody who isn't dead and without that answer we cannot escape. You would let her die. I say shocked by his callousness. I've lived this day eight times over and she's died every evening regardless of my actions, he says, running his finger along the edge of the table. Whatever happened yesterday, it will happen tomorrow and the day after. I promise you, however you may consider interfering, you've already tried and it's already failed. She's my friend, Daniel, I say, surprised at the depth of my feeling. And mine he says, leaning closer. But every time I've tried to change today's events, I've ended up becoming the architect of whatever misery I was trying to prevent. Believe me, trying to save Evelyn is a waste of time. Circumstances beyond my control brought me here and very soon, sooner than you can imagine, you'll find yourself sitting where I am, explaining it as I have and wishing you still had the luxury of Ravencourt's hope. The future isn't a warning my friend, it's a promise, and it won't be broken by us. That's the nature of the trap we're caught in. Rising from the table, he wrestles with a window's rusty handle and pushes it open. His eyes are fixed on some distant point, a task four days beyond my comprehension. He has no interest in me, my fears or hopes. I'm just part of some old story he's tired of telling. It makes no sense, I say hoping to remind him of Evelyn's qualities, the reasons she's worth saving. Evelyn's kind and gentle, and she's been away for 19 years, who'd want to harm her now? Even as I say it, a suspicion begins to dawn on me. In the forest yesterday, Evelyn mentioned that her parents had never forgiven her for letting Thomas wander off alone. She blamed herself for his murder at Carver's hands, and, worst of all, so did they. Their ire was so great, she believed they were plotting some terrible surprise at the ball. Could this be it? Could they really hate their own daughter enough to murder her? If so, my meeting with Helena Hardcastle could prove fortuitous indeed. I don't know, says Daniel, a note of irritation in his voice. There are so many secrets in this house, it can be difficult to pick the right one from the pile. If you heed my advice though, you'll start looking for Anna immediately. Eight hosts may sound a great deal, but this task needs double that number. You're going to need all the help you can get. Anna, I exclaim, remembering the woman in the carriage with the butler. I thought she was an acquaintance of Bell's. He takes a long drag on his cigarette, considering me through narrowed eyes. I can see him sifting through the future, working out how much to tell me. She's trapped here like us, he says eventually. She's a friend, as much as somebody can be in our situation. You should find her quickly, before the footman does. He's hunting us both. He left a dead rabbit in my room Bell's room, I mean last night. 
that's only the beginning, he says. He means to kill us, though not before he's had his fun. My blood runs cold, my stomach nauseous. I'd suspected as much, but to hear the fact laid out so baldly is something else entirely. Closing my eyes, I let a long breath out through my nose, releasing my fear with it. It's a habit of Ravencourt's, a way of clearing the mind, though I couldn't say how I know that. When I open my eyes again, I'm calm. Who is he? I ask, impressed by the strength in my voice. I've no idea, he says, blowing smoke into the wind. I'd call him the devil if I thought this place anything so mundane as hell. He's picking us off one by one, making sure there's no competition when he delivers his answer to the plague doctor tonight. Does he have other bodies, other hosts, like us? That's the curious thing, he says. I don't believe he does, but he doesn't seem to need them. He knows the faces of every one of our hosts, and he strikes when we're at our weakest. Every mistake I've made, he's been waiting. How do we stop a man who knows our every step before we do? If I knew that, there'd be no need of this conversation, he says irritably. Be careful. He haunts this house like a bloody ghost, and if he catches you alone, well, don't let him catch you alone. Daniel's tone is dark, his expression brooding. Whoever this footman is, he has taken hold of my future self in a way that's more unsettling than all the warnings I've heard. It's not hard to understand why. The plague doctor gave me eight days to solve Evelyn's murder and eight hosts to do it. Because Sebastian Bell slept past midnight, he's now lost to me. That leaves seven days and seven hosts. My second and third hosts were the butler and Donald Davies. The woman in the carriage didn't mention Davies, which seems a curious omission, but I'm assuming the same rules apply to him as the butler. They both have plenty of hours left until midnight, but one of them is severely injured and the other asleep on a road, miles from Blackheath. They're practically useless. So much for days two and three. I'm already on my fourth day, and Ravencourt is proving a burden rather than a boon. I don't know what to expect from my remaining four hosts though Daniel seems capable enough but it feels as though the plague doctor is stacking the deck against me. If the footman truly knows my every weakness, then God help me because there are plenty to exploit. Tell me everything you've already learned about Evelyn's death, I say. If we work together we can solve it before the footman has a chance to harm us. The only thing I can tell you is that she dies promptly at 11 p.m. every single night. Surely, you must know more than that. A great deal more, but I can't risk sharing the information, he says glancing at me. All my plans are built around things you're going to do. If I tell you something that stops you doing those things, I can't be certain they'll play out the same way. You might blunder into the middle of an event settled in my favor, or be elsewhere when you should have been distracting the fellow whose room I'm sneaking into. One wrong word could leave all my plans in ruins. This day must proceed as it always does, for your sake as much as mine. He rubs his forehead all of his weariness seeming to pour out of the gesture. I'm sorry, Ravencourt, the safest course is for you to go about your investigation without interference from me or any of the others. Very well, I say, hoping to keep my disappointment from him. It's a foolish notion, of course. He's me. He remembers this disappointment for himself. But the fact you're counseling me to solve this murder suggests you trust the plague doctor, I say. Have you uncovered his identity? Not yet, he says. And trust is too strong a word. He has his own purpose in this house, I'm certain of it, but for the moment, I can't see any other course beyond doing as he demands. And has he told you why this is happening to us? I ask. We're interrupted by a commotion at the door, our heads turning towards Ravencourt's valet who's halfway out of his coat and trying to extricate himself from the clutches of a long purple scarf. He's wind-tussled and slightly out of breath, his cheeks swollen with cold. I received a message that you required me urgently, my lord, he says, still tugging at the scarf. My doing, old love, says Daniel, 
deftly slipping back into character. You've a busy day ahead and I thought Cunningham here could be of use. Speaking of busy days, I must be going myself. I've got a midday appointment with Sebastian Bell. I won't leave Evelyn to her fate, Daniel, I say. Neither did I, he says, flicking his cigarette into the verge and shutting the window. But fate found her anyway. You should prepare yourself for that. He's gone in a few long strides, the library filling with the burble of voices and the loud clatter of cutlery as he tugs open the door into the study, and passes through on his way to the drawing room. The guests are gathering for lunch, which means Stanwin will soon threaten the maid, Lucy Harper, while Sebastian Bell watches from the window, feeling himself a fraction of a man. A hunt will depart, Evelyn will collect a note from the well, and blood will be spilled in a graveyard while two friends wait for a woman who will never arrive. If Daniel's right, there's little I can do to disrupt the day's course, though I'll be damned if I'm going to lie down before it. The plague doctor's puzzle may be my way out of this house, but I'll not step over Evelyn's body to escape. I mean to save her, no matter the cost. How can I be of service, my lord? Pass me paper, a pen, and some ink, would you? I need to write something down. Of course, he says, retrieving the items from his attaché case. My hands are too clumsy for flowing penmanship, but amidst the smeared ink and ugly blots, the message reads clearly enough. I check the clock. It's 11.56 a.m. almost time. After airing the paper to dry the ink, I fold it neatly and press the creases down, handing it to Cunningham. Take this, I say, noticing the traces of greasy black dirt on his hands as he reaches for the letter. His skin's pink with scrubbing, but the dirt's etched into the whorls of his fingertips. Aware of my attention, he takes the letter and clasps his hands behind his back. I need you to go directly to the drawing room where they're serving lunch, I say. Stay there and observe events as they unfold, then read this letter and return to me. Confusion paints his face. My lord. We're about to have a very strange day, Cunningham, and I'm going to need your absolute trust. I wave away his protests, gesturing for him to help me out of the seat. Do as I ask, I say, getting to my feet with a grunt. Then return here and wait for me. As Cunningham heads for the drawing room, I retrieve my cane and make my way to the sun room in the hopes of finding Evelyn. Being early, it's only half full, ladies pouring themselves drinks from the bar, wilting over chairs and chaise longs. Everything seems to be a very great effort for them, as though the pale flush of youth were a burden, their energy exhausting. They're muttering about Evelyn a ripple of ugly laughter directed towards the chess table in the corner, where a game is laid out before her. She has no opponent, her concentration fixed on outwitting herself. Whatever discomfort they're hoping to heap upon her, she seems oblivious to it. Evie, can we speak? I say, hobbling over. She lifts her head slowly, taking a moment to register me. As yesterday, her blonde hair is tied up into a ponytail, tugging her features into a gaunt, rather severe expression. Unlike yesterday, it doesn't soften. No, I don't think so, Lord Ravencourt, she says, returning her attention to the board. I've quite enough unpleasant things to do today without adding to the list. Hushed laughter turns my blood to dust. I crumble from the inside out. Please, Evie, it's it's Miss Hardcastle, Lord Ravencourt she says pointedly. Manners make the man, not his bank account. A pit of humiliation opens in my stomach. This is Ravencourt's worst nightmare. Standing in this room, a dozen pairs of eyes upon me, I feel like a Christian waiting for the first rocks to be thrown. Evelyn ponders me, sweating and shaking. Her eyes narrow, glittering. Tell you what, play me for it, she says tapping the chessboard. You win and we'll have a conversation, I win and you leave me be for the rest of the day. How would that suit? Knowing it's a trap, but in no position to argue, I wipe the sweat from my brow and wedge myself into the small chair opposite her, much to the delight of the assembled ladies. 
she could have forced me into a guillotine and I would have been more comfortable. I spill over the sides of the seat, the low back offering so little support that I tremble with the effort of keeping myself upright. Unmoved by my suffering, Evelyn crosses her arms on the table and pushes a pawn across the board. I follow it with a rook, the pattern of the middle game weaving itself in my mind. Although we're evenly matched, discomfort is digging holes in my concentration, my tactics proving too ramshackle to overpower Evelyn. The best I can do is prolong the match, and after half an hour of counters and feints, my patience is exhausted. Your life is in danger, I blurt out. Evelyn's fingers pause on her pawn, a little tremor of her hand sounding loud as a bell. Her eyes skirt my face, then those of the ladies behind us, searching for anybody who might have heard. They're frantic, working hard to scrub the moment from history. She already knows. I thought we had a deal, Lord Ravencourt, she interrupts, her expression hardening once more. But would you prefer I leave, she says her glare strangling any further attempts at conversation. Move after move follows, but I'm so perplexed by her response, I pay little heed to strategy. Whatever's going to happen tonight, Evelyn seems to be aware of it and yet her greater fear seems to be that somebody else will find out. For the life of me I can't imagine why that would be and it's clear she's not going to open her heart to Ravencourt. Her disdain for this man is absolute, which means if I'm to save her life, I must either put on a face she likes or press forward without her help. It's an infuriating turn of events and I'm desperately trying to find a way of reframing my argument when Sebastian Bell arrives at the door, provoking the queerest of sensations. By any measure this man is me, but watching him creep into the room like a mouse along a skirting board, I struggle to believe it. His back is stooped, his head low, arms stiff by his sides. Furtive glances scout every step his world seemingly filled with sharp edges. My grandmother, Heather Hardcastle, says Evelyn, watching him examine the portrait on the wall. It's not a flattering picture, but then she wasn't a flattering woman by all accounts. My apologies, says Belle. I was their conversation proceeds exactly as it did yesterday, her interest in this frail creature prompting a pang of jealousy, though that's not my principal concern. Bell's repeating my day exactly and yet he believes himself to be making his choices freely, as I did. Likely then I'm blindly following a course plotted by Daniel, which makes me, what, an echo, a memory, or just a piece of driftwood caught in the current. Flip over the chessboard, change this moment. Prove yourself unique. My hand reaches out, but the thought of Evelyn's reaction, her disdain, the laughter of the assembled ladies, is too much. Shame cripples me, and I jerk my hand back. There'll be further opportunities, I need to keep watch for them. Thoroughly demoralized and with defeat unavoidable, I dash the last few moves, putting my king to the sword with unseemly haste before staggering from the room, Sebastian Bell's voice fading behind me. Fifteen as ordered, Cunningham's waiting for me in the library. He's sitting on the edge of a chair the letter I gave him unfolded and trembling slightly in his hand. He stands as I enter, but in my desire to put the sunroom behind me I've moved too quickly. I can hear myself breathing, wheezy desperate bursts from my overburdened lungs. He doesn't venture to help. How did you know what was going to happen in the drawing room, he asks. I try to answer, but there isn't room for both words and air in my throat. I choose the latter guzzling it with the same appetite as everything else in Ravencourt's life, while staring into the study. I'd hoped to catch the plague doctor while he chatted with Belle, but my futile attempt to warn Evelyn dragged on longer than I expected. Perhaps I shouldn't be surprised. As I saw on the road to the village, the plague doctor seems to know where I'll be and when, no doubt timing his appearances so I can't ambush him. It happened exactly as you described it, continues Cunningham staring at the paper in disbelief. Ted Stanwin insulted the maid and Daniel Coleridge stepped in. They even spoke the words you wrote down. They spoke them exactly. I could explain, but he hasn't got to the section troubling him yet. Instead, I hobble over to the chair, 
lowering myself onto the cushion with a great deal of effort. My legs throb in pitiful gratitude. Was it a trick, he asks. No trick, I say. And this, the final line, where you say, yes. That you're not Lord Ravencourt. I'm not Ravencourt, I say. You're not. I'm not. Get a drink, you're looking a little pale. He does as I say, obedience seemingly being the only part of him that hasn't thrown its hands up in defeat. He returns with a glass of something and sits down, sipping it, his eyes never leaving mine, legs pressed together, shoulders bowed. I tell him everything, from the murder in the forest and my first day as Bell, right through to the never-ending road and my recent conversation with Daniel. Doubt flickers on his face, but every time it seems to have a foothold, he glances at the letter. I almost feel sorry for him. Do you need another drink? I ask, nodding towards his half-empty glass. If you're not Lord Ravencourt, where is he? I don't know. Is he alive? He can barely make eye contact. Would you rather he wasn't? I ask. Lord Ravencourt's been good to me, he says, anger flashing across his face. That doesn't answer the question. I look at Cunningham again. Downcast eyes and dirty hands, a smeared tattoo from a troubled past. In a flash of intuition, I realize he's afraid, but not of what I've told him. He's afraid of what somebody who's already seen this day unfold might know. He's hiding something, I'm certain of it. I need your help, Cunningham, I say. There's lots to do and while I'm shackled to Ravencourt, I don't have the legs to do any of it. Draining his glass, he gets to his feet. The drinks painted two spots of color on his cheeks and when he speaks his voice drips with the bottle's courage. I'm going to take my leave now and resume service tomorrow when Lord Ravencourt has, he pauses, considering the right word returned. He bows stiffly, before heading for the door. Do you think he'll take you back when he knows your secret? I say abruptly, an idea dropping into my head like a stone into a pond. If I'm right and Cunningham is hiding something, it may be shameful enough to use as leverage. He stops dead beside my chair, hands clenched tight. What do you mean, he says, staring straight ahead. Look beneath the cushion of your seat, I say, trying to keep the tension from my voice. The logic of what I'm attempting is sound, but that doesn't mean it will actually work. He glances at the chair, then back towards me. Without a word he does as I say, discovering a small white envelope. Triumph twists a smile from my lips as he tears it open, his shoulders sagging. How did you know, he asks, his voice cracked. I don't know a thing, but when I wake up in my next host, I'm going to dedicate myself to the task of uncovering your secret. I'm then going to return to this room and place the information in that envelope for you to find. Should this conversation not go the way I want, I'll place the envelope where the other guests can find it. He snorts at me, his contempt a slap in the face. You may not be Ravencourt, but you sound exactly like him. The idea is so startling it momentarily silences me. Until now I'd assumed my personality whatever that might be was carried into each new host, filling them as pennies fill a pocket, but what if I was wrong? None of my previous hosts would have thought to blackmail Cunningham, let alone had the stomach to act on the threat. In fact, looking back at Sebastian Bell, Roger Collins, Donald Davies and now Ravencourt, I can see little in their behavior to suggest a common hand at work. Could it be that I'm bending to their will? rather than the other way around? If so, I must be wary. It's one thing to be caged in these people, quite another to abandon oneself entirely to their desires. My thoughts are interrupted by Cunningham, who's setting fire to a corner of the letter with a lighter from his pocket. What is it you want from me, he says in a hard, flat voice, dropping the burning paper into the grate. Four things, initially, I say, counting them off on my thick fingers. First, I need you to find an old well off the road into the village. There'll be a note tucked into a crack in the stone. Read it, put it back and return to me with the message. 
Do it soon, the note will be gone within the hour. Secondly, you need to find that plague doctor costume I asked about earlier. Thirdly, I want you scattering the name Anna around Blackheath like confetti. Let it be known Lord Ravencourt is looking for her. Finally, I need you to introduce yourself to Sebastian Bell. Sebastian Bell, the doctor. That's the chapter. Why? Because I remember being Sebastian Bell, but I don't remember meeting you, I say. If we change that, it means I prove to myself that something else can be changed today. Evelyn Hardcastle's death. Precisely. Letting out a long breath, Cunningham turns to face me. He seems diminished, as though our conversation were a desert he's spent a week crossing. If I do these things, can I expect the contents of this letter to stay between us, he says, his expression conveying more hope than expectation. It will, you have my word. I extend a sweaty hand. Then it seems I have no choice, he says, shaking it firmly, only the slightest flicker of disgust showing on his face. He departs in a hurry, probably wary of being burdened with more tasks should he linger. In his absence, the damp air seems to settle upon me, sinking through my clothes and into my bones. Judging the library too cheerless to stay in any longer, I struggle out of my seat, using my cane to hoist myself onto my feet. I pass through the study on my way to Ravencourt's parlor, where I'll settle myself ahead of my meeting with Helena Hardcastle. If she's plotting to murder Evelyn this evening, then, by Lord, I mean to have it out of her. The house is still, the men out hunting and the women drinking in the sun room. Even the servants have disappeared, scattering back below stairs to prepare for the ball. In their wake a great hush has fallen, my only company the rain tapping at the windows, demanding to be let inside. Bell missed the noise, but as somebody finely tuned to the malice of others, Ravencourt finds this silence refreshing. It's like airing a musty room. Heavy steps disturb my reverie, each one deliberate and slow, as if determined to draw my attention. I've reached as far as the dining hall, where a long oak table is overlooked by the mounted heads of long slaughtered beasts, their fur faded and thick with dust. The room is empty, and yet the steps seem to be all around, mimicking my hobbling gait. I stiffen, coming to a halt, sweat beating my brow. The steps stop in turn. Dabbing my forehead, I look around nervously, wishing Bell's paper knife were to hand. Buried in Ravencourt's sluggish flesh, I feel like a man dragging an anchor. I can neither run nor fight, and even if I could, I'd be swinging at air. I'm quite alone. After a brief hesitation, I begin walking again, those ghostly steps trailing me. I stop suddenly, and they stop with me, a sinister giggle drifting out of the walls. My heart's pounding, hair standing up on my arms as fright sends me lurching towards the safety of the entrance hall visible through the drawing room door. By now the steps aren't bothering mimicking me, they're dancing, that giggle seeming to come from every direction. I'm panting by the time I reach the doorway, blinded by sweat and moving so fast I'm in danger of tripping over my own cane. As I pass into the entrance hall, the laughter stops abruptly, a whisper chasing me out. We'll meet soon, little rabbit. Sixteen ten minutes later, the whispers long faded, but the terror it provoked echoes still. It wasn't the words themselves, so much as the glee they carried. That warning was a down payment on the blood and pain to come, and only a fool wouldn't see the footman behind it. Holding my hand up, I check to see how badly it's trembling, and, deciding that I'm at least moderately recovered, I continue onwards to my room. I've only taken a step or two when sobbing draws my attention to a dark doorway at the back of the entrance hall. For a full minute I hover on the periphery, peering into the dimness, fearing a trap. Surely the footman wouldn't try something so soon, or be able to summon up these pitiable gulps of sadness I'm hearing now. Sympathy compels me to take a tentative step forward, and I find myself in a narrow gallery adorned with Hardcastle family portraits. Generations wither on the walls, the current incumbents of Blackheath hanging nearest the door. Lady Helena Hardcastle is sitting regally beside her standing husband, 
both of them dark-haired and dark-eyed, beautifully supercilious. Next to them are the portraits of the children, Evelyn at a window, fingering the edge of the curtain as she watches for somebody's arrival, while Michael has one leg flung over the arm of the chair he's sitting in, a book discarded on the floor. He looks bored, shimmering with a restless energy. In the corner of each portrait is a splashed signature, that of Gregory Gold if I'm not very much mistaken. The memory of the butler's beating at the artist's hands is still fresh and I find myself gripping my cane, tasting the blood in my mouth once again. Evelyn told me Gold had been brought to Blackheath to touch up the portraits and I can see why. The man may be insane, but he's talented. Another sob issues from the corner of the room. There are no windows in the gallery, only burning oil lamps, and it's so dim I have to squint to locate the maid slumped in the shadows, weeping into a soggy handkerchief. Tact would advise that I approach quietly, but Ravencourt's ill-designed for stealth. My cane wraps the floor, the sound of my breathing running on ahead, announcing my presence. Catching sight of me, the maid leaps to her feet, her cap coming loose, curly red hair springing free. I recognize her immediately. This is Lucy Harper, the maid Ted Stanwin abused at lunch, and the woman who helped me down to the kitchen when I awoke as the butler. The memory of that kindness echoes within me, a warm rush of pity shaping the words in my mouth. I'm sorry, Lucy, I didn't mean to startle you, I say. No, sir, it's not. I shouldn't, she casts around for some escape, miring herself further in etiquette. I heard you crying. I say, attempting to push a sympathetic smile onto my face. It's a difficult thing to achieve with somebody else's mouth, especially when there's so much flesh to move around. Oh, sir, you shouldn't, it was my fault. I made a mistake at lunch, she says, dabbing the last of her tears away. Ted Stanwin treated you atrociously, I say, surprised by the alarm rising on her face. No, sir. You mustn't say that, she says, her voice hurdling an entire octave. Ted, Mr. Stanwin, I mean, he's been good to us servants. Always treated us right, he has. He's just, now he's a gentleman, he can't be seen, she's on the verge of tears again. I understand, I say hastily. He doesn't want the other guests treating him like a servant. A smile swallows her face. That's it, sir, that's just it. They'd never have caught Charlie Carver if it weren't for Ted, but the other gentlemen still look at him like he's one of us. Not Lord Hardcastle though, he calls him Mr. Stanwin and everything. Well, as long as you're quite all right, I say, taken aback by the pride in her voice. I am, sir, really I am, she says earnestly, emboldened enough to scoop her cap from the floor. I should be getting back, they'll be wondering where I've got to. She takes a step towards the door, but is too slow to prevent me throwing a question in her path. Lucy, do you know anybody called Anna? I ask. I was thinking she could be a servant. Anna. She pauses, tossing the full weight of her thought at the problem. No, sir, can't say as I do. Any of the maids acting strangely. Now. Sir, would you believe, you're the third person to ask that question today, she says, twisting a lock of her curly hair around her finger. Third. Yes, sir, MRS Derby was down in the kitchen only an hour ago wondering the same thing. Gave us a right fright she did. Highborn lady like that wandering around downstairs, ain't ever heard of such a thing. My hand grips my cane. Whoever this MRS Derby is, She's acting oddly and asking the same questions I am. Perhaps I've found another of my rivals. Or another host. The suggestion makes me blush, Ravencourt's familiarity with women extending only so far as acknowledging their existence in the world. The thought of becoming one is as unintelligible to him as a day spent breathing water. What can you tell me about MRS Derby? I ask. Nothing much, sir, says Lucy. Older lady, sharp tongue. I liked her. Not sure if it means anything, but there was a footman as well. 
came in a few minutes after MRS Derby asking the same question, any of the servants acting funny. My hand squeezes the knob of my cane even tighter, and I have to bite my tongue to keep from cursing. A footman. I say. What did he look like? Blonde hair, tall, but, she drifts off, looking troubled, I don't know, pleased with himself. Probably works for a gentleman, sir, they get like that, pick up airs and graces they do. Had a broken nose, all black and purple, like it only recently happened. I reckon somebody took exception to him. What did you tell him? Wasn't me, sir, was MRS Drudge, the cook. Said the same thing she said to MRS Derby, that the servants were fine, it was the guests gone she blushes oh, begging your pardon, sir, I didn't mean don't worry, Lucy, I find most of the people in this house as peculiar as you do. What have they been doing? She grins, her eyes darting towards the doors guiltily. When she speaks again, her voice is almost low enough to be drowned out by the creaking of the floorboards. Well, this morning Miss Hardcastle was out in the forest with her lady's maid, French she is, you should hear her, kill this and kill that. Somebody attacked them out by Charlie Carver's old cottage. One of the guests apparently, but they wouldn't say which one. Attacked, you're certain. I say, recalling my morning as Belle, and the woman I saw fleeing through the forest. I assumed it was Anna, but what if I was wrong? It wouldn't be the first assumption to trip me up in Blackheath. That's what they said, sir, she says, falling shy in the face of my eagerness. I think I need to have a chat with this French maid, what's her name? Madeline Aubert, sir, only I'd prefer it if you didn't let on who told you. They're keeping quiet about it. Madeline Aubert. That's the maid who gave Belle the note at dinner last night. In the confusion of recent events, I'd quite forgotten about his slashed arm. My lips are sealed, Lucy, thank you, I say, miming the action. Even so, I must speak with her. Could you let her know I'm looking for her? You don't have to tell her why, but there's a reward in it for both of you if she comes to my parlor. She looks doubtful, but agrees readily enough bolting before I have time to slip any more promises around her neck. If Ravencourt were able, I'd have a bounce in my step as I depart the gallery. Whatever apathy Evelyn may feel towards Ravencourt, she's still my friend and my will is still bent on saving her. If somebody threatened her in the forest this morning, it's not a stretch to assume the same person will play some part in her murder this evening. I must do everything in my power to intercept them, and hopefully this Madeline Aubert will be able to help. Who knows, by this point tomorrow I might have the murderer's name in hand. If the plague doctor honors his offer, I could escape this house with hosts to spare. This jubilation persists only as far as the corridor, my whistling faltering with each step further away from the brightness of the entrance hall. The footman's presence has transformed Blackheath its leaping shadows and blind corners populating my imagination with a hundred horrible deaths at his hands. Every little noise is enough to set my already overburdened heart racing. By the time I reach my parlor, I'm soaked with sweat, a knot in my chest. Closing the door behind me, I let out a long shuddering breath. At this rate, the footman won't need to kill me, my health will give out first. The parlor's a beautiful room a chaise long and an armchair beneath a chandelier reflecting the flames of a roaring fire. A sideboard is laid with spirits and mixers, sliced fruit, bitters, and a bucket of half-melted ice. Beside that sits a teetering pile of roast beef sandwiches, mustard running down the severed edges. My stomach would drag me towards the food, but my body's collapsing beneath me. I need to rest. The armchair takes my weight with ill temper, the legs bowing under the strain. Rain's thumping the windows, the sky bruised black and purple. Are these the same drops that fell yesterday, the same clouds? Do rabbits dig the same warrens, disturbing the same insects? Do the same birds fly the same patterns, crashing into the same windows? If this is a trap, what kind of prey is worthy of it? I could do with a drink, I mutter, rubbing my throbbing temples. 
Here you go, says a woman from directly behind me, the drink arriving over my shoulder in a small hand, the fingers bony and calloused. I attempt to turn, but there's too much of Ravencourt and too little of the seat. The woman shakes the glass impatiently, rattling the ice inside. You should drink this before the ice melts, she says. You'll forgive me if I'm suspicious of taking a drink from a woman I don't know, I say. She lowers her lips to my ear, her breath warm on my neck. But you do know me, she whispers. I was in the carriage with the butler. My name's Anna. Anna. I say, trying to raise myself from the seat. Her hand is an anvil on my shoulder, pushing me back down onto the cushions. Don't bother, by the time you get up I'll be gone, she says. We'll meet soon, but I need you to stop looking for me. Stop looking, why? Because you're not the only one searching, she says, withdrawing a little. The footman's hunting me as well, and he knows we're working together. If you keep looking, you're going to lead him straight to me. We're both safe while I'm hidden, so call off the dogs. I feel her presence recede, steps moving towards the far door. Wait, I cry. Do you know who I am? or why we're here. Please, there must be something you can tell me. She pauses, considering it. The only memory I woke up with was a name, she says. I think it's yours. My hands clutch the armrests. What was it? I ask. Aiden Bishop, she says. Now, I've done as you asked, so do as I ask. Stop looking for me. Seventeen Aiden Bishop, I say, wrapping my tongue around the vowels. Aiden. Bishop. Aiden, Aiden, Aiden. I've been trying different combinations, intonations, and deliveries of my name for the last half hour, hoping to lure some memories from my recalcitrant mind. Thus far, all I've managed to do is give myself a dry mouth. It's a frustrating way to pass the time, but I've few alternatives. 1.30 has come and gone, with no word from Helena Hardcastle to explain her absence. I summoned a maid to fetch her, but was informed that nobody's seen the lady of the house since this morning. The damn woman has disappeared. To make matters worse, neither Cunningham nor Madeline Aubert has visited me, and while I'd hardly expected Evelyn's maid to answer my summons, Cunningham's been gone for hours. I can't imagine what's keeping him but I'm growing impatient. We've so much to do, and little time left to do it. Allo, Cecil, says a rasping voice. Is Helena still here? I heard you were meeting her. Standing at the door is an elderly lady buried beneath a huge red coat, hat, and mud-spattered Wellington boots that almost reach her knees. Her cheeks are raw with cold, a scowl frozen on her face. I haven't seen her, I'm afraid, I say. I'm still waiting for her. You too, eh? Bloody woman was supposed to meet me in the garden this morning, left me shivering on a bench for an hour instead, she says, stomping over to the fire. She's wearing so many layers a spark will send her up like a Viking funeral. Wonder where she's got to, she says, tugging off her gloves and tossing them on the seat next to mine. It's not like there's a lot to do in Blackheath. Fancy a drink. Still working on this one. I say, waving my glass in her direction. You've got the right idea. I got it into my head to go for a stroll, but when I came back I couldn't get anybody to open the front door. I've been banging on windows for the last half hour, but there's not a servant to be seen. The whole thing's positively American. Decanters scrape free of their fittings, glasses thumping down on the wood. Ice tinkles against glass, crackling as alcohol is poured on top. There's a fizz and a satisfying plop, followed by a gulp and a long sigh of pleasure from the old lady. That's the stuff, she says, a fresh round of clinking glass suggesting the first was a warm-up. I told Helena this party was a terrible idea, but she wouldn't hear of it and now look, Peter's hiding in the gatehouse, Michael's holding the party together with his fingernails and Evelyn's playing dress up. The entire thing will be a disaster, mark my words. Drink in hand, 
the elderly lady resumes her position in front of the fire. She's shrunken magnificently after discarding a few layers, revealing pink cheeks and small pink hands, a crop of grey hair running wild on her head. What's this then, she says, lifting a white card off the mantel. Were you going to write to me, Cecil? Sorry. She hands me the card, a simple message written on the front. Meet Millicent Derby A. Anna's work no doubt. First burning gloves and now introductions. As strange as it is having somebody scattering breadcrumbs throughout my day, it's nice to know I have a friend in this place, even if it does put paid to my theory about MRS Derby being one of my rivals, or even another host. This old lady's much too herself to be anybody else underneath. Then why was she sniffing around the kitchen asking questions about the maids? I asked Cunningham to invite you for drinks, I say smoothly, taking a sip of my whiskey. He must have got distracted while writing the message down. That's what happens when you trust the lower classes with important tasks, sniffs Millicent, dropping into a nearby chair. Mark my words, Cecil, one day you'll find he's emptied your accounts and done a bunk with one of your maids. Look at that damnable Ted Stanwin. Used to waft about this place like a soft breeze when he was a groundskeeper, now you'd think he owns the place. The nerve of it. Stanwin's an objectionable fellow I agree, but I've a soft spot for the household staff, I say. They've treated me with a great deal of kindness. Besides, word has it you were down in the kitchen earlier, so you can't find them all bad. She waves her glass at me, splashing whiskey over my objection. Oh, that, yes, she trails off, sipping her drink to buy herself time. I think one of the maids stole something from my room, that's all. It's like I say, you never know what's going on underneath. Remember my husband. Vaguely, I say, admiring the elegance with which she's switched topic. Whatever she was doing in the kitchen, I doubt it had anything to do with theft. Same thing, she sniffs. Dreadful lower class upbringing, yet built himself forty odd cotton mills without ever being anything less than an absolute ass. In fifty years of marriage I didn't smile till the day I buried him and haven't stopped since. She's interrupted by a creaking sound from the corridor, followed by the squeak of hinges. Maybe that's Helena, says Millicent, pushing herself out of the chair. Her room is next door. I thought the hardcastles were staying in the gatehouse. Peter's staying in the gatehouse, she says, raising an eyebrow. Helen is staying here, insisted on it, by all accounts. Was never much of a marriage, but it's disintegrating quickly. I tell you, Cecil, it was worth coming for the scandal alone. The old lady heads into the corridor, calling out Helena's name, only to fall suddenly silent. What on earth? she mutters, before poking her head into my parlor again. Get up, Cecil, she says nervously. Something odd is going on. Concern drags me to my feet and into the hall, where Helena's bedroom door creaks back and forth in a breeze. The lock has been shattered, splinters of wood crunching underfoot. Somebody broke in, hisses Millicent, staying behind me. Using my cane, I slowly push the door open allowing us to peer inside. The room's empty, and has been for some time by the looks of things. The curtains are still drawn, light delivered secondhand from the lamps lining the corridor. A four-poster bed is neatly made, a vanity table is overflowing with face creams, powders and cosmetics of every sort. Satisfied that it's safe, Millicent appears from behind me, offering me a level glance best described as a belligerent apology before making her way around the bed to wrestle the heavy curtains open, banishing the gloom. The only thing that's been disturbed is a chestnut bureau with a roll-down top, its drawers hanging open. Among the ink bottles, envelopes, and ribbons scattered on it, there's a large lacquered case with two revolver-shaped hollows in the cushion. The revolvers themselves are nowhere to be seen, though I suspect Evelyn brought one of them to the graveyard. She did say it was her mother's. Well, at least we know what they wanted, says Millicent, tapping the case. Doesn't make any damn sense though. If somebody wanted a gun, 
they could just as easily steal one from the stables. There's dozens of them. Nobody would bat an eyelid. Pushing aside the case, Millicent unearths a moleskin day planner and begins leafing through the pages, running her finger across the meetings and events, reminders and notes crammed inside. The contents would suggest a busy, if rather dull life, if it weren't for the torn out last page. That's curious, today's appointments are missing, she says, her irritation giving way to suspicion. Now why would Helena rip those out? You believe she did it herself? I say. What use would anybody else have for them, says Millicent. Mark my words, Helena has something foolish in mind and she doesn't want anybody finding out about it. Now, if you'll excuse me, Cecil, I'm going to have to find her and talk her out of it. As usual. Tossing the planner on the bed, she stalks out of the bedroom and up the corridor. I barely notice her leave. I'm more concerned with the black smudged fingerprints on the pages. My valet's been here, and it appears he's looking for Helena Hardcastle as well. Eighteen the world's shriveling beyond the windows, darkening at the edges and blackening at the center. The hunters are beginning to emerge from the forest, waddling across the lawn like overgrown birds. Having grown impatient in my parlor waiting for Cunningham's return, I'm heading to the library to inspect the encyclopedia. It's already a decision I regret. A day of walking has sapped all my strength, this ponderous body growing heavier by the second. To make matters worse, the house is alive with activity, maids plumping cushions and arranging flowers, darting this way and that like schools of startled fish. I'm embarrassed by their vigor, cowed by their grace. By the time I enter the entrance hall, it's filled with hunters shaking the rain from their caps, puddles forming at their feet. They're soaking wet and grey with cold, the life washed right out of them. They've clearly endured a miserable afternoon. I pass through nervously, my eyes downcast, wondering if any of these scowling faces belongs to the footman. Lucy Harper told me he had a broken nose when he visited the kitchen, which gives me some hope that my hosts are fighting back, not to mention an easy way of picking him out. Seeing no injuries, I continue more confidently, the hunters standing aside, allowing me to shuffle through on my way to the library, where the heavy curtains have been drawn and a fire set in the grate, the air touched with a faint perfume. Fat candles sit on plates, plumes of warm light pockmarking the shadows, illuminating three women curled up on chairs, engrossed in the books open on their laps. Heading to the bookshelf where the encyclopedia should be, I grope about in the darkness, finding only an empty space. Taking a candle from a nearby table, I pass the flame across the shelf hoping it has been moved, but it's definitely gone. I let out a long breath, deflating like the bellows of some awful contraption. Until now, I hadn't realized how much hope I'd invested in the encyclopedia, or in the idea of meeting my future hosts face to face. It wasn't only their knowledge I craved, but the chance to study them, as one might one's own twisted reflections in a hall of mirrors. Surely in such observation, I'd find some repeated quality, a fragment of my true self carried through into each man, unsullied by the personalities of their hosts. Without that opportunity, I'm not certain how to identify the edges of myself, the dividing lines between my personality and that of my host. For all I know, the only difference between myself and the footman is the mind I'm sharing. The days leaning on my shoulders, forcing me into a chair opposite the fire. Stacked logs pop and crackle, heat shimmering and sagging in the air. My breath catches in my throat. Among the flames lies the encyclopedia, burnt to ash but holding its shape, a breath away from crumbling. The footman's work no doubt. I feel like I've been struck, which was no doubt the intention. Everywhere I go, he seems to be a step ahead of me. And yet, Simply winning isn't enough. He needs me to know it. He needs me to be afraid. For some reason, he needs me to suffer. Still reeling from this blatant act of contempt, I lose myself in the flames, piling all my misgivings onto the bonfire until Cunningham calls me from the doorway. Lord Ravencourt. Where the devil have you been? I snap, my temper slipping away from me completely. 
He strolls around my chair, taking a spot near the fire to warm his hands. He looks to have been caught in the storm, and though he's changed his clothes, his damp hair is still wild from the towel. It's good to see Ravencourt's temper is still intact, he says placidly. I'd feel positively adrift without my daily dressing down. Don't play the victim with me, I say, wagging my finger at him. You've been gone hours. Good work takes time, he says, tossing an object onto my lap. Holding it up to the light, I stare into the empty eyes of a porcelain beak mask, my anger evaporating immediately. Cunningham lowers his voice, glancing at the woman, who are watching us with open curiosity. It belongs to a chap called Philip Sutcliffe, says Cunningham. One of the servants spotted it in his wardrobe, so I crept into his room when he left for the hunt. Sure enough the top hat and greatcoat were in there as well, along with a note promising to meet Lord Hardcastle at the ball. I thought we could intercept him. Slapping my hand against my knee, I grin at him like a maniac. Good work, Cunningham, good work indeed. I thought you'd be happy, he says. Unfortunately, that's where my good news ends. The note waiting for Miss Hardcastle at the well, it was, odd, to say the least. Odd, how so? I say, holding the beak mask over my face. The porcelain's cold, clammy against my skin, but aside from that it's a good fit. The rain had smeared it, but best I could tell it said, stay away from Millicent Derby, with a simple drawing of a castle beneath it. There was nothing else. That's a peculiar sort of warning, I say. Warning. I took it as a threat, says Cunningham. You think Millicent Derby's going to take after Evelyn with her knitting needles? I say, raising an eyebrow. Don't dismiss her because she's old, he says, prodding some life into the dwindling fire with a poker. At one time, half the people in this house were under Millicent Derby's thumb. There wasn't a dirty secret she couldn't ferret out, or a dirty trick she wouldn't use. Ted Stanwin was an amateur in comparison. You've had dealings with her. Ravencourt has and he doesn't trust her, he says. The man's a bastard, but he's no fool. That's good to know, I say. Did you meet with Sebastian Bell? Not yet, I'll catch him this evening. I wasn't able to turn over anything about the mysterious Anna either. Oh, no need, she found me earlier today, I say, picking at a loose piece of leather on the arm of the chair. Really, what did she want? She didn't say. Well, how does she know you? We didn't get around to it. Is she a friend? Possibly. Profitable meeting then, he says slyly replacing the poker on its stand speaking of which, we should get you into a bath. Dinner's at 8 p.m. and you're beginning to smell a bit ripe. Let's not give people any more reason to dislike you than they already do. He moves to help me up, but I wave him back. No, I need you to shadow Evelyn for the rest of the evening, I say, struggling to raise myself from the chair. Gravity, it seems, is opposed to the idea. To what end? he asks, frowning at me. Somebody's planning to murder her, I say. Yes, and that somebody could be me for all you know, he says blandly, as though suggesting nothing more important than a fondness for music halls. The idea strikes me with such force, I drop back into the seat I've half escaped, the wood cracking beneath me. Ravencourt trusts Cunningham completely, a trait I've adopted without question despite knowing he has a terrible secret. He's as much a suspect as anybody. Cunningham taps his nose. Now you're thinking, he says, sliding my arm over his shoulders. I'll find Belle when I've got you into the bath, but to my mind, you're better off shadowing Evelyn yourself when you're next able. In the meantime, I'll stick by your side so you can rule me out as a suspect. My life's complicated enough without having eight of you chasing me around the house accusing me of murder. You seem well versed in this sort of thing, I say, trying to scrutinize his reaction from the corner of my eye. Well, I wasn't always a valet, he says. And what were you? 
I don't believe that information was part of our little arrangement, he says, a grimace on his face as he tries to lift me. Then why don't you tell me what you were doing in Helena Hardcastle's bedroom? I suggest. You smeared the ink while you were rifling through her day planner. I noticed it on your hands this morning. He lets out a whistle of astonishment. You have been busy. His voice hardens. Strange you haven't heard about my scandalous relationship to the hard castles, then. Oh, I wouldn't want to spoil the surprise for you. Ask around, it's not exactly a secret and I'm sure somebody will get a thrill from telling you. Did you break in, Cunningham? I demand. Two revolvers were taken, and a page torn from her day planner. I didn't have to break in, I was invited, he says. Couldn't tell you about those revolvers, but the day planner was whole when I left. Saw it myself. I suppose I could explain what I was doing there, and why I'm not your man, but, if you've got any sense, you wouldn't believe a word of it, so you might as well find out for yourself. That way you can be certain it's the truth. We rise in a damp cloud of sweat, Cunningham dabbing the perspiration from my forehead before handing me my cane. Tell me, Cunningham, I say. Why does a man like you settle for a job like this? That brings him up short, his normally implacable face darkening. Life doesn't always leave you a choice in how you live it, he says grimly. Now come on, we've a murder to attend. 19 The evening meal is lit by candelabra and beneath their flickering glow lies a graveyard of chicken bones, fish spines, lobster shells and pork fat. The curtains remain undrawn despite the darkness beyond, granting a view towards the forest being whipped by the storm. I can hear myself eating, the crush and the crack, the squelch and the gulp. Gravy runs down my chins, grease smearing my lips with a ghastly shimmering shine. Such is the ferocity of my appetite that I leave myself panting between mouthfuls, my napkin resembling a battlefield. The other diners are watching this hideous performance from the corner of their eyes, trying to maintain their conversations even as the decorum of the evening crunches between my teeth. How can a man know such hunger? What hollowness must he be trying to fill? Michael Hardcastle's sitting to the left of me, though we've barely spoken two words since I arrived. He's spent most of his time in hushed conversation with Evelyn, heads bowed close, their affection impenetrable. For a woman who knows herself to be in danger, she seems remarkably unperturbed. Perhaps she believes herself protected. Have you ever travelled to the Orient, my Lord Ravencourt? If only the seat to my right was similarly oblivious to my presence. It's filled by Commander Clifford Harrington a balding former naval officer in a uniform glittering with valor. After an hour spent in his company, I'm struggling to reconcile the man with the deeds. Perhaps it's the weak chin and averted gaze, the sense of imminent apology. More likely it's the scotch sloshing around behind his eyes. Harrington spent the evening tossing around tedious stories without bothering to indulge in the courtesy of exaggeration, and now it appears our conversation is washing up on the shores of Asia. I sip my wine to cover my agitation, discovering the taste to be peculiarly piquant. My grimace causes Harrington to lean over conspiratorially. I had the same reaction, he says, hitting me full in the face with his warm, alcohol-soaked breath. I quizzed a servant on the vintage. Might as well have asked the glass I was drinking it out of. The candelabra gives his face a ghoulish yellow cast and there's a drunken sheen to his eyes that's repellent. Putting my wine down, I cast about for some distraction. There must be fifteen people around the table, words of French, Spanish and German seasoning otherwise dull conversational fare. Expensive jewellery clinks against glass, cutlery rattles as waiters remove plates. The mood in the room is somber, the scattered conversations hushed and urgent, spoken across a dozen empty seats. It's an eerie sight, mournful even and though the absences are notable, everybody seems to be going out of their way to avoid noting them. I can't tell whether it's a matter of good breeding, or there's some explanation I've missed. I search for familiar faces to ask, but Cunningham's gone to meet Belle and there's no sign of Millicent Derby, Dr. Dickey, or even the repulsive Ted Stanwin. 
Aside from Evelyn and Michael, the only other person I recognize is Daniel Coleridge, who's sitting near a thin fellow at the far end of the table, the two of them eyeing the other guests from behind their half-filled wine glasses. Somebody's taken exception to that handsome face of Daniel's, adorning it with a split lip and a swollen eye that will be frightful tomorrow, assuming tomorrow ever actually arrives. The injury doesn't appear to be bothering him unduly, though it unsettles me. Until this moment, I'd considered Daniel immune to the machinations of this place, assuming his knowledge of the future allowed him to simply sidestep misfortune. Seeing him brought so low is like seeing the cards spilling out of a magician's sleeve. His dining companion thumps the table in delight at one of Daniel's jokes, drawing my attention. I feel as though I know this fellow, but I can't place him. A future host perhaps. I certainly hope not. He's a smear of a man with oiled hair and a pale, pinched face, his manner that of somebody who finds everything in the room beneath him. I sense cunning in him, cruelty too, though I can't understand from where I'm gathering these impressions. They have such outlandish remedies, says Clifford Harrington, raising his voice slightly to reclaim my attention. I blink at him in confusion. The Orientals, Lord Ravencourt, he says, smiling amiably. Of course, I say. No, I'm afraid I've never visited. Incredible place, incredible. They have these hospitals, I raise my hand to attract a servant. If I can't be spared the conversation, I can at least be spared the wine. One mercy may yet yield another. I was speaking with Dr. Bell last night about some of their opiates, he continues. Make it end. Is the food to your satisfaction? Lord Ravencourt, says Michael Hardcastle, neatly sidling into the conversation. I turn my eyes to meet him, gratitude flooding forth. A glass of red wine is half raised to his lips, mischief sparkling in those green eyes. It's a stark contrast to Evelyn, whose gaze could tear strips from my skin. She's dressed in a blue evening gown and tiara, her blonde hair pinned up in curls, exposing the lavish diamond necklace draped around her neck. It's the same outfit, minus an overcoat and Wellington boots, that she'll be wearing when she accompanies Sebastian Bell into the graveyard later this evening. Dabbing my lips, I bow my head. It's excellent, I'm just sorry there aren't more people to enjoy it, I say, gesturing towards the empty seats scattered around the table. I was particularly looking forward to meeting Mr. Sutcliffe. And his plague doctor costume, I think to myself. Well. You're in luck, interrupts Clifford Harrington. Old Sutcliffe's a good friend of mine, perhaps I can introduce you at the ball. Assuming he makes it, says Michael. He and my father will have reached the back of the liquor cabinet by now. Doubtless mother's trying to rouse them as we speak. Is Lady Hardcastle coming tonight? I ask. I hear she hasn't been seen much today. Returning to Blackheath has been hard on her says Michael, lowering his voice as though sharing a confidence. No doubt she's spent the day exorcising a few ghosts before the party. Rest assured, she'll be here. We're interrupted by one of the waiters leaning down to whisper in Michael's ear. The young man's expression immediately darkens, and as the waiter retreats, he passes the message to his sister, the gloom washing over her face as well. They look at each other a moment, squeezing hands, before Michael raps on his wine glass with a fork, and gets to his feet. He seems to unfurl as he stands so that he now appears unfeasibly tall, reaching well beyond the dim light of the candelabra, forcing him to speak from the shadows. The room is silent, all eyes upon him. I'd rather hoped my parents might make an appearance and save me from making a toast, he says. Clearly they're planning some grand entrance at the ball which knowing my parents will be very grand indeed. Muted laughter is met with a shy smile. My gaze skips across the guests, running straight into Daniel's amused stare. Dabbing his lips with a napkin, he flicks his eyes towards Michael, instructing me to pay attention. He knows what's coming. My father wanted to thank you for attending tonight and I'm sure he'll do so in great detail later, says Michael. There's a quiver in his voice the slightest hint of discomfort. In his stead, 
I'd like to extend my personal thanks to each of you for coming and to welcome my sister, Evelyn, back home after her time in Paris. She reflects his adoration, the two of them sharing a smile that has nothing to do with this room, or these people. Even so, glasses are raised, reciprocal thanks washing back along the table. Michael waits for the commotion to die down, then continues. She'll soon be embarking on a brand new adventure, and he pauses, eyes on the table, well, she's going to be married to Lord Cecil Ravencourt. Silence engulfs us, all eyes turning in my direction. Shock becomes confusion, then disgust, their faces a perfect reflection of my own feelings. There must be thirty years and a thousand meals between Ravencourt and Evelyn, whose hostility this morning is now explained. If Lord and Lady Hardcastle really do blame their daughter for Thomas's death, their punishment is exquisite. They plan to steal all the years from her that were stolen from Thomas. I look over at Evelyn, but she's fidgeting with a napkin and biting her lip, her former humor having fled. A bead of sweat is rolling down Michael's forehead, the wine shaking in his glass. He can't even look at his sister, and she can't look anywhere else. Never has a man found a tablecloth so engrossing as I do now. Lord Ravencourt's an old friend of the family, says Michael mechanically, soldiering on into the silence. I can't think of anybody who'd take better care of my sister. Finally, he looks at Evelyn, meeting her glistening eyes. Evie, I think you wanted to say something. She nods, the napkin strangled in her hands. All eyes are fixed on her, nobody moving. Even the servants are staring, standing by the walls, holding dirty plates and fresh bottles of wine. Finally, Evelyn looks up from her lap, meeting the expectant faces arranged before her. Her eyes are wild, like an animal caught in a trap. Whatever words she prepared, they desert her immediately, replaced with a wretched sob that drives her from the room, Michael chasing after her. Among the rustle of bodies turning in my direction, I seek out Daniel. The amusement of earlier has passed, his gaze now fixed on the window. I wonder how many times he's watched the slow blush rise up my cheeks, if he even remembers how this shame felt. Is that why he can't look at me now? Will I do any better, when my time comes? Abandoned at the end of the table, my instinct is to flee with Michael and Evelyn, but I might as well wish for the moon to reach down and pluck me from this chair. Silence swirls until Clifford Harrington gets to his feet, candle light glinting off his naval medals as he raises his glass. To many happy years, he says, seemingly without irony. One by one, every glass is raised and the toast repeated in a hollow chant. At the end of the table, Daniel winks at me. Twenty the dining hall has long emptied of guests, the servants having finally cleared away the last of the platters when Cunningham comes to collect me. He's been standing outside for over an hour, but every time he's tried to enter, I've waved him back. After the humiliation of dinner, having anybody see my valet help me from my seat would be an indignity too far. When he does stroll in, there's a smirk on his face. No doubt word of my shaming has run laps around the house, fat old Ravencourt and his runaway bride. Why didn't you tell me about Ravencourt's marriage to Evelyn? I demand stopping him in his tracks to humiliate you, he says. I stiffen, my cheeks reddening, as he meets my gaze. His eyes are green, the pupils uneven, like splashed ink. I see conviction enough to raise armies and burn churches. God help Ravencourt should this boy ever decide to stop being his footstool. Ravencourt is a vain man, easy to embarrass, continues Cunningham in a level voice. I noticed you'd inherited this quality and I made sport of it. Why? I ask, stunned by his honesty. You blackmailed me, he says, shrugging. You didn't think I'd take that lying down, did you? I blink at him for a few seconds before laughter erupts out of me. It's a belly laugh, the rolls of my flesh shaking in appreciation at his audacity. I humiliated him and he handed back an equal weight of that misery using nothing more than patience. What man wouldn't be charmed by such a feat? Cunningham frowns at me, his eyebrows knitting together. 
You're not angry, he asks. I suspect my anger is of little concern to you, I say, wiping a tear from my eye. Regardless, I threw the first stone. I can't complain if a boulder comes back at me. My mirth prompts an echoing smile in my companion. It appears there are some differences between yourself and Lord Ravencourt, after all, he says, measuring each word. Not least a name, I say, holding out my hand. Mine is Aidan Bishop. He shakes it firmly, his smile deepening. Very good to make your acquaintance, Aidan, I'm Charles. Well, I have no intention of telling anybody your secret, Charles, and I apologize for threatening it. I wish only to save Evelyn Hardcastle's life and escape Blackheath, and I don't have a lot of time to do either. I'll need a friend. Probably more than one, he says, cleaning his glasses on his sleeve. In all honesty, this tale's so peculiar I'm not sure I could walk away now, even if I wished to. Shall we go then, I say. By Daniel's reckoning, Evelyn will be murdered at the party at 11 p.m. If we're to save her, that's where we have to be. The ballroom is on the other side of the entrance hall, Cunningham supporting me at the elbow as we walk there. Carriages are arriving from the village, queuing up on the gravel outside. Horses nicker, footmen opening the doors for costumed guests, who flutter like canaries released from their cages. Why is Evelyn being compelled to marry Ravencourt? I whisper to Cunningham. Money, he says. Lord Hardcastle's got an eye for a bad investment, and not nearly enough intelligence to learn from his mistakes. Rumor suggests he's driving the family towards bankruptcy. In return for Evelyn's hand, Lord and Lady Hardcastle will receive a rather generous dowry and Ravencourt's promise to buy Blackheath in a couple of years for a tidy sum. So that's it, I say. The Hardcastles are hard up and they're pawning their daughter off like old jewellery. My thoughts flock back to this morning's chess game, the smile on Evelyn's face as I winced out of the sun room. Ravencourt isn't buying a bride, he's buying a bottomless well of spite. I wonder if the old fool understands what he's getting into. And what of Sebastian Bell? I say, remembering the task I set him. Did you speak with him? Afraid not, the poor fellow was passed out on the floor of his room when I arrived, he says, genuine pity in his voice. I saw the dead rabbit, seems your footman has a twisted sense of humor. I called for the doctor and left them to it. Your experiment will have to wait another day. My disappointment is drowned out by the music beating at the ballroom's closed doors, the sound tumbling into the hall when a servant sweeps them open for us. There must be at least fifty people inside, whirling through a soft puddle of light cast by a chandelier wreathed in candles. An orchestra is playing with bravado on a stage pressed against the far wall, but the majority of the room has been given over to the dance floor where harlequins in full livery court Egyptian queens and grinning devils. Jesters leap and mock, dislodging powdered wigs and gold masks held up on long sticks. Dresses, capes, and cowls swoop and swish across the floor, the crush of bodies disorientating. The only space to be found surrounds Michael Hardcastle in his dazzling sun mask, its pointed rays extending such a distance from his face that it's unsafe to venture anywhere near him. We're viewing all this from a mezzanine, a small staircase leading down to the dance floor. My fingers are wrapping the banister, keeping time with the music. Some part of me, the part that's still Raven Court, knows this song and is enjoying it. He yearns to pick up an instrument and play. Raven Court's a musician. I ask Cunningham. In his youth, he says. Talented violinist, by all accounts. Broke his arm riding, and could never play as well again. He still misses it. I think. He does, I say, surprised by the depth of his longing. Putting it aside, I return my attention to the matter at hand, but I have no idea how we're going to spot Sutcliffe among the crowd. Or the footman. My heart sinks. I hadn't considered that. Amid the noise and the crush of bodies, a blade could do its work and vanish without anybody ever being the wiser. Such thoughts would have caused Bell to flee back to his room but Ravencourt is made of sterner stuff. 
if this is where the attempt will be made on Evelyn's life, this is where I must be, come what may, and so with Charles supporting my arm, we descend the stairs, keeping to the shadowy edges of the ballroom. Clowns slap me on the back and women swirl in front of me, butterfly masks in hand. I ignore much of it, pushing my way to the couches near the French doors, where I can better rest my weary legs. Until now, I'd only witnessed my fellow guests in their handfuls, their spite spread thin across the house. To be ensnared among them all, as I am now, is something else entirely, and the further I descend into the uproar, the thicker their malice seems to become. Most of the men look to have spent the afternoon soaking in their cups and are staggering instead of dancing, snarling and staring, their conduct savage. Young women throw their heads back and laugh, their makeup running and hair coming loose as they're passed from body to body, goading a small group of wives who've grouped together for safety, wary of these panting, wild-eyed creatures. Nothing like a mask to reveal somebody's true nature. Beside me Charles has grown increasingly tense his fingers digging deeper into my forearm with every step. All of this is wrong. The celebration is too desperate. This is the last party before Gamara fell. We reach a couch, Charles lowering me onto the cushions. Waitresses are moving through the crowd with trays of drinks, but it's proving impossible to signal them from our position on the fringe of the party. It's too loud to talk but he points towards the champagne table guests are stumbling away from arm in arm. I nod, dabbing the sweat from my forehead. Perhaps a drink will serve to settle my nerves. As he leaves to fetch a bottle, I feel a breeze on my skin and notice that somebody has opened the French doors, presumably to let a little air circulate. It's pitch black outside, but braziers have been lit, the flickering flames winding all the way up to a reflecting pool surrounded by trees. The darkness swirls, taking shape, solidifying as it sweeps inside, candlelight dripping onto a pale face. Not a face, a mask. A white porcelain beak mask. I look around for Charles, hoping he's near enough to lay hands on the fellow, but the crowd has carried him away. Looking back towards the French doors, I see the plague doctor slipping through the reveler's shoulder first. Gripping my cane. I heave myself to my feet. Wrecks have been raised from the ocean bed with less effort, but I hobble towards the cascade of costumes shrouding my quarry. I follow glimpses the glint of a mask, the swirl of a cloak but he's fog in a forest, impossible to snatch hold of. I lose him somewhere in the far corner. Turning on the spot, I try to catch sight of him, but somebody comes clattering into me. I bellow in fury finding myself looking into a pair of brown eyes peering out from behind a porcelain beak mask. My heart leaps and so do I evidently, for the mask is swiftly removed to reveal the pinched boyish face behind. Gosh, I'm sorry, he says. I didn't Rochester, Rochester, over here, somebody yells to him. We turn at the same time, another fellow in a plague doctor costume approaching us. There's another behind him three more in the crowd. My quarry has multiplied, yet none of them can be my interlocutor. They're too stout and short, too tall and thin, too many imperfect copies of the real thing. They try to drag their friend away, but I catch hold of the nearest arm any arm, they're all the same. Where did you get these costumes? I ask. The fellow scowls at me, his grey eyes bloodshot. They're lightless, expressionless. Empty doorways without a coherent thought behind them. Shaking himself loose of my grip, he prods me in the chest. Ask me nicely, he slurs drunkenly. He's itching for a fight and, lashing out with my cane, I give it to him. The heavy wood catches him on the leg, a curse detonating on his lips as he drops to one knee. Attempting to steady himself, he places his palm flat on the dance floor the point of my cane landing on top of his hand, pinning him to the ground. The costumes, I shout. Where did you find them? The attic, he says, his face now as pale as the discarded mask. There's dozens of them hanging on a rack. He strains to free himself, but only a fraction of my weight is resting on the cane. I add a little more, pain unsettling his features. 
How did you know about them? I ask, taking a little pressure off his hand. A servant found us last night, he says, tears forming in his eyes. He was already wearing one, mask and hat, the entire get up. We didn't have costumes, so he took us up to the attic to find some. He was helping everybody, must have been two dozen people up there, I swear. Seems the plague doctor doesn't want to be found. I watch him squirm for a second or two, balancing the veracity of his story against the pain on his face. Content that the two are of equal weight, I lift my cane, allowing him to stumble away, clutching his aching hand. He's barely out of my sight before Michael emerges from the crowd, spotting me at a distance and driving straight towards me. He's flustered, two red spots on his cheeks. His mouth is moving frantically, but his words are lost in the music and laughter. I signal that I cannot understand, and he comes closer. Have you seen my sister, he yells. I shake my head, suddenly fearful. I can see in his eyes that something is wrong, but before I can quiz him further, he's pushing back through the whirling dancers. Hot and giddy, oppressed by a sense of foreboding, I fight my way to my seat, removing my bow tie and loosening my collar. Masked figures drift by, naked arms glittering with perspiration. I feel nauseous, unable to take pleasure in anything I see. I'm contemplating joining the search for Evelyn when Cunningham returns with a bottle of champagne in a silver bucket crammed with ice, and two long-stemmed glasses tucked under his arm. The metal's sweating, as is Cunningham. It's been so long I'd quite forgotten what he'd left to do, and I yell into his ear. Where have you been? Thought, saw Sutcliffe, he yells back, about half the words carrying through the music, costume. Evidently Cunningham's had much the same experience I had. Nodding my understanding, we sit and drink silently, keeping our eyes open for Evelyn, my frustration mounting. I need to be on my feet, searching the house, questioning guests, but Ravencourt's incapable of such feats. This room is too crowded, his body too weary. He's a man of calculation and observation, not action, and if I'm to help Evelyn, these are the skills I must embrace. Tomorrow I'll dash, but today I must watch. I need to see everything that's happening in this ballroom, cataloging every detail, in order to get ahead of this evening's events. The champagne calms me, but I put my glass down, wary of dulling my faculties. That's when I spot Michael, climbing the few steps that lead to the mezzanine overlooking the ballroom. The orchestra is silenced, the laughter and chatter slowly dying down as all heads turn towards their host. I'm sorry to interrupt, says Michael, gripping the banister, I feel foolish for asking but does anybody know where my sister is? A ripple of conversation washes over the crowd as heads turn to look at one another. It takes only a minute to determine she's not in the ballroom. It's Cunningham who spots her first. Touching my arm, he points towards Evelyn, who's weaving drunkenly as she follows the braziers towards the reflecting pool. She's some distance away already, drifting in and out of the light. A small silver pistol's glinting in her hand. Fetch Michael, I cry. As Cunningham pushes through the crowd, I drag myself to my feet, lurching towards the window. Nobody else has seen her and the commotion's building again, the temporary fuss of the announcement already fading. The violin player tests a note, the clock shows 11 p.m. I've reached the French doors when Evelyn arrives at the pool. She's swaying, trembling. Standing in the trees, only feet away. The plague doctor watches passively, the flames of the brazier reflected on his mask. The silver pistol flashes as Evelyn raises it to her stomach, the gunshot slicing through conversation and music. And yet, for a moment, all seems well. Evelyn's still standing on the edge of the water, as though admiring her reflection. Then her legs buckle, the gun dropping from her hand as she topples face first into the pool the plague doctor bowing his head and disappearing into the blackness of the trees. I'm only dimly aware of the screams, or the crowd at my back, surging past me onto the grass as the promised fireworks explode in the air, drenching the pool in colorful light. I'm watching Michael, 
sprinting into the darkness towards a sister he's too late to save. He's screaming her name, his voice drowned out by the fireworks as he wades into the inky water to scoop up her body. Slipping and stumbling, he tries to drag her from the pool, before eventually collapsing, Evelyn still cradled in his arms. Kissing her face, he begs her to open her eyes, but it's a fool's hope. Death's rolled his dice and Evelyn's paid her debt. All that was of value has been taken. Burying his face in her wet hair, Michael sobs. He's oblivious as the crowd gather, as strong arms pry him from his sister's limp body, hoisting her onto the grass so Dr. Dickey can kneel down and make his examination. Not that his skills are required, the hole in her stomach and the silver pistol on the grass tell the story eloquently enough. Despite that, he lingers over her, pressing his fingers to her neck to check for a pulse, before tenderly wiping the dirty water from her face. Still kneeling, he gestures for Michael to come closer, and, taking the weeping man's hand, he bows his head and begins muttering what looks to be a prayer under his breath. I'm grateful for his reverence. A few women are crying into accommodating shoulders, but there's something hollow about their performance. It's as though the ball hasn't really ended. They're all still dancing, they've just changed the steps. Evelyn deserves better than to be entertainment for people she despised. The doctor seems to understand this, his every action, no matter how small, restoring some small part of her dignity. The prayer only takes a minute, and when it's done, he drapes his jacket across Evelyn's face, as though her unblinking stare is of greater offense than the blood staining her dress. There's a tear on his cheek as he gets to his feet, and placing an arm around Michael, he leads Evelyn's sobbing brother away. To my eyes, they depart older men, slower and more bent, carrying a great weight of sadness across their shoulders. No sooner are they inside the house, than rumors bounce through the crowd. The police are coming, a suicide note's been found, Charlie Carver's spirit has claimed another Hardcastle child. The stories are spun from one mouth to another and by the time they reach me, they're rich with details and patterns, strong enough to be carried out of here and into society. I look for Cunningham, but he's nowhere to be seen. I can't imagine what he could be doing, but he's got a quick eye and willing hands so no doubt he's found a purpose unlike myself. The shot has shattered my nerves. Taking myself back to the now empty ballroom, I drop onto the couch from earlier where I sit and tremble, my mind racing. I know my friend will be alive again tomorrow, but it doesn't change what happened, or the devastation I feel at having witnessed it. Evelyn took her own life, and I'm responsible. Her marriage to Ravencourt was a punishment, a humiliation designed to push her over the edge, and, however unwittingly, I was part of it. It was my face she hated, my presence that drove her to the water's edge with a pistol in her hand. And what of the plague doctor? He offered me freedom in return for solving a murder that wouldn't look like a murder, but I watched Evelyn shoot herself after fleeing a dinner in despair. There can be no doubt about her actions or motivation, which makes me wonder at my captors. Was his offer just another torment, a slither of hope to go mad chasing? What about the graveyard? The gun? If Evelyn were truly so despondent, why did she seem in such good cheer when she accompanied Belle into the graveyard, less than two hours after the dinner? And what about the gun she was carrying? It was a large black revolver, almost too big for her clutch bag. The gun she used to take her life was a silver pistol. Why would she change weapons? I don't know how long I sit there thinking about it, amid the delighted mourners, but the police never come. The crowds thin and the candles gutter. The party flickers and goes out. The last thing I see before falling asleep in my chair is the image of Michael Hardcastle, kneeling on the grass cradling the dripping wet body of his dead sister. 21 Day 2, Continued, Pain stirs me, every breath painful. Blinking away the tatters of sleep, I see a white wall, white sheets and a blossom of crusted blood on the pillow. My cheek is resting on my hand, saliva sticking my top lip to my knuckles. I know this moment, I saw it through Belle's eyes. I'm in the butler again, after he was moved to the gatehouse. Somebody's pacing beside my bed, 
a maid judging by the black dress and white apron. There's a large book held open in her arms, which she's flipping through furiously. My head's too heavy to see anything above her waist, so I groan to call her over. Oh, good, you're awake, she says, halting her pacing. When's Ravencourt going to be alone? You didn't write it down, but the bloody idiot has his valet nosing around the kitchen who are my throat is clogged with blood and phlegm. There's a jug of water on the sideboard and the maid hurries over to pour me some, placing her book on the counter, while she tips a glass to my lips. I move my head a fraction, trying to look up at her face, but the world immediately starts to spin. You shouldn't talk, she says, using her apron to wipe a stray drop of water from my chin. She pauses. I mean you can talk, but only when you're ready. She pauses again. Actually, I really need you to answer my question about Ravencourt, before he gets me killed. Who are you? I croak. How hard did that ape, wait she lowers her face to my own, her brown eyes searching for something. She's puffy-cheeked and pale with strands of tangled blonde hair straying free from her cap. With a start, I realize this is the maid Belle and Evelyn met, the one who was keeping watch on the butler. How many hosts have you had? she asks. I don't how many hosts, she insists, sitting on the edge of the bed. How many bodies have you been in? You're Anna, I say, twisting my neck to get a better look at her, the pain setting fire to my bones. Very gently she presses me back down onto the mattress. Yes, I'm Anna, she says patiently. How many hosts? Tears of joy prod my eyes, affection washing through me like warm water. Even though I can't remember this woman, I can feel the years of friendship between us, a trust that borders on instinct. More than that, I'm overcome by the simple joy of this reunion. As strange as it is to say about somebody I can't remember, I now realize I've missed her. Seeing the emotion on my face, answering tears form in Anna's eyes, and leaning down, she hugs me gently. I've missed you too, she says, voicing my feeling. We stay like that for a while, before she clears her throat and wipes the tears away. Well, that's enough of that she sniffs. Crying on each other isn't going to help. I need you to tell me about your hosts or crying Saul will do. I, I, I'm struggling to speak through the lump in my throat. I woke up as Belle, then the butler, then Donald Davies, the butler again, Ravencourt and now the butler again, she says thoughtfully. Third time's a charm, ain't it? Stroking a lock of disturbed hair from my forehead, she leans closer. I take it we haven't been introduced yet, or at least you haven't been introduced to me, she says. My name's Anna and you're Aiden Bishop, or have we done that part already? You keep arriving in the wrong order, I never know where we're up to. You've met my other selves. They pop in and out, she says, glancing at the door as voices sound somewhere in the house. Usually with a favor to ask. What about your hosts, are they I don't have other hosts, it's just me, she says. No visits from a plague doctor, no other days neither. I won't remember any of this tomorrow, which seems a bit of luck given how today's going so far. But you know what's happening, you know about Evelyn's suicide. It's murder, and I woke up knowing, she says, straightening my sheets. Couldn't remember my own name but I knew yours and I knew there was no escaping until we took the killer's name, and proof of their guilt, to the lake at 11 p.m. They're like rules, I think. Words scraped onto my brain so I don't forget. I didn't remember anything when I woke up, I respond, trying to understand why our torments would be different. Aside from your name, the plague doctor had to tell me everything. Course he did, you're his special project, she says adjusting my pillow. Doesn't give a rat's fart about what I'm doing. Haven't heard a peep out of him all day. Won't leave you alone though. Surprised he's not waiting under that bed. He told me only one of us can escape, I say. Yeah, and it's pretty bloody obvious he wants it to be you, she says, the anger draining from her voice as quickly as it came. 
she shakes her head. Sorry, I shouldn't be taking any of this out on you, but I can't shift the feeling he's up to something, and I don't like it. I know what you mean, I say. But if only one of us can escape why are we helping each other, she interrupts. Because you've got a plan to get us both out. I have. Well, you said you did. For the first time, her confidence falters, a worried frown appearing on her face, but before I can press the issue, wood creaks in the corridor, steps thumping up the stairs. It feels like the entire house is shaking with their ascent. Just a tick, she says, collecting the book from the counter. Only now do I realize it's actually an artist's sketchbook, the brown leather covers filled with sheets of loose leaf paper, untidily bound by string. Hiding the book under the bed, she comes up instead with a shotgun. Pressing the butt against her shoulder, she stalks over to the door, opening it a crack to better hear the commotion outside. Oh, hell, says Anna, kicking the door closed with her foot. It's the doctor with your sedative. Quick, when's Ravencourt going to be alone? I need to tell him to stop searching for me. Why, who's we don't have time, Aiden, she says, sliding the shotgun back under the bed out of sight. I'll be here next time you wake up and we can have a proper talk then I promise, but for now tell me about Ravencourt every detail you can remember. She's leaning over me, clutching my hand, her eyes pleading. He'll be in his parlor at 1.15 p.m., I say. You hand him a whiskey, have a chat, and then Millicent Derby arrives. You leave him a card introducing her. She squeezes her eyes shut, mouthing the time and name over and over again, carving them into her memory. Only now, her features smoothed by concentration, do I realize how young she is, no more than nineteen I'd guess, though hard labor's added a few years to the pile. One more thing, she hisses, cupping my cheek, her face so close to mine I can see the amber flecks in her brown eyes. If you see me out there, pretend you don't know me. Don't even come near me if you can help it. There's this footman. I'll tell you about him later, or earlier. Point is, it's dangerous for us to be seen together. Any talking needs doing, we'll do it in here. She kisses me on the forehead quickly, offering the room a last glance to make sure everything's in order. The steps have reached the hall, two sets of voices jumbled up and rolling on ahead. I recognize Dicky, but not the second one. It's deep, urgent, though I can't quite make out what's being said. Who's with Dicky? I ask. Lord Hardcastle most like, she says. He's been popping in and out all morning to check on you. That makes sense. Evelyn told me the butler was Lord Hardcastle's Batman during the war. Their closeness is the reason Gregory Gold is strung up in the room opposite. Are things always like this? I ask. The explanations arriving before the questions. I wouldn't know, she says, standing up and smoothing her apron. Two hours, I've been at this, and all I've had are orders. Dr. Dickey opens the door, his mustache just as preposterous as the first time I saw it. His gaze passes from Anna to myself and back again as he tries to stitch together the torn edges of our hastily severed conversation. No answers forthcoming, he places his black medical bag on the sideboard and comes to stand over me. Awake I see, he says, rocking back and forth on his heels fingers thrust into the watch pockets of his waistcoat. Leave us, girl, he says to Anna, who curtsies before exiting the room, casting me a quick glance on her way out. So, how are you feeling, he asks. No worse for wear from the carriage journey, I hope. Not bad I begin to say, but he lifts the covers, raising my arm to take my pulse. Even this gentle action is enough to cause spasms of pain, the rest of my response mangled by a wind sea. Little sore, hum, he says, lowering my arm once more. Hardly surprising given the beating you took. Any notion what this fellow Gregory Gold wanted from you? I don't. Must have mistook me for somebody else, sir. The sir isn't my doing, it's an old habit of the butler's, 
and I'm surprised by how easily it arrived on my tongue. The doctor's shrewd gaze holds my explanation up to the light, poking a dozen different holes in it. The tight smile he flashes me is one of complicity, both reassuring and a touch threatening. Whatever happened in that hallway, the seemingly benign Dr. Dickey knows more about it than he's letting on. There's a click as he opens his bag, withdrawing a brown bottle and a hypodermic syringe. Keeping his eyes on me, he pokes the needle through the bottle's wax seal, filling the hypodermic with a clear liquid. My hand clutches the sheets. I'm fine, doctor, honestly, I say. Yes, that's rather my concern, he says jabbing the needle into my neck before I have a chance to argue. A warm liquid floods my veins, drowning my thoughts. The doctor melts, colors blossoming and fading into darkness. Sleep, Roger, he says. I'll deal with Mr. Gold. Twenty-two day five coughing up a lungful of cigar smoke, I open a new pair of eyes to find myself almost fully clothed on wooden floorboards, one hand lying victorious on an untouched bed. My trousers are around my ankles, a bottle of brandy clutched to my stomach. Clearly an attempt was made at undressing last night, but such a course appears to have been beyond my new host, whose breath stinks like an old beer mat. Groaning, I claw my way up the side of the bed, dislodging a throbbing headache that nearly knocks me to the floor again. I'm in a similar bedroom to the one Bell was given, the embers of last night's fire winking at me from the grate. The curtains are open, the sky sagging with early morning light. Evelyn's in the forest, you need to find her. Hoisting my trousers up to my waist, I stumble over to the mirror to better inspect this fool I now inhabit. I nearly run straight into it. After being shackled to Raven Court for so long, this new chap feels weightless, a leaf being blown about by a breeze. It's not too surprising when I see him in the glass. He's short and slight somewhere in his late twenties, with longish brown hair and bloodshot blue eyes above a neatly trimmed beard. I try out his smile, discovering a row of slightly awkward white teeth. It's the face of a rascal. My possessions are sitting in a pile on the bedside table, an invitation addressed to Jonathan Derby on top. At least I know who to curse for this hangover. I sift through the items with a fingertip, uncovering a pocket knife, a weathered hip flask, a wristwatch showing 8.43 a.m. and three brown vials with cork stoppers and no labels. Yanking a cork loose, I sniff the liquid within, my stomach twisting at the sickly sweet scent that drifts out. This must be the laudanum Bell was selling. I can see why it's so popular. Simply sniffing the stuff has filled my mind with bright lights. There's a jug of cold water beside a small sink in the corner and, stripping naked, I wash off last night's sweat and grime, digging out the person beneath. What's left of the water I tip to my mouth, drinking until my belly sloshes. Unfortunately, my attempts to drown the hangover only dilute it, aches seeping into every bone and muscle. It's a foul morning, so I dress in the thickest clothes I can find, hunting tweets and a heavy black coat that trails along the floor as I leave the bedroom. Despite the early hour, a drunken couple is squabbling at the top of the stairs. They're in last night's evening wear, drinks still clutched in their hands, accusations passed back and forth in escalating voices, and I give their flailing arms a wide berth as I walk by. Their bickering chases me into the entrance hall, which has been upended by the previous evening's escapades. Bow ties are dangling from the chandelier, leaves and shards of a smashed decanter littering the marble floor. Two mates are cleaning it up, leaving me to wonder what it must have looked like before they started. I try asking them where Charlie Carver's cottage is located, but they're mute as sheep, lowering their eyes and shaking their heads in response to my questions. Their silence is maddening. If Lucy Harper's gossip isn't too far from the mark, Evelyn's going to be somewhere near the cottage with her lady's maid when she's attacked. If I can discover who's threatening her. Perhaps I can save her life and escape this house all at the same time though I have no clue as to how I'm going to help free Anna as well. She's put aside her own schemes to aid me, believing I have some plan that will free us both. For the moment, I can't see how that's anything other than a hollow promise, and judging by her worried frown when we talked in the gatehouse, 
she's beginning to suspect as much. My only hope is that my future hosts are a great deal cleverer than my previous ones. Further questioning of the maids drives them deeper into their silence, forcing me to look around for help. The rooms either side of the entrance hall are deathly quiet, the house still knee-deep in last night, and, seeing no other option, I pick my way through the broken glass and head below stairs towards the kitchen. The passage to the kitchen is grimier than I remember, the clatter of dishes and smell of roasting meat making me sick. Servants eye me as they pass, turning their heads away whenever I open my mouth to ask a question. It's clear they think I shouldn't be here and just as clear they don't know how to get rid of me. This is their place, a river of unguarded conversations and giggling gossip flowing beneath the house. I sully it with my presence. Agitation rubs me up and down, blood thumping in my ears. I feel tired and raw, the air made of sandpaper. Can I help you, says a voice behind me. The words are rolled up and flung at my back. I turn to find the cook, M.R.S. Drudge, staring up at me, ample hands on ample hips. Through these eyes she looks like something a child might make out of clay, a small head on a misshapen body, her features pressed into her face by clumsy thumbs. She's stern, no trace of the woman who's going to give the butler a warm scone in a couple of hours' time. I'm looking for Evelyn Hardcastle, I say, meeting her fierce gaze. She went for a walk in the forest with Madeline Aubert, her lady's maid. And what's that to you? Her tone is so abrupt I almost recoil. Clenching my hands, I try to keep hold of my rising temper. The servants crane their necks as they scurry by, desperate for theater, but terrified of the star. Somebody means her harm, I say through gritted teeth. If you'll point me towards Charlie Carver's old cottage, I'll be able to warn her. Is that what you were doing with Madeline last night? Warning her? Is that how her blouse got torn, is that why she was crying? A vein pulses in her forehead, indignation bubbling beneath every word. She takes a step forwards, jabbing a finger into my chest as she speaks. I know what she says. White-hot anger explodes out of me. Without thinking, I slap her across the face and shove her backwards advancing on her with the devil's own wrath. Tell me where she's gone. I scream, spittle flying out of my mouth. Squeezing her bloody lips together, MRS Drudge glowers at me. My hands fall into fists. Walk away. Walk away now. Summoning my will, I turn my back on MRS Drudge, stalking up the suddenly silent passage. Servants leap aside as I pass but my rage can't make sense of anything but itself. Turning a corner, I slump against a wall and let out a long breath. My hands are trembling, the fog in my mind clearing. For those few terrifying seconds, Derby was utterly beyond my control. That was his poison spilling out of my mouth, his bile coursing through my veins. I can feel it still. Oil on my skin, needles in my bones, a yearning to do something dreadful. Whatever happens today, I need to keep tight hold of my temper or this creature is going to slip loose again and goodness knows what he'll do. And that's the truly scary part. My hosts can fight back. Twenty-three mud sucks at my boots as I hurry into the gloom of the trees, desperation tugging me along by a leash. After my failure to glean any information in the kitchen, I'm striking out into the forest in hopes of stumbling upon Evelyn along one of the marked trails. I'm counting on Endeavor succeeding where calculation has failed. Even if it doesn't, I need to put some distance between Derby and the temptations of Blackheath. I've not gone far when the red flags bring me to a stream, water surging around a large rock. A smashed wine bottle is half encased in sludge, beside a thick black overcoat, Bell's silver compass having fallen out of the pocket. Plucking it from the mud, I turn it over in my palm just as I did that first morning my fingers tracing the initials SB engraved on the underside of the lid. Sebastian Bell's initials. What a fool I felt when Daniel pointed that out to me. Half a dozen cigarette butts lie discarded on the ground, suggesting Bell stood here for a little while, probably waiting for somebody. This must have been where he came after receiving the note at the dinner table, 
though what could have driven him into the rain and cold at such an hour I cannot fathom. Searching his discarded coat offers no clues, his pockets turning up nothing but a lonely silver key, probably to his trunk. Wary of losing more time to my former host, I drop the key and compass into my pocket and set out in search of the next red flag, keeping my eyes open for any hint of the footman at my heels. This would be the perfect place for him to strike. God only knows how long I walk before I finally stumble upon the ruins of what must be Charlie Carver's old cottage. Fire has hollowed it out, consuming most of the roof, leaving only the four blackened walls. Debris crunches underfoot as I step inside, startling some rabbits who flee into the woods, their fur stained with wet ash. The skeletal remnants of an old bed are slumped in the corner, a solitary table leg on the floor, the detritus of a life interrupted. Evelyn told me the cottage burst into flames the day the police hanged Carver. More likely Lord and Lady Hardcastle threw their memories onto the pyre and lit it themselves. Who could blame them? Carver stole their son's life by a lake. It seems only fitting they should rid themselves of him with fire. A rotten fence marks out the garden around the back of the cottage, most of the slats having collapsed after years of neglect. Great piles of purple and yellow flowers run wild in every direction, red berries dangling from stems winding up the fence posts. A maid emerges from the trees as I kneel to tie my shoelace. Such terror I hope never to see again. Color drains from her face, her basket dropping on the floor, spilling mushrooms in every direction. Are you Madeline? I begin, but she's already backing away, looking around for help. I'm not here to hurt you, I'm trying to she's gone before I can utter another word, bolting into the forest. Snared by weeds I stagger after her, half falling over the fence. Picking myself up, I catch sight of her through the trees, glimpses of a black dress moving far more quickly than I would have reckoned. I call out, but if anything my voice is the whip at her back, driving her forward. Even so, I'm faster and stronger and though I don't wish to frighten the girl, I cannot lose sight of her for fear of what will happen to Evelyn. Anna. Bell calls out from somewhere nearby. Help me. Madeline screams back, panicked and sobbing. She's so close now. I reach out, hoping to tug her back, but my fingers can only brush the material of her dress, and off balance I lose ground. She ducks to avoid a branch, stumbling ever so slightly. I catch hold of her dress, causing her to scream again, before a shot whistles by my face, cracking into a tree behind me. Surprise loosens my grip on Madeline, who stumbles towards Evelyn as she emerges from the forest. The black revolver she will take to the graveyard is in her hands, but it's not nearly as terrifying as the fury on her face. One wrong step and she'll shoot me dead, I'm certain of it. It's not what? I can explain, I pant hands on my knees. Men like you always can, says Evelyn, sweeping the terrified girl behind her with one arm. Madeline sobbing, her entire body shaking violently. God help me, but Derby enjoys this. He's aroused by the fear. He's done this before. All this, please, it's a misunderstanding, I gasp, taking an imploring step forwards. Stay back, Jonathan says Evelyn fiercely, gripping the revolver with both hands. Stay away from this girl, stay away from all of them. I didn't mean to your mother's a friend of the family, that's the only reason I'm letting you walk away, interrupts Evelyn. But if I see you near another woman, if I even hear about it, I swear I'll put a bullet in you. Taking care to keep the gun trained on me, she removes her coat and wraps it around Madeline's heaving shoulders. You're going to stay by my side today, she whispers to the terrified maid. I'll see no harm comes to you. They stumble off through the trees, leaving me alone in the forest. Tipping my head to the sky, I suck in cold air, hoping the rain on my face will cool my frustration. I came here to prevent somebody attacking Evelyn, believing I'd unearth a murderer in the process. Instead, I caused the very thing I was trying to stop. I'm chasing my own tail, terrifying an innocent woman in the process. Maybe Daniel was right, 
maybe the future isn't a promise we can break. You're dawdling again, says the plague doctor from behind me. He's standing on the far side of the clearing, little more than a shadow. As always, he seems to have picked the perfect position. Far enough away that I can't possibly reach him, but close enough that we can talk with relative ease. I thought I was helping, I say bitterly, still stung by what happened. You still can, he says. Sebastian Bell is lost in the woods. Of course. I'm not here for Evelyn, I'm here for Bell. I'm here to make sure the loop begins again. Fate's leading me around by the nose. Removing the compass from my pocket, I hold it in the palm of my hand, remembering the uncertainty I felt as I followed its quivering needle that first morning. Without this, Bell will almost certainly remain lost. I toss it into the mud at the plague doctor's feet. This is how I change things, I say, walking away. Fetch him yourself. You misunderstand my purpose here, he says, the sharpness of his tone bringing me up short. If you leave Sebastian Bell to wander that forest alone, he'll never meet Evelyn Hardcastle, he'll never form the friendship you prize so highly. Abandon him and you won't care about saving her. Are you saying I'll forget her? I ask, alarmed. I'm saying you should be careful which knots you unpick, he says. If you abandon Belle, you'll also be abandoning Evelyn. It will be cruelty without purpose, and nothing I've seen of you so far suggests you're a cruel man. Perhaps I imagine it, but for the first time there's a touch of warmth in his tone. It's enough to unbalance me, and I turn to face him once more. I need to see this day changed, I say, hearing the desperation in my voice. I need to see that it can be done. Your frustration is understandable, but what use is rearranging the furniture if you burn the house down doing it? Bending over, he retrieves the compass from the ground, wiping the mud from its surface with his fingers. The way he groans, and the heaviness of his limbs as he rises, suggests an older man beneath the costume. Satisfied with his work, he tosses the compass to me, the damn thing nearly slipping from my hands, so wet is its surface. Take this, and solve Evelyn's murder. She committed suicide, I watched her with my own eyes. If you think it's that simple, you're much further behind than I thought. And you're much crueler than I thought, I growl. If you know what's happening here, why not stop it? Why play these games? Hang the murderer before he harms her. An interesting idea, except I don't know who the murderer is. How is that possible? I say, incredulously. You know every step I'm going to take before I think to take it. How could you be blind to the most important fact in this house? Because it's not my place to know. I watch you, and you watch Evelyn Hardcastle. We both have our roles to play. Then I could blame anybody for the crime, I cry, throwing my hands in the air. Helena Hardcastle did it. There, you see. Free me. You forget that I need proof. Not merely your good word. And what if I save her, what then? I don't think it's possible, and I think you'll hamper your investigation trying, but my offer stands regardless. Evelyn was murdered last night and every night prior. Even if you could save her tonight, it doesn't change that. Bring me the name of the person who kills, or is planning to kill, Evelyn Hardcastle, and I'll free you. For the second time since arriving in Blackheath, I find myself holding a compass and contemplating the instructions of somebody I can't trust. To do as the plague doctor asks is to give myself to a day determined to kill Evelyn, but there seems no way to change things without making them worse. Assuming he's telling the truth, I either save my first host, or I abandon Evelyn. You doubt my intentions, he says, prickling at my hesitation. Of course I doubt your intentions, I say. You wear a mask and you talk in riddles, and I don't for a minute believe you brought me here just to solve a mystery. You're hiding something. And you think stripping me of my disguise will reveal it, he scoffs. A face is a mask of another sort, you know that better than most, though you're right, I am hiding something. If it makes you feel better, 
I'm not hiding it from you. Should you somehow succeed and tear this mask free, I'd simply be replaced, and your task would remain. I'll let you decide if that's worth the trouble. As for your presence in Blackheath, perhaps it would assuage your doubts to know the name of the man who brought you here. And what's that? Aiden Bishop, he says. Unlike your rivals, you came to Blackheath voluntarily. Everything that's happening today, you brought upon yourself. His voice suggests regret, but the expressionless white mask makes the statement sinister, a parody of sadness. That can't be true, I say stubbornly. Why would I come here of my own free will? Why would anybody do this to himself? Your life before Blackheath is none of my concern, Mr. Bishop. Solve the murder of Evelyn Hardcastle and you'll have all the answers you require, he says. In the meantime, Bell needs your help. He points behind me. He's that way. Without another word he withdraws into the forest, the dimness swallowing him completely. My mind is clogged up by a hundred small questions, but none of them is going to do me any good in this forest, so I push them to one side and go in search of Bell, finding him bent double and trembling with exertion. He freezes as I approach, catching the sound of twigs cracking beneath my feet. His timidity revolts me. Mistaken as she was, at least Madeline had the good sense to flee. I circle around behind my former self, keeping my face from view. I could try to explain what's happening here, but frightened rabbits make poor allies, especially those already convinced you're a murderer. All I need from Bell is his survival. Two more steps and I'm behind him, leaning close enough to whisper into his ear. Sweat pours off his body, the smell like a filthy rag pushed to my face. It's all I can do to speak without gagging. East, I say, dropping the compass into his pocket. Backing away, I head into the trees, towards Carver's burnt-out cottage. Bell's going to be lost for another hour or so, giving me plenty of time to follow the flags back to the house without stumbling into him. Despite my best efforts, everything's happening exactly as I remember it. 24 The looming shape of Blackheath appears through the gaps in the trees. I've come out around the back of the house, which is in an even worse state of repair than the front. Several windows are cracked, the brickwork crumbling. A stone balustrade has tumbled from the roof to lodge itself in the grass, thick moss covering it. Clearly, the hard castles only repaired the sections of the house their guests would see little wonder considering the paucity of their finances. Just as I lingered on the edge of the forest that first morning, I now find myself crossing the garden with similar foreboding. If I came here voluntarily, I must have had a reason, but no matter how hard I strain for the memory, it's beyond reach. I'd like to believe I'm a good man who came to help, but if that's the case I'm making a damn mess of things. Tonight, as every night, Evelyn's going to kill herself and if this morning's actions are any guide, my attempts to paddle away from the disaster may only hurry us towards it. For all I know, my fumbling attempts to save Evelyn are actually the reason she ends up at that reflecting pool with a silver pistol in her hand. I'm so lost in these thoughts I don't notice Millicent until I'm almost on top of her. The old lady is shivering on an iron bench that looks out across the garden, her arms folded against the wind. Three shapeless coats encase her completely, her eyes peering out over a scarf pulled up above her mouth. She's blue with cold, a hat pulled down over her ears. Hearing my steps, she turns to meet me, surprise showing on her wrinkled face. By Jove, you look dreadful, she says, pulling the scarf down from her mouth. Good morning to you too, Millicent, I say, taken aback by the sudden surge of warmth her presence stokes within me. Millicent, she says, pursing her lips. That's rather modern of you, dear. I prefer mother if it's all the same to you. I wouldn't want people thinking I picked you up off the street. Though sometimes I wonder if I mightn't have been better off. My mouth hangs open. I hadn't previously made the connection between Jonathan Derby and Millicent Derby, probably because it's easier to imagine him being delivered onto this earth by a biblical plague. Sorry, mother, I say, stuffing my hands into my pockets and sitting down beside her. 
she cocks an eyebrow at me, those clever grey eyes alight with amusement. An apology and an appearance before midday, are you feeling quite all right, she asks. It must be the country air, I say. What about you, why are you out on this dreadful morning? She grunts, hugging herself even tighter. I'm supposed to be meeting Helena for a stroll, but I've seen neither hide nor hair of the woman. No doubt she's got her times wrong as usual. I know she's meeting Cecil Raven's court this afternoon, she's probably gone there instead. Raven's court's still asleep. I say. Millicent peers at me inquisitively. Cunningham told me, Raven Court's valid, I lie. You know him. Vaguely. Well, I wouldn't get too friendly, she tuts. I understand how much you enjoy dubious society, but from what Cecil's told me, this one's most unsuitable, even by your low standards. That piques my interest. I'm fond of the valet, but he only agreed to help me after I threatened to blackmail him with a secret he's keeping. Until I know what he's hiding, I can't depend on him, and Millicent might be the key to unearthing it. How so? I ask casually. Oh, I don't know, she says, waving an airy hand at me. You know Cecil, secrets tucked between every fold of skin. If you believe the rumors, he only hired Cunningham because Helena asked him to. Now, he's uncovered something unsavory about the boy and is thinking of letting him go. Unsavory. I say. Well, that's what Cecil said, not that I could get the rest out of him. Blasted fellow has a bear trap for a mouth, but you know how he hates scandal. Given Cunningham's parentage, it must be desperately salacious if he's worried. Wish I knew what it was. Cunningham's parentage. I ask. I think I've missed a step. The boy was raised at Blackheath, she says. Cook's son, or that's the story at least. It's not true. The old lady cackles, looking at me slyly. Word has it the Honorable Lord Peter Hardcastle used to enjoy himself in London from time to time. Well, on one occasion his enjoyment followed him back to Blackheath with a baby in her arms, which she claimed was his. Peter was ready to send the child to the church, but Helena stepped in and demanded they keep it. Why would she do that? Knowing Helena, she probably meant it as an insult, sniffs Millicent, turning her face away from the bitter wind. She was never very fond of her husband and inviting his shame into the house would have tickled her. Poor Peter has probably cried himself to sleep every night for the last 33 years. Either way, they gave the baby to MRS Drudge, the cook, to raise, and Helena made sure everybody knew whose child he was. Does Cunningham know any of this? Can't see how he wouldn't, it's one of those secrets people shout at each other, says the old lady, plucking a handkerchief from her sleeve to wipe her running nose. Anyway, you can ask him yourself seeing as you're so chummy. Shall we walk? I see little point in us freezing on this bench waiting for a woman who isn't coming. She stands before I have a chance to respond, stamping her boots and blowing warm air into her gloved hands. It really is a dreadful day the grey sky spitting rain, lathering itself into the fury of a storm. Why are you even out here? I ask, our feet crunching along the gravel path that circles the house. Couldn't you have met Lady Hardcastle inside? Too many people I'd rather not bump into, she says. Why was she in the kitchen this morning? Speaking of bumping into people, I hear you were in the kitchen this morning, I say. Who told you that? She bridles. Well I haven't been anywhere near the kitchen, she continues, not waiting for a response. Filthy places. The smell doesn't come out for weeks. She seems genuinely irritated by the suggestion, which means she probably hasn't done it yet. A moment later she nudges me good-naturedly, her voice suddenly gleeful. Did you hear about Donald Davies? Apparently he took an automobile last night and ran off back to London. The stablemaster saw him, said he turned up in the pouring rain, dressed in every color under the Sunday. That brings me pause. Surely, I should have returned to Donald Davies by now, as I have done with the butler. 
he was my third host, and Anna told me I'm obliged to live one full day in each of them, whether I want to or not. It can't have been much past mid-morning when I left him asleep on the road, so why haven't I seen him again? You left him defenseless and alone. I felt a ripple of guilt. For all I know, the footman has already found him. Were you listening to me, says Millicent, annoyed. I said Donald Davies took off in an automobile. They're cracked that family, every one of them, and that's an official medical opinion. You've been talking to Dickie, I say absently, still thinking about Davies. Been talked at more like, she scoffs. Thirty minutes I spent trying to keep my eyes off that mustache. I'm surprised sound can penetrate it. That makes me laugh. Do you actually like anybody at Blackheath, mother? Not that I recall, but it's envy I suspect. Society's a dance, darling, and I'm too old to take part. Speaking of dancing, here comes the organ grinder himself. I follow her gaze to see Daniel approaching us from the opposite direction. Despite the cold, he's dressed in a cricket sweater and linen trousers, the same outfit he'll be wearing when he encounters Belle in the entrance hall for the first time. I check my watch, that meeting can't be far off. Mr. Coleridge, calls out Millicent with forced bonhomie. MRS Derby, he says, drawing alongside us. Broken any hearts this morning. They don't even quiver these days, Mr. Coleridge, more's the pity. There's something cautious in her tone, as if she's crossing a bridge she feels certain will break. What disreputable business brings you out on such a terrible morning? I've a favor to ask your son, and I assure you, it's entirely above board. Well, that's disappointing. For you and me both. He looks at me for the first time. A minute, Derby. We step aside, Millicent doing her best to appear uninterested while shooting us speculative glances from above her scarf. What's wrong? I ask. I'm going after the footman, he says, that handsome face of his caught somewhere between fear and excitement. How? I say, immediately taken with the idea. We know he's going to be in the dining hall tormenting Ravencourt around one, he says. I propose catching hold of the dog there. Recalling those ghostly steps and that evil laughter is enough to raise goosebumps on my neck, and the thought of finally laying hands on the devil sets fire to my veins. The ferocity of the feeling isn't far off what Derby felt in the forest, when we were chasing the maid, and it immediately puts me on my guard. I can't give this host an inch. What's your scheme? I say, tempering my enthusiasm. I was in that room alone, I couldn't even guess at where he was hiding. Nor could I, until I got talking to an old friend of the Hardcastles at dinner last night, he says, drawing me a little further away from Millicent, who's managed to sidle near the edge of our conversation. Turns out there's a warren of priest tunnels beneath the floorboards. That's where the footman was hiding, and that's where we'll put an end to him. How? My new friend tells me there are entrances in the library, drawing room, and gallery. I suggest we each watch an entrance and grab him when he comes out. Sounds ideal, I say, struggling to contain Derby's rising excitement. I'll take the library, you take the drawing room. Who's in the gallery? Ask Anna, he says, but none of us is strong enough to tackle the footman alone. Why don't you two guard the library, and I'll round up some of our other hosts to help me with the drawing room and gallery. Magnificent, I say beaming. If I didn't have a hand on Derby's lead, he'd already be running towards the tunnels with a lantern and a kitchen knife. Good, he says, lavishing a smile of such affection upon me it's impossible to imagine how we could ever fail. Take your position a few minutes before one. With any luck, this will all be over by dinner. He turns to depart, but I catch his arm. Did you tell Anna you'd find a way for both of us to escape if she helped us? I ask. He gazes at me steadily, and I quickly withdraw my hand. Yes, he says. It's a lie, isn't it? I say. Only one of us can escape Blackheath. Let's call it a potential lie, shall we? 
I've not given up hope of fulfilling our end of the bargain. You're my last host, how much hope do you have? Not a great deal, he says, his expression softening. I know you're fond of her. Believe me, I haven't forgotten how that felt, but we need her on our side. We won't escape this house if we have to spend the day looking over our shoulder for both the footman and Anna. I have to tell her the truth, I say, aghast at his callous disregard of my friend. He stiffens. Do that and you make an enemy of her, he hisses, looking around to make sure we're not being overheard. At which point, any hope of genuinely helping her goes up in smoke. Puffing out his cheeks, he ruffles his hair and smiles at me, agitation leaking out of him like air from a punctured balloon. Do what you think is right, he says. But at least wait until we've caught the footman. He checks his watch. Three more hours, that's all I'm asking. Our eyes meet, mine doubtful and his appealing. I can't help but submit. Very well, I say. You won't regret it, he says. Squeezing my shoulder, he waves cheerily at Millicent, before striding back towards Blackheath, a man possessed by purpose. I turn to find Millicent contemplating me through pursed lips. You have some rotten friends, she says. I'm a rotten sort of chap, I respond, holding her gaze, until finally she shakes her head and carries on walking, slowing enough for me to fall in step beside her. We come upon a long greenhouse. Most of the window panes are cracked, the plants inside so overgrown they're bulging against the glass. Millicent peers inside, but the foliage is much too dense. She gestures for me to follow, and we head to the far end, finding the doors locked with a new chain and padlock. Pity, she says, rattling it futilely. I used to love coming here when I was younger. You've visited Blackheath before. I summered here when I was girl. We all did, Cecil Ravencourt, the Curtis twins, Peter Hardcastle and Helena that's how they met. When I married, I brought your brother and sister down. They practically grew up with Evelyn, Michael and Thomas. She links my arm, continuing our walk oh, I used to love those summers, she says. Helena was always frightfully jealous of your sister, because Evelyn was so plain. Michael wasn't much better mind with that squashed face of his. Thomas was the only one with a dash of beauty and he ended up in that lake, which strikes me as fate kicking the poor woman twice, but there it is. Wasn't a one of them could measure up to you, my handsome lad, she says, cupping my cheek. Evelyn turned out all right, I protest. She's quite striking actually. Really, says Millicent disbelievingly. Must have blossomed in Paris not that I'd know. The girl's been avoiding me all morning. Like mother, like daughter, I suppose. Explains why Cecil's circling, though. Vainest man I've ever met, which is saying something after fifty years of living with your father. The hard castles hate her, you know. Evelyn, I mean. Who's filled your head with that rot, says Millicent, gripping my arm while she shakes her foot trying to dislodge some mud from her boot. Michael adores her. He's over in Paris almost every month, and from what I understand they've been thick as thieves since she got back. And Peter doesn't hate her, he's indifferent. It's only Helena, and she's never been quite right since Thomas died. Still comes up here, you know. Every year on the anniversary of his death, she takes a walk around the lake, even talks to him sometimes. Heard her myself. The path has brought us to the reflecting pool. This is where Evelyn will take her life tonight, and as with everything at Blackheath, its beauty is dependent on distance. Viewed from the ballroom the reflecting pool's a magnificent sight, a long mirror conveying all the drama of the house. Here and now though, it's just a filthy pond, the stone cracked, moss growing thick as carpet on the surface. Why take her life here? Why not in her bedroom, or the entrance hall? Are you okay, dear, asks Millicent. You look a little pale. I was thinking it's a shame they've let the place go, I say, hoisting a smile onto my face. Oh, I know, but what could they do, 
she says, adjusting her scarf. After the murder they couldn't live here, and nobody wants these big piles anymore, especially not when they have Blackheath's history. Should have left it to the forest, if you ask me. It's a maudlin thought, but nothing lingers in Jonathan Derby's mind for too long and I'm soon distracted by the preparations for tonight's party, which I can see through the ballroom windows beside us. Servants and workmen are scrubbing the floors and painting the walls, while maids balance on teetering stepladders with long feather dusters. At the far end of the hall, bored-looking musicians are scraping semi-quavers off the surface of their polished instruments as Evelyn Hardcastle points and gesticulates, arranging things from the center of the room. She's flitting from group to group, touching arms and spreading kindness, making me ache for that afternoon we spent together. I search for Madeline Aubert, finding her laughing with Lucy Harper the maid abused by Stanwin and befriended by Ravencourt the two of them arranging a chaise long by the stage. That these two mistreated women have found each other brings me a small measure of comfort, though it by no means alleviates my guilt over this morning's events. I told you last time I wouldn't clean up another of your indiscretions, says Millicent sharply, her entire body stiff. She's watching me watching the maids. Loathing and love swirl within her eyes, the shape of Derby's secrets visible in the fog. What I'd only vaguely understood before, now stands in stark relief. Derby's a rapist, more than once over. They're all there, held in Millicent's gaze, every woman he's attacked, every life he's destroyed. She carries them all. Whatever darkness lurks inside Jonathan Derby, Millicent tucked it in at night. It's always the weak ones with you, isn't it, she says. Always the she falls silent, her mouth hanging open as though the next words simply evaporated on her lips. I have to go, she says suddenly, squeezing my hand. I've had a very strange thought. I'll see you at dinner, darling. Without another word Millicent turns back the way we came, disappearing around the corner of the house. Perplexed, I look back into the ballroom trying to see what she saw, but everybody's moved around except for the band. That's when I notice the chess piece on the window ledge. If I'm not mistaken, it's the same hand-carved piece I found in Belle's trunk, speckled with white paint and looking at me through clumsily whittled eyes. There's a message etched into the dirt on the glass above it. Behind you. Sure enough Anna's waving at me from the edge of the forest, her tiny body shrouded by a grey coat. Pocketing the chess piece, I glance left and right to make sure we're alone, and then follow her deeper into the trees, beyond Blackheath's sight. She looks to have been waiting for some time and is dancing from foot to foot to keep warm. Judging by her blue cheeks, it's not doing the blindest bit of good. Little wonder given her attire. She's draped in shades of grey, her coat threadbare, her knitted hat thin as gossamer. These are clothes passed down and down and down, patched so many times the original material is long gone. Don't suppose you've got an apple or something, she says without preamble. I'm bloody starving. I've got a hip flask, I say, holding it out to her. Have to do I suppose, she says, taking it from me and unscrewing the cap. I thought it was too dangerous for us to meet outside of the gatehouse. Who told you that? she asks, wincing as she tastes the flask's contents. You did, I say. Will. What? I will tell you it isn't safe for us to meet, but I haven't yet, she says. I couldn't have, I've only been awake a few hours, and I've spent most of that time keeping the footman from making pincushions out of your future hosts. Missed breakfast doing it, too. I blink at her struggling to stitch together a day being delivered in the wrong order. Not for the first time, I find myself wishing for the speed of Ravencourt's mind. Working within the confines of Jonathan Derby's intellect is like stirring croutons into a thick soup. Seeing my confusion, she frowns. Do you know about the footman yet? I never know where we're up to. I very quickly tell her about Belle's dead rabbit and the ghostly steps that dogged Ravencourt in the dining hall her expression darkening with each fresh detail. That bastard, she splutters, when I'm finished. She's prowling back and forth, her hands clenched and shoulders rolled forwards. 
Wait until I get my hands on him, she says, shooting the house a murderous glance. You won't have to wait long, I say. Daniel thinks he's hiding in some tunnels. There's a few entrances, but we're going to guard the library. He wants us in there before one. Or we could slit our own throats and save the footman the bother of killing us, she says, her tone frank and unimpressed. She's looking at me as if I've lost my mind. What's wrong? The footman's not an idiot, she says. If we know where he is, it's because we're supposed to know. He's been one step ahead of us since this started. Wouldn't surprise me one bit if he's lying in wait, hoping to trip us up on our own cleverness. We have to do something. I protest. We will, but what's the point of doing something stupid when we can do something smart, she says patiently. Listen to me, Aiden, I know you're desperate, but we've got a deal, you and me. I keep you alive so you can find Evelyn's killer, and then we both get out of here. This is me, doing my job. Now promise me, you won't go after the footman. Her argument makes sense, but it's weightless against my fear. If there's a chance to put an end to this madman before he finds me, I'm going to take it, no matter the risk. I'd rather die on my feet than cowering in a corner. I promise, I say, adding another lie to the pile. Thankfully, Anna's too cold to notice the catch in my voice. Despite having drunk from the hip flask, she's shivering so hard all the color has abandoned her face. In an attempt to shelter from the wind, she presses against me. I can smell the soap on her skin, forcing me to avert my gaze. I don't want her to see Derby's lust squirming within me. Sensing my discomfort, she tilts her head to meet my downcast face. Your other hosts are better, I promise, she says. You have to keep hold of yourself. Don't give in to him. How do I do that when I don't know where they start and I begin? If you weren't here, Derby would have his hands all over me, she says. That's how you know who you are. You don't just remember it, you do it, and you keep doing it. Even so, she takes a step back into the wind, freeing me from my discomfort. You shouldn't be out in this weather, I say, removing my scarf and wrapping it around her neck. You'll catch your death. And if you keep this up, people might begin mistaking Jonathan Derby for a human being, she says, tucking the loose ends of the scarf into her coat. Tell Evelyn Hardcastle that. I say. She nearly shot me this morning. You should have shot her back, says Anna matter-of-factly. We could have solved her murder then and there. I can't tell if you're joking or not, I say. Of course I am, she says, blowing into her chapped hands. If it were that simple, we'd have been out of here ages ago. Mind you, I'm not sure trying to save her life is a much better plan. You think I should let her die? I think we're spending a lot of time not doing the thing we've been asked to do. We can't protect Evelyn without knowing who wants her dead, I say. One thing will give us the other. I hope you're right, she says dubiously. I search for some encouraging platitude, but her doubts have crawled under my skin, and they're beginning to itch. I told her that saving Evelyn's life would deliver us the murderer, but that was an evasion. There's no plan here. I don't even know if I can save Evelyn anymore. I'm working at the behest of blind sentiment, and losing ground to the footman as I'm doing it. Anna deserves better, but I have no idea how to give it to her without abandoning Evelyn and for some reason the thought of doing that is unbearable to me. There's a commotion on the path, voices carried through the trees by the wind. Taking my arm, Anna pulls me further into the forest. As fun as this has been, I came to ask for a favor. Always, what can I do? What's the time, she says, pulling the artist's sketchbook from her pocket. It's the same one I saw her holding in the gatehouse, crumpled sheets and a cover riddled with holes. She's holding it up so I can't see inside, but, judging by the way she's flicking through the pages, it says something important. I check my watch. It's 10.08a.m., I say, itching with curiosity. What's in the book? Notes, information, 
everything I've managed to learn about your eight hosts and what they're doing, she says absently, running her finger down one of the pages. And don't ask to see it because you can't. We can't risk you pulling the day down around our ears with what you know. I wasn't going to, I protest, hastily averting my eyes. Right, 10.08 a.m. perfect. In a minute, I'm going to put a rock on the grass. I need you standing by it when Evelyn kills herself. You can't move, Aiden, not an inch, understand. What's the meaning of all this, Anna? Call it Plan B. She pecks me on the cheek, cold lips meeting numb flesh, as she slides the book back in her pocket. She's only taken a step when she clicks her fingers and turns back to me, holding out two white tablets in her palm. Take these for later, she says. I filched them from Dr. Dickey's bag when he came to see the butler. What are they? Headache pills, I'll trade them for my chess piece. This ugly old thing. I say, handing her the hand-carved bishop. Why would you want it? She smiles at me, watching as I wrap the tablets in a blue pocket handkerchief. Because you gave it to me, she says, clutching it protectively in her hand. It was the first promise you made me. This ugly old thing is the reason I stopped being scared of this place. It's the reason I stopped being scared of you. Me. Why would you be afraid of me? I say, genuinely hurt by the idea of anything coming between us. Oh, Aiden, she says, shaking her head. If we do this right, everybody in this house is going to be afraid of you. She's carried away on those words blown through the trees and out onto the grass surrounding the reflecting pool. Perhaps it's her youth, or her personality, or some curious alchemy of all the miserable ingredients surrounding us, but I can't see an ounce of doubt within her. Whatever her plan, she seems extraordinarily confident in it. Maybe dangerously so. From my position in the treeline, I watch her pick up a large white rock from the flower bed and pace out six steps before dropping it on the grass. Holding an arm straight out from her body, she measures a line to the ballroom's French doors, and then, seemingly satisfied with her work, she wipes the mud from her hands, shoves them in her pockets and strolls away. For some reason, this little display makes me uneasy. I came here voluntarily, and Anna did not. The plague doctor brought her to Blackheath for a reason, and I have no idea what that could be. Whoever Anna really is, I'm following her blindly. 25 The bedroom doors locked, no noise coming from inside. I'd hoped to catch Helena Hardcastle before she set about her day, but it appears the lady of the house is not one to idle. I rattle the handle again, pressing my ear to the wood. Aside from a few curious glances from passing guests, my efforts are in vain. She's not here. I'm walking away, when the thought hits me. The room hasn't been broken into yet. Ravencourt will find the door shattered early this afternoon, so it's going to happen in the next few hours. I'm curious to see who's responsible, and why they're so desperate to get inside. I'd originally suspected Evelyn because she had one of the two revolvers stolen from Helena's bureau, but she nearly killed me with it in the forest this morning. If it's already in her possession, she has no need to break in. Unless there's something else she wants. The only other thing that was obviously missing was the appointments page in Helena's day planner. Millicent believed Helena tore it out herself to conceal some suspicious deed, but Cunningham's fingerprints were all over the remaining pages. He refused to explain himself, and denied being responsible for the break-in, but if I could catch him with his shoulder to the door, he'd have no choice but to come clean. My mind made up. I stride into the shadows at the far end of the corridor and begin my vigil. Five minutes later, Derby is already impossibly bored. I'm fidgeting, stalking back and forth. I can't calm him. At a loss, I follow the smell of breakfast towards the drawing room, planning to carry a plate of food and a chair back to the corridor. Hopefully, they'll placate my host for half an hour, after which time I'll have to come up with some new amusement. I find the room smothered in sleepy conversation. 
Most of the guests are only halfway out of their beds and they reek of the prior evening, sweat and cigar smoke baked into their skin, spirits curled around every breath. They're talking quietly and moving slowly, porcelain people riddled with cracks. Taking a plate from the sideboard, I scoop piles of eggs and kidneys onto a large plate, pausing to eat a sausage from the platter and wipe the grease from my lips with my sleeve. I'm so preoccupied, it takes a little while to realize everybody's gone silent. A burly fellow is standing at the door, his gaze passing from face to face, relief coursing through those he slips over. This nervousness is not unwarranted. He's a brutish-looking chap with a ginger beard and sagging cheeks, his nose so mangled it resembles an egg cracked in a frying pan. An old frayed suit strains to contain his width, raindrops sparkling on shoulders you could serve a buffet on. His gaze lands on me like a boulder in the lap. Mr. Stanwin wants to see you, he says. His voice is coarse, filled with jagged consonants. What for? I ask. I expect he'll tell you. Well, offer my regrets to Mr. Stanwin, but I'm afraid I'm very busy at present. Either you walk or I carry you, he says in a low rumble. Derby's temper is bubbling nicely, but there's no use making a scene. I can't beat this man, the best I can hope for is to quickly meet Stanwin and return to my task. Besides, I'm curious why he'd want to see me. Placing my plate of food on the sideboard, I rise to follow Stanwin's thug from the room. Inviting me to walk ahead of him, the burly fellow guides me up the staircase, telling me to turn right at the top, into the closed-off east wing. Brushing aside the curtain, a damp breeze touches my face, a long corridor stretching out before me. Doors are hanging off their hinges, revealing staterooms covered in dust and four-poster beds collapsed in on themselves. The air scratches my throat as I breathe it. Why don't you wait in that room over there like a good gentleman and I'll tell Mr. Stan when you've arrived, says my escort, jerking his chin towards a room on my left. Doing as he bids, I enter a nursery, the cheerful yellow wallpaper now hanging limp from the walls. Games and wooden toys litter the floor, a weathered rocking horse put out to pasture by the door. There's a game in progress on a child's chessboard the white pieces decimated by the black. No sooner have I set foot inside than I hear Evelyn shrieking in the room beside me. For the first time Derby and I move in concert, sprinting around the corner to find the door blocked by the red-headed thug. Mr. Stanwin's still busy, chum, he says, rocking back and forth to keep warm. I'm looking for Evelyn Hardcastle, I heard her scream, I say breathlessly. Mayhap you did but doesn't seem like there's much you can do about it, does there? I peer over his shoulder into the room behind, hoping to catch sight of Evelyn. It looks to be some sort of reception area, but it's empty. The furniture lies under yellowed sheets, black mold growing up from the hems. The windows are covered in old newspaper, the walls little more than rotting boards. There's another door on the far wall, but it's closed. They must be in there. I return my gaze to the man, who smiles at me, exposing a row of crooked yellow teeth. Anything else, he says. I need to make sure she's all right. I try to barge past him, but it's a foolish notion. He's three times my weight and half again my height. More to the point, he knows how to use his strength. Planting a flat hand on my stomach, he shoves me backwards, barely a flicker of emotion on his face. Don't bother, he says. I'm paid to stand here and make sure nice gentlemen like you don't do themselves a misfortune by wandering places they ain't supposed to go. They're just words, coals in the furnace. My blood's boiling. I try to dart around him and like a fool I think I've succeeded until I'm hoisted backwards, and tossed bodily back down the corridor. I scramble to my feet, snarling. He hasn't moved. He isn't out of breath. He doesn't care. Your parents gave you everything but sense, didn't they, he says, the blandness of the sentiment hitting me like a bucket full of cold water. Mr. Stanwin's not hurting her if that's your concern. Wait a few minutes and you can ask her all about it when she comes out. We eye each other for a moment, before I retreat along the corridor into the nursery. 
He's right, I'm not getting by him, but I can't wait for Evelyn to come out. She won't tell Jonathan Derby anything after this morning, and whatever is happening behind that door could be the reason she takes her life tonight. Hurrying over to the wall, I press my ear to the boards. If I haven't missed my mark, Evelyn's talking to Stanwin in the room next door, only a few pieces of rotten wood between us. I soon catch the hum of their voices, much too faint to make anything out. Using my pocket knife, I tear the wallpaper from the wall, digging the blade between the loose wooden slats to pry them free. They're so damp they come away without objection, the wood disintegrating in my hands. Tell her she best not play any games with me, or it'll be the end of both of you, says Stanwin, his voice poking through the insulating wall. Tell her yourself, I'm not your errand girl, says Evelyn coldly. You'll be anything I damn well please, so long as I'm footing the bill. I don't like your tone, Mr. Stanwin, says Evelyn. And I don't like being made a fool of, Miss Hardcastle, he says, practically spitting her name. You forget I worked here for nearly fifteen years. I know every corner of this place, and everybody in it. Don't mistake me for one of these blinkered bastards you've surrounded yourself with. His hatred is viscous, it has texture. I could wring it out of the air and bottle it. What about the letter, says Evelyn quietly, her outrage overwhelmed. I'll keep hold of that, so you understand our arrangement. You're a vile creature, are you aware of that? Stanwin swats the insult from the air with a belly laugh. At least I'm an honest one, he says. How many other people in this house can claim the same thing? You can go now. Don't forget to pass along my message. I hear the door to Stanwin's room open, Evelyn storming past the nursery a few moments later. I'm tempted to follow her, but there'd be little value in another confrontation. Besides, Evelyn mentioned something about a letter that's now in Stanwin's possession. She seemed keen to retrieve it, which means I need to see it. Who knows, perhaps Stanwin and Derby are friends. Jonathan Derby's waiting for you in the nursery, I hear the burly fellow tell Stanwin. Good, says Stanwin, drawers scraping open. Let me get changed for this hunt and we'll go and have a word with the greasy little bugger. Or perhaps not. Twenty-six I sit with my feet on the table, the chessboard beside them. Cupping my chin in my hand, I stare at the game trying to decipher some strategy from the arrangement of the pieces. It's proving an impossible task. Derby's too flighty for study. His attention is forever straying towards the window, towards the dust in the air and the noises in the corridor. He's never at peace. Daniel warned me that each of our hosts thinks differently, but only now do I comprehend the full extent of his meaning. Bell was a coward and Ravencourt ruthless, but both possessed focused minds. That's not the case with Derby. Thoughts come buzzing through his head like blue bottles, lingering long enough to be distracting but never settling. A sound draws my attention to the door, Ted Stanwin shaking out a match as he surveys me from above his pipe. He's larger than I recall, a slab of a man spreading sideways like a wedge of melting butter. Never took you for a chess man, Jonathan, he says, pushing the old rocking horse back and forth so that it thumps on the floor. I'm teaching myself. I say. Good for you, men should seek to better themselves. His eyes linger on me before being tugged to the windows. Though Stanwin hasn't done or said anything threatening, Derby's afraid of him. My pulse is tapping that out in Morse code. I glance at the door, ready to bolt, but the burly fellow is leaning against the wall in the corridor with his arms crossed. He offers me a little nod, friendly as two men in a cell. Your mother's running a little late on her payments, says Stanwin, his forehead pressed against the window. I hope all's well. Quite well, I say. I'd hate for that to change. I shift in my seat to catch his eye. Are you threatening me, Mr. Stanwin? He turns from the window, smiling at the fellow in the corridor, then myself. Of course not, Jonathan, I'm threatening your mother. You don't think I'd come all this way for a worthless little sod like yourself, do you? Taking a puff on his pipe, 
he picks up a doll and casually tosses it at the chessboard, sending the pieces scattering across the room. Rage snatches me up by the strings, flinging me at him, but he catches my fist in the air, spinning me around as one of his huge arms crushes my throat. His breath is on my neck, rotten as old meat. Talk to your mother, Jonathan, he sneers, squeezing my windpipe hard enough for black spots to swim in the corners of my eyes. Otherwise, I might have to pay her a visit. He lets the words settle, then releases me. I drop to my knees, clutching my throat and gasping for air. You'll come a cropper with that temper, he says, jabbing his pipe in my direction. I'd get it under control if I were you. Don't worry, my friend here is good at helping people learn new things. I glare at him from the floor, but he's already on his way out. Passing into the corridor, he nods to his companion who steps into the room. He looks at me without emotion, peeling off his jacket. On your feet, lad, he says. Sooner we get started, sooner it'll be over. Somehow, he seems even bigger than he did at the door. His chest is a shield, his arms straining the seams of his white shirt. Terror takes hold of me as he closes the distance between us, my fingers searching blindly for a weapon and finding the heavy chessboard on the table. Without thinking, I hurl it at him. Time seems to hang as the chessboard turns in the air, an impossible object in flight, my future clinging onto its surface for dear life. Evidently, Fate has a soft spot for me because it hits his face with a sickening crunch, sending him reeling backwards into the wall with a muffled cry. I'm on my feet as the blood pours between his fingers, sprinting down the corridor with Stanwin's angry voice at my back. A quick glance behind me reveals Stanwin's halfway out of the reception room, his face red with rage. Fleeing down the staircase, I follow the burble of voices into the drawing room which is now full of red-eyed guests digging into their breakfasts. Dr. Dickey's guffawing with Michael Hardcastle and Clifford Harrington, the naval officer I met at dinner, while Cunningham piles food onto the silver platter that will greet Ravencourt when he wakes up. A sudden quieting of chatter tells me Stanwin's approaching, and I slip through into the study, hiding behind the door. I'm half hysterical, my heart beating hard enough to shatter my ribs. I want to laugh and cry to pick up a weapon and throw myself at Stanwin, screaming. It's taking all my concentration to stand still, but if I don't, I'm going to lose this host and one more precious day. Peering through the gap between the door and frame, I watch as Stanwin wrenches people around by the shoulder, searching for my face. Men stand aside for him, the powerful mumbling vague apologies as he approaches. Whatever his hold on these people, it's complete enough that nobody takes umbrage at his manhandling of them. He could beat me to death in the middle of the carpet and they wouldn't say a word about it. I'll find no help here. Something cold touches my fingers, and, looking down, I discover my hand has closed around a heavy cigarette box on a shelf. Derby's arming himself. Hissing at him, I let it go and return my attention to the drawing room, almost crying out in shock. Stanwin's a few paces away, and he's walking directly towards the study. I look for places to hide, but there aren't any, and I can't flee into the library without passing the door he's about to walk through. I'm trapped. Picking up the cigarette box, I take a deep breath, preparing to pounce on him when he walks in. Nobody appears. Slipping back to the gap, I peek into the drawing room. He's nowhere to be seen. I'm shaking, uncertain. Derby isn't built for indecision, he doesn't have the patience, and before I know it, I'm creeping around the door to get a better view. I immediately see Stanwin. He has his back to me, and is talking to Dr. Dickey. I'm too far away to catch their conversation but it's enough to propel the good doctor out of the room, presumably to tend to Stanwin's stricken bodyguard. He has sedatives. The idea delivers itself fully formed. I just need to get out of here without being seen. A voice calls to Stanwin from near the table, and the moment he's out of sight, I drop the cigarette case and flee into the gallery, taking the long way around to reach the entrance hall unseen. I catch Dr. Dickey as he's leaving his bedroom, 
his medical case swinging in his hand. He smiles as he sees me, that ridiculous mustache of his leaping about two inches up his face. Ah, young Master Jonathan, he says cheerfully, as I fall into step beside him. Everything well? You seem a little puffed. I'm fine, I say, hurrying to keep up with him. Well, I'm not actually. I need a favor. His eyes narrow, the cheerful tone dropping out of his voice. What have you done this time? The man you are going to see, I need you to sedate him. Sedate him? Why the devil would I sedate him? Because he's going to harm my mother. Millicent. He stops dead, grabbing me by the arm with a surprising amount of strength. What's all this about, Jonathan? She owes Stanwin money. His face falls, his grip loosening. Without his joviality inflating him, he seems a tired old thing, the lines on his face a little deeper, the sorrows less obscure. For a moment, I feel a little guilty about what I'm doing to him, but then I remember the look in his eyes when he sedated the butler, and all my doubts are wiped away. So he has dear Millicent under his thumb, does he, he says, sighing. Shouldn't be surprised I suppose, the fiend's got something on the lot of us. Still, I thought, he carries on walking, though slower than before. We're at the top of the staircase leading down to the entrance hall, which is flooded with cold. The front door is open, a group of old men departing for a walk, taking their laughter with them. I can't see Stanwin anywhere. So this fellow threatened your mother and you attacked him, eh, says Dicky, evidently having made up his mind. He beams at me, clapping me on the back. I see there's some of your father in you, after all. But how will sedating this ruffian help? I need a chance to talk with mother before he gets to her. For all Derby's faults, he's an accomplished liar, the deceit's cueing in orderly fashion on his tongue. Dr. Dickey's silent, rolling the story around his head, kneading it into shape as we cross into the abandoned east wing. I've got just the thing, should put the blighter out for the rest of the afternoon, he says, clicking his fingers. You wait here, I'll signal when it's done. Squaring his shoulders and puffing out his chest, he strides towards Stanwin's bedroom, the old soldier given one last battle to fight. It's too exposed in the corridor and once Dickie's out of sight, I step through the nearest door, my reflection staring back at me from a cracked mirror. Yesterday, I couldn't have imagined anything worse than being stuck inside Raven Court, but Derby's an entirely different torment a restless, malevolent imp scurrying between tragedies of his own devising. I can't wait to be free of him. Ten minutes later, the floorboards creak outside. Jonathan, whispers Dr. Dickey. Jonathan, where are you? Here, I say, poking my head outside. He's already past the room, and jumps at the sound of my voice. Gently, young man, the old ticker, you know, he says, tapping his chest. Cerberus is asleep and will be for most of the day. Now, I'm going to deliver my prognosis to Mr. Stanwin. I suggest you use this time to hide yourself somewhere he won't find you. Argentina, perhaps. Good luck to you. He stands to attention, offering me a sharp salute. I throw one back at him, earning a pat on the shoulder before he saunters off down the corridor, whistling tunelessly. I rather suspect I've made his day, but I have no intention of hiding. Stanwin is going to be distracted by Dicky for a few minutes at least, giving me a chance to search his belongings for Evelyn's letter. Crossing the reception room previously guarded by Stanwin's bodyguard, I open the door into the blackmailer's bedroom. It's a desolate place, the floorboards barely covered by a threadbare rug, a single iron bed pushed against the wall, flakes of white paint clinging stubbornly to the rust. The only comforts are a starving fire spitting ash and a small bedside table with two dog-eared books on it. As promised, Stanwin's man is asleep on the bed, looking for all the world like a monstrous marionette with all of its strings cut. His face is bandaged and he's snoring loudly, his fingers twitching. I can only imagine he's dreaming of my neck. Keeping an ear out for Stanwin's return, I quickly open the cupboard, 
sifting through the pockets of his jackets and trousers, finding only lint and mothballs. His trunk is equally bereft of personal objects, the man seemingly immune to sentiment of any kind. Frustrated, I check my watch. I've already been here longer than is safe, but Derby's not easily deterred. My host knows deceit. He knows men like Stanwin and the secrets they keep. The blackmailer could have had the most luxurious room in the house if he'd wanted, but he chose to sequester himself in a ruin. He's paranoid and clever. Whatever his secrets, he wouldn't carry them with him, not when he's surrounded by enemies. They're here. Hidden and under guard. My gaze falls on the fireplace and its anemic flames. Odd, considering how cold the bedroom is. Kneeling down, I stick my hand up the flume, feeling around and finding a small shelf, my groping fingers closing on a book. Withdrawing it, I see that it's a small black journal its cover bearing the scars of a lifetime's abuse. Stanwin was keeping the fire low to avoid scorching his prize. Flicking through the tattered pages, I discover it's a ledger of sorts containing a list of dates going back 19 years alongside entries written in strange symbols. It must be some sort of code. Evelyn's letter is stuffed between the last two pages. Dearest Evelyn, Mr. Stanwin has informed me of your plight, and I can quite understand your concern. Your mother's behavior is certainly alarming, and you're quite right to be on guard against whatever scheme she's cooking up. I stand ready to help, but I'm afraid Mr. Stanwin's word will not be enough. I require some proof of your agency in these matters. In the society pages, I've often seen you wearing a signet ring, a small castle engraved on its surface. Send me this, and I'll know of your serious intent. Warmest regards, Felicity Maddox looks like clever old Evelyn didn't accept her fate as easily as I first believed. She brought in somebody called Felicity Maddox to help, and the description of the small castle recalls the one drawn on the note at the well. It may be serving as a signature, which suggests the message to stay away from Millicent Derby was from Felicity. The bodyguard snores. Unable to wring any further information from the letter, I replace it in the ledger and slip both in my pocket. Thank heavens for devious minds, I mutter, stepping through the door. You said it, says somebody behind me. Pain explodes in my head as I slam into the floor. 27 day 2, continued, I'm coughing blood, red drops spattering my pillow. I'm back in the butler, my aching body screaming as my head jerks upwards. The plague doctor's sitting in Anna's chair one leg thrown across the other, his top hat in his lap. He's drumming it with his fingers, coming to a stop when he notices me stirring. Welcome back, Mr. Bishop, he says, his voice muffled by the mask. I stare at him absently, my coughing subsiding as I begin to piece together the pattern of this day. The first time I found myself in this body, it was morning. I answered the door to Bell and was attacked by Gold after running up the stairs for answers. The second time wasn't more than fifteen minutes later. I was transported to the gatehouse in the carriage with Anna. Must have been midday when I woke up and we were properly introduced, but, judging by the light outside the window, it's now early afternoon. It makes sense. Anna told me we get a full day in each of our hosts but it never occurred to me that I'd experience one in so many fragments. It feels like a perverse joke. I was promised eight hosts to solve this mystery, and I've been given them, except that Bell was a coward, the butler was beaten half to death, Donald Davies fled, Ravencourt could barely move, and Derby can't hold a thought. It's like I've been asked to dig a hole with a shovel made of sparrows. Shifting in his seat, the plague doctor leans closer to me. His clothes are musty, that old attic smell of something long forgotten and badly aired. Our last conversation was rather abrupt, he says. So I thought you might report on your progress. Have you discovered why did it have to be this body? I interrupt, wincing as a hot streak of pain shoots up through my side. Why trap me in any of these bodies? Ravencourt couldn't walk two steps without tiring, the butler's incapacitated and Derby's a monster. If you really want me to escape Blackheath, why stack the deck against me? 
there must be better alternatives. More able perhaps, but these men all have some connection to Evelyn's murder, he says. Making them best place to help you solve it. Their suspects. Witnesses would be a more apt description. A yawn shakes me, my energy already evaporating. Dr. Dickey must have given me another sedative. I feel as though I'm being squeezed out of this body through the feet. And who decides the order? I say. Why did I wake up as Bell first and Derby today? Is there any way for me to predict who I'll be next? Leaning back, he steeples his fingers and cocks his head. It's a lengthy silence, revaluating re and readjusting. Whether he's pleased by what he finds, or annoyed, I can't tell. Why are you asking these questions, he says eventually. Curiosity, I say, and when he doesn't respond to that, and I'm hoping there's some advantage to be found in the answers, I add. He makes a small grunt of approval. Good to see you're finally taking this seriously, he says. Very well. Under normal circumstances, you'd arrive in your hosts in the order they woke throughout the day. Fortunately for you, I've been tampering. Tampering. We've done this dance many times before, you and I, more than even I can recall. Loop after loop, I've set you the task of solving Evelyn Hardcastle's murder, and it's always ended in failure. At first, I thought the blame for this rested solely on your shoulders, but I've come to realize that the sequence of hosts plays a part. For example, Donald Davies wakes up at 3.19 a.m., which should make him your first host. That doesn't work because his life is so appealing. He has good friends in the house, family. Things you spend the loop trying to return to, rather than seeking to escape. It's for that reason I changed your first host to the more rootless Sebastian Bell, he says hoisting his trouser leg to scratch his ankle. In contrast, Lord Ravencourt doesn't stir until 10.30 a.m., which meant you shouldn't have visited him until much deeper in the loop, a period when haste, rather than intellect, is of the essence. I can hear the pride in his voice, the sense of a watchmaker standing back and admiring the mechanism he's built. Each new loop I experimented, making these sorts of decisions for each of your hosts, arriving at the order you're experiencing now, he says, spreading his hands magnanimously. In my opinion, this is the sequence that gives you the best chance of solving the mystery. So why haven't I returned to Donald Davies, the way I keep returning to the butler? Because you walked him down that endless road to the village for almost eight hours and he's exhausted, says the plague doctor, a hint of rebuke in his tone. He's currently sleeping deeply and will be until he checks his watch 9.38 p.m. Until then, you'll continue to be tugged between the butler and your other hosts. Wood creaks in the corridor. I consider calling for Anna, a thought which must show on my face, because the plague doctor tuts at me. Come now, how clumsy do you think I am, he says. Anna left a little while ago to meet with Lord Ravencourt. Believe me. I know the routines of this house as a director knows those of the actors in his play. If I had any doubt that we might be interrupted, I wouldn't be here. I have the sense of being a nuisance to him, an errant child in the headmaster's office again. Barely worth a scolding. A yawn rattles me, long and loud. My brain is clouding over. We have a few more minutes to talk before you fall asleep again, says the plague doctor clasping his gloved hands together, the leather squeaking. If you've any more questions for me, now would be the time. Why is Anna in Blackheath? I say quickly. You said I chose to come here, and my rivals didn't. That means she was brought here against her will. Why are you doing this to her? Any questions aside from that one, he says. Walking into Blackheath voluntarily brings certain advantages. There are also disadvantages, things your rivals instinctively understand, which you do not. I'm here to fill in those blanks, nothing more. Now, how goes the investigation into Evelyn Hardcastle's murder? She's one girl, I say wearily, struggling to keep my eyes open. The drugs are tugging at me with their warm hands. What makes her death worth all of this? I could ask you the same question, 
he says. You're going out of your way to save Miss Hardcastle, despite all the evidence suggesting it's impossible. Why is that? I can't watch her die and do nothing to prevent it, I say. That's very noble of you, he says, cocking his head. Then let me respond in kind. Miss Hardcastle's murder was never solved, and I don't believe such a thing should be allowed to stand. Does that satisfy you? People are murdered every day, I say. Writing one wrong can't be the only reason for all of this. An excellent point, he says, clapping his hands together in appreciation. But who's to say there aren't hundreds of others like yourself seeking justice for those souls? Are there? Doubtful, but it's a lovely thought, isn't it? I'm conscious of the effort of listening, the weight of my eyelids, the way the room is melting around me. We don't have much time I'm afraid, says the plague doctor. I should wait. I need to, why did, my words are sludge, thick in my mouth. You asked me? You asked, my memory, there's a great rustling of material as the plague doctor gets to his feet. Picking up a glass of water from the sideboard, he hurls the contents in my face. The water's freezing cold, my body convulses like a cracked whip, dragging me back to myself. Apologies, that was most irregular, he says, staring at the empty glass, clearly surprised at his actions. Normally I let you fall asleep at this point, but, well, I'm intrigued. He puts the glass down slowly. What did you want to ask me? Please choose your words carefully, they're of some import. Water stings my eyes and drips off my lips, the wetness spreading through my cotton nightshirt. When we first met, you asked me what I remembered when I woke up as Belle, I say. Why would that matter? Each time you fail, we strip your memories and start the loop again, but you always find a way to hold on to something important, a clue if you will, he says, dabbing the water from my forehead with a handkerchief. This time it was Anna's name. You told me it was a pity, I say. It is. Why? Along with the sequence of your hosts, the thing you choose to remember usually has a significant impact on how the loop plays out, he says. If you had remembered the footman, you'd have set off chasing him. At least that would have been useful. Instead, you've bound yourself to Anna, one of your rivals. She's my friend, I say. Nobody has friends in Blackheath, Mr. Bishop, and if you haven't learned that yet, I'm afraid there may be no hope for you. Can. The sedative is dragging at me once again. Can we both escape? No, he says, folding his damp handkerchief and replacing it in his pocket. An answer for an exit, that's how this works. At 11 p.m., one of you will come to the lake and give me the murderer's name, and that person will be allowed to leave. You're going to have to choose who that is. He lifts his gold watch from his breast pocket to check the time. Time runs away and I have a schedule to keep, he says, retrieving his cane from its spot by the door. Normally, I remain impartial in these matters, but there's something you should know before you trip over your nobility. Anna remembers more from the last loop than she's telling you. His gloved hand lifts my chin, his face so close to mine I can hear his breathing through the mask. He has blue eyes. Old, sad, blue eyes. She's going to betray you. I open my mouth to protest, but my tongue's too heavy to move, and the last thing I see is the plague doctor disappearing through the door a great stooped shadow dragging the world behind him. 28 Day 5, Continued, Life pounds on my eyelids. I blink, once, twice, but it hurts to keep them open. My head's a shattered egg. A noise escapes my throat. It's somewhere between a groan and a whimper, the low animal gurgle of a creature caught in a trap. I try to heave myself up, but the pain's an ocean, lapping around my skull. I don't have the strength to lift it. Time passes, I can't say how much. It isn't that sort of time. I watch my stomach rise and fall, and when I'm confident it can do so without my help, I drag myself into a sitting position, resting against the crumbling wall. Much to my dismay I'm back in Jonathan Derby, 
lying on the floor in the nursery. Pieces of a broken vase are everywhere, including my scalp. Somebody must have hit me from behind when I left Stanwin's bedroom, and then dragged me here out of sight. The letter, you fool. My hand leaps to my pocket, searching for Felicity's letter and the ledger I stole from Stanwin, but they're gone, along with the key to Belle's trunk. All that remains are the two headache pills given to me by Anna, which are still wrapped in the blue handkerchief. She's going to betray you. Could this be her doing? The plague doctor's warning couldn't have been any clearer, and yet surely an enemy wouldn't provoke such feelings of warmth, or kinship. Perhaps Anna does remember more from our last loop than she admits, but if that information was destined to make us enemies, why would I drag her name from one life into the next, knowing I would chase it like a dog after a burning stick? No, if there's betrayal afoot, it's a result of the empty promises I've made, and that's rectifiable. I need to find the right way of telling Anna the truth. Swallowing the tablets dry, I claw my way up the wall, staggering back into Stanwin's room. The bodyguard still unconscious on the bed, the light fading beyond the window. I check my watch to find it's 6 p.m., which means the hunters, including Stanwin, are probably already on their way home. For all I know, they're crossing the lawn or ascending the stairs even now. I need to leave before the blackmailer comes back. Even with the tablets, I'm woozy, the world slipping beneath me as I crash through the east wing before pushing aside the curtain to arrive on the landing above the entrance hall. Each step is a battle until I fall through Dr. Dickey's door, nearly vomiting on his floor. His bedroom's identical to all the others on this corridor, with a four-poster bed against one wall and a bath and sink behind a screen opposite. Unlike Bell. Dickie's made himself at home. Pictures of his grandchildren are dotted about the place, a crucifix hanging from one of the walls. He's even laid a small rug down, presumably to keep his feet off the cold wood in the mornings. This familiarity with oneself is a miracle to me, and I find myself gaping at Dickie's possessions, my wounds momentarily forgotten. Picking up the picture of his grandchildren, I wonder for the first time if I too have a family waiting beyond Blackheath, parents or children, friends who miss me. Startled by footsteps passing in the corridor, I drop the family picture on the bedside table, accidentally cracking the glass. The steps pass without incident, but awakened to the peril I move more quickly. Dickie's medical bag is nestled beneath his bed and I append it over his mattress, spilling bottles, scissors, syringes, and bandages onto the covers. The last thing out is a King James Bible, which bounces onto the floor, the pages falling open. Just like the one in Sebastian Bell's bedroom, certain words and paragraphs are underlined in red ink. It's a code. A wolf's smile spreads across Derby's face, recognition of another crook. If I had to guess, I'd say Dickie's a silent partner in Bell's drug peddling business. No wonder he was so concerned for the good doctor's welfare. He was worried about what he'd say. I snort. It's another secret in a house full of them, and it's not the one I'm after today. Gathering the bandages and iodine from the pile on the bed, I take them over to the sink and begin my surgery. It's not a delicate operation. Every time I pluck one piece loose, blood wells up between my fingers, running down my face and dripping off my chin into the sink. Tears of pain cloud my vision, the world a stinging blur for nearly thirty minutes while I pick apart my porcelain crown. My only consolation is that this must be hurting Jonathan Derby almost as much as it's hurting me. When I'm certain every shard has been removed, I set to work wrapping my head in bandages, securing them with a safety pin and inspecting my work in the mirror. The bandages look fine. I look terrible. My face is pale, my eyes hollow. Blood has stained my shirt, forcing me to strip down to my vest. I'm a man undone, coming apart at the seams. I can feel myself unraveling. What the devil, cries Dr. Dickey from the door. He's fresh from the hunt, dripping wet and shivering grey as the ashes in the grate. Even his moustache is sagging. I follow his disbelieving gaze around the room, seeing the devastation through his eyes. The picture of his grandchildren is cracked and smeared with blood, his Bible discarded, 
his medical bag tossed on the floor, its contents scattered across the bed. Bloody water fills the sink, my shirt in his bathtub. His surgery can't look much worse after an amputation. Catching sight of me in my vest, the bandage trailing loose from my forehead, the shock on his face turns to anger. What have you done, Jonathan, he demands, his voice swelling with rage. I'm sorry, I didn't know where else to go, I say, panicked. After you left, I searched Stanwin's room for something to help mother and I found a ledger. A ledger, he says in a strangled voice. You took something from him. You must put it back. Now, Jonathan, he yells, sensing my hesitation. I can't, I was attacked. Somebody smashed a vase across my head and stole it. I was bleeding and the bodyguard was going to wake up, so I came here. A dreadful silence swallows the end of the story as Dr. Dickey stands the picture of his grandchildren upright and slowly gathers everything back into his medical bag, sliding it back under the bed. He moves as though manacled, dragging my secrets behind him. It's my fault, he mutters. I knew you weren't to be trusted, but my affection for your mother, he shakes his head, pushing by me to collect my shirt from the bathtub. There's a resignation to his actions that frightens me. I didn't mean to I begin. You used me to steal from Ted Stanwin, he says quietly, gripping the edges of the counter. A man who can ruin me with a snap of his fingers. I'm sorry, I say. He turns suddenly, his anger thick. You've made that word cheap, Jonathan. You said it after we covered up that business in Ender Lee House, and again at Little Hampton. Remember? Now you'd have me swallow this hollow apology as well. He presses my shirt against my chest, his cheeks flushed red. Tears stand in his eyes. How many women have you forced yourself upon? Do you even remember? How many times have you wept at your mother's breast, begging her to fix it, promising never to do it again and knowing full well that you would? And now here you are again, doing the same to me, bloody. Stupid Dr. Dickey. Well, I'm done, I can't stomach it any more. You've been a blight on this world ever since I brought you into it. I take an imploring step towards him, but he pulls a silver pistol from his pocket, letting it dangle by his side. He's not even looking at me. Get out, Jonathan, or by God, I'll shoot you myself. Keeping one eye on the pistol, I back out of the room closing the door as I step into the corridor. My heart's thumping. Dr. Dickey's gun is the very same one Evelyn will use to take her life tonight. He's holding the murder weapon. 29 Quite how long I stare at Jonathan Derby in my bedroom mirror, it's impossible to say. I'm looking for the man within, some hint of my real face. I want Derby to see his executioner. Whiskey warms my throat the bottle plundered from the drawing room and already half empty. I needed to stop my hands from shaking as I try to knot my bow tie. Dr. Dickey's testimony confirmed what I already knew. Derby's a monster, his crimes washed away by his mother's money. There's no justice waiting for this man, no trial or punishment. If he's to pay for what he's done, I'll have to march him to the gallows myself, and that's what I intend to do. First though, we're going to save Evelyn Hardcastle's life. My gaze is drawn towards Dr. Dickey's silver pistol, lying harmless on an armchair like a fly swatted out of the air. Stealing it was a simple matter, as easy as sending a servant with an invented emergency to lure the doctor out of his room while I slipped in afterwards and took it from his nightstand. For too long I've allowed this day to dictate terms to me, but no longer. If somebody wishes to murder Evelyn with this pistol, they'll have to come through me first. The plague doctor's riddle be damned. I don't trust him and I won't stand idly by while horrors play out in front of me. It's time Jonathan Derby finally did some good on this earth. Slipping the pistol into my jacket pocket, I take one last mouthful of whiskey and step out into the corridor, following the other guests down the staircase to dinner. Unlike their manners, their taste is impeccable. Evening gowns expose naked backs and pale skin adorned with glittering jewelry. The listlessness of earlier is gone, 
their charm extravagant. At last, as evening calls, they've come alive. As always, I keep an eye out for some hint of the footman among these passing faces. He's long overdue a visit, and the longer the day goes on, the more certain I become that something dreadful is coming. At least it'll be a fair fight. Derby has very few laudable qualities, but his anger makes him a handful. I've barely been able to keep hold of him, so I can't imagine what it would be like to see him flying at you, dripping hate. Michael Hardcastle standing in the entrance hall with a painted-on smile, greeting those coming down the stairs, as though genuinely glad to see every last wretched one of them. I had intended on questioning him about the mysterious Felicity Maddox, and the note at the well, but it will have to wait until later. There's an impregnable wall of taffeta and bow ties between us. Piano music drags me through the crowds into the long gallery, where guests are mingling with drinks as servants prepare the dining hall on the other side of the doors. Taking a whiskey from one of the passing trays, I keep an eye out for Millicent. I'd hope to give Derby his goodbyes, but she's nowhere to be seen. In fact, the only person I recognize is Sebastian Bell, who's drifting through the entrance hall on his way to his room. Stopping a maid, I ask after Helena Hardcastle, hoping the lady of the house might be near at hand, but she hasn't arrived. That means she's been missing all day. Absence has officially become disappearance. It can't be coincidence that Lady Hardcastle is nowhere to be found on the day of her daughter's death, though whether she's a suspect or a victim I can't be sure. One way or another, I'm going to find out. My glass is empty, my head becoming foggy. I'm surrounded by laughter and conversation, friends and lovers. The good cheer is stirring Derby's bitterness. I can feel his disgust, his loathing. He hates these people, this world. He hates himself. Servants slip past me with silver platters, Evelyn's last meal arriving in a procession. Why isn't she afraid? I can hear her laughter from here. She's mingling with the guests as though all her days lie ahead. Yet when Ravencourt brought up the danger this morning, it was clear she knew something was amiss. Discarding my glass, I make my way through the entrance hall and into the corridor towards Evelyn's bedroom. If there are answers, perhaps that's where I'll find them. The lamps have been lowered to dim flames. It's quiet and oppressive, a forgotten edge of the world. I'm halfway up the passage when I notice a splash of red emerging from the shadows. A footman's livery. He's blocking the passage. I freeze. Glancing behind me, I try to work out whether I can reach the entrance hall before he's on me. The odds are slim. I'm not even sure my legs will listen when I tell them to move. Sorry, sir, says a chirpy voice, the footman taking a step closer and revealing himself to be a short, wiry boy, no more than thirteen, with pimples and a nervous smile. Excuse me. He adds after a moment, and I realize I'm in his way. Mumbling an apology, I let him pass and blow out an explosive breath. The footman's made me so afraid, the mere suggestion of his presence is enough to cripple even Derby, a man who'd throw a punch at the sun because it burned him. Was that his intention? The reason he taunted Bell and Ravencourt, rather than killing them? If this continues he'll be able to pick off my hosts without a shred of resistance. I'm earning the rabbit nickname he's given me. Proceeding cautiously, I continue to Evelyn's bedroom, finding it locked. Knocking brings no answer and, unwilling to leave without something to show for my efforts, I take a step backwards, intending to put my shoulder through it. That's when I notice the door to Helena's bedroom is in exactly the same place as the door into Ravencourt's parlor. Poking my head into both rooms, I find the dimensions are identical. That suggests Evelyn's bedroom was once a parlor. If that's the case, there will be a connecting door from Helena's room, which is useful, because the lock is still broken from this morning. My guess is proven correct, the connecting door is hidden behind an ornate tapestry hanging on the wall. Thankfully, it's unlocked and I'm able to slip through into Evelyn's room. Given her fractured relationship with her parents, I'd half expected to find her sleeping in a broom closet, but the bedroom is comfortable enough, if modest. 
there's a four-poster bed at the center, a bathtub, and bowl behind a curtain on a rail. Evidently the maid hasn't been allowed in for some time because the bath is full of cold, dirty water, towels discarded in soggy heaps on the floor, a necklace tossed carelessly on the dressing table beside a pile of scrunched-up tissues, all stained with makeup. The curtains are drawn, Evelyn's fire piled high with logs. Four oil lamps stand in the corners of the room, pinching the gloom between their flickering light and that of the fireplace. I'm shaking with pleasure, Derby's excitement at this intrusion a warm blush rising through my body. I can feel my spirit trying to recoil from my host, and it's all I can do to hold onto myself as I sift through Evelyn's possessions, searching for anything that might drive her towards the reflecting pool later tonight. She's a messy sort, discarded clothes stuffed wherever they happen to fit, costume jewelry heaped in the drawers, tangled up with old scarves and shawls. There's no system, no order, no hint that she allows a maid anywhere near her things. Whatever her secrets, she's hiding them from more than me. I catch myself stroking a silk blouse, frowning at my own hand before realizing it's not me that wants this, it's him. It's Derby. With a cry I pull my hand back, slamming the wardrobe shut. I can feel his yearning. He'd have me on my knees, pawing through her belongings, inhaling her scent. He's a beast and for a second he had control. Wiping the beads of desire from my forehead, I take a deep breath to collect myself before pushing on with the search. I narrow my concentration to a point, keeping hold of my thoughts, allowing no gap for him to creep through. Even so, the investigation is fruitless. About the only item of interest is an old scrapbook containing curios from Evelyn's life, old correspondence between herself and Michael, pictures from her childhood, scraps of poetry and musings from her adolescence, all combining to present a portrait of a very lonely woman who loved her brother desperately and now misses him terribly. Closing the book, I push it back under the bed where I found it departing the room as quietly as I came, dragging a thrashing derby within me. Thirty I'm sitting in an armchair in a dim corner of the entrance hall, the seat arranged to give me a clear view to Evelyn's bedroom door. Dinner's underway, but Evelyn will be dead in three hours and I plan to dog her every step to the reflecting pool. Such patience would normally be beyond my host, but I've discovered that he enjoys smoking, which is handy because it makes me light-headed dulling the cancer of Derby in my thoughts. It's a pleasant, if unexpected, benefit of this inherited habit. They'll be ready when you need them, says Cunningham, appearing through the fog and crouching by my chair. There's a pleased grin on his face I can make neither head nor tail of. Who'll be ready? I say, looking at him. This grin disappears, embarrassment taking its place as he lurches to his feet. I'm sorry. Mr. Derby, I thought you were somebody else, he says hastily. I am somebody else, Cunningham, it's me, Aiden. I still don't have the foggiest idea what you're talking about, though. You asked me to get some people together, he says. No, I didn't. Our confusions must mirror each other, because Cunningham's face has twisted into the same knot as my brain. I'm sorry, he said you'd understand says Cunningham. Who said? A sound draws my attention to the entrance hall, and, turning in my seat, I see Evelyn fleeing across the marble, weeping into her hands. Take this, I have to go, says Cunningham, thrusting a piece of paper into my hand with the phrase all of them written on it. Wait. I don't know what this means, I call after him, but it's too late, he's already gone. I'd follow him but Michael is chasing Evelyn into the entrance hall, and this is why I'm here. These are the missing moments that transform Evelyn from the brave, kind woman I met as Belle into the suicidal heiress who'll take her life by the reflecting pool. Evie, Evie, don't go, tell me what I can do, says Michael, catching her arm at the elbow. She shakes her head, tears sparkling in the candlelight, mirroring the diamonds flashing in her hair. I just... Her voice chokes. I need to, shaking her head, she shrugs him off, flying past me towards her bedroom. Fumbling the key into the lock, she slips inside, 
slamming the door shut behind her. Michael watches her go despondently, grabbing a glass of port from the tray Madeline's carrying to the dining hall. It disappears in one gulp, his cheeks flushing. Lifting the tray out of her hands, he waves the maid towards Evelyn's bedroom. Don't worry about this, see to your mistress, he orders. It's a grand gesture, somewhat undone by the confusion that follows as he tries to work out what to do with the thirty glasses of sherry, port and brandy he's inherited. From my seat, I watch Madeline rap on Evelyn's door, the poor maid becoming increasingly upset with every ignored entreaty. Finally, she returns to the entrance hall, where Michael is still casting around for somewhere to put the tray. I'm afraid Mademoiselle is, Madeline makes a despairing gesture. It's fine, Madeline, Michael says wearily. It's been a difficult day. Why don't you leave her be for now? I'm sure she'll call when she needs you. Madeline lingers uncertainly, looking back towards Evelyn's bedroom, but after a brief hesitation she does as he asks, disappearing down the servant's staircase towards the kitchen. Casting left and right for somewhere to dispense with the tray, Michael spots me watching him. I must look a damned fool, he says, blushing. More like an inept waiter, I say bluntly. I assume the dinner didn't go as planned. It's this business with Raven Court, he says, balancing the tray rather precariously across the padded arms of a nearby chair. Do you have one of those cigarettes spare? I emerge from the fog to hand him one, lighting it in his fingers. Does she really have to marry him? I ask. We're almost broke, old chum, he sighs, taking a long drag. Father's buying up every empty mine and blighted plantation in the empire. I give it a year or two before our coffers are completely dry. But I thought Evelyn and your parents didn't get on. Why would she agree to go through with it? For me, he says, shaking his head. My parents threatened to cut me off if she doesn't obey them. I'd be flattered if I didn't feel so damn guilty about it all. There must be another way. Father's wrung every penny he can out of those few banks still impressed by his title. If we don't get this money, well, truth be told, I don't know what will happen, but we'll end up poor and I'm fairly certain we'll be dreadful at it. Most people are, I say. Well, at least they've had practice, he says, tapping ash onto the marble floor. Why is there a bandage on your head? I touch it self-consciously, having quite forgotten it was there. I got on the wrong side of Stanwin, I say. I heard him arguing with Evelyn about somebody called Felicity Maddox, and tried to intervene. Felicity, he says, recognition showing on his face. You know the name. He pauses, taking a deep puff of his cigarette, before exhaling slowly. Old friend of my sister, he says. Can't imagine why they'd be arguing about her. Evelyn hasn't seen her in years. She's here in Blackheath, I say. She left a note for Evelyn at the well. Are you certain, he asks skeptically. She wasn't on the guest list and Evelyn didn't say anything to me. We're interrupted by a noise at the doorway, Dr. Dickey hurrying towards me. He places a hand on my shoulder and leans close to my ear. It's your mother, he whispers. You need to come with me. Whatever's happened, it's dreadful enough for him to have buried his antipathy towards me. Apologizing to Michael, I run after the doctor, my dread growing with every step, until finally he ushers me into her bedroom. The windows open, a cold gust snatching at the candle flames lighting the room. It takes my eyes a few seconds to adjust to the dimness, but finally I find her. Millicent's lying on her side in bed, eyes closed and chest still, as though she crawled under the covers for a quick nap. She'd begun dressing for dinner and has combed her usually wild grey hair straight, tying it up away from her face. I'm sorry, Jonathan, I know how close you were, he says. Grief squeezes me. No matter how much I tell myself that this woman isn't my mother, I can't make it let go. My tears arrive suddenly and silently. Trembling, I sit down in the wooden chair beside her bed, taking her still warm hand in mine. It was a heart attack, 
says Dr. Dickey in a pained voice. It would have happened very suddenly. He's standing on the other side of the bed, the emotion as raw on his face as my own. Wiping away a tear, he pulls the window shut, cutting off the cold breeze. The candles stand to attention, the light in the room solidifying into a warm, golden glow. Can I warn her? I say, thinking of the things I can put right tomorrow. He looks puzzled for a second, but clearly ascribes the question to grief, and answers me in a kind voice. No, he says, shaking his head. You couldn't have warned her. What if it was just her time, Jonathan, he says softly. I nod, it's all I can manage. He stays a little longer, wrapping me in words I neither hear, nor feel. My grief is a bottomless well. All I can do is fall and hope to hit the bottom. Yet the deeper I go, the more I realize I'm not weeping solely for Millicent Derby. There's something else down here, something deeper than my host's grief, something that belongs to Aidan Bishop. It's raw and desperate, sad and angry, beating at the core of me. Derby's grief has revealed it, but hard as I try I can't quite pull it up, out of the dark. Leave it buried. What is it? A piece of you, now leave it alone. A knock at the door distracts me, and looking at the clock I realize over an hour's past. There's no sign of the doctor. He must have left without me noticing. Evelyn pokes her head into the room. Her face is pale, cheeks red with cold. She's still dressed in the blue ball gown, though it's picked up a few creases since I last saw her. The tiara is poking from the pocket of her long beige coat. Wellington boots leaving a trail of mud and leaves on the floor. She must have only just returned from the graveyard with Belle. Evelyn, I intend to say more, but I choke on my sorrow. Evelyn gathers the shards of the moment together, then tuts and enters the room, heading straight for a bottle of whiskey on the sideboard. The glass has barely touched my lips when she tips it upwards, forcing me to drink it down in one swallow. Gagging, I push the glass away whiskey running down my chin. Why would you, well, you can hardly help me in your current state, she says. Help you. She's studying me, turning me over in her mind. She hands me a handkerchief. Wipe your chin, you look atrocious, she says. I'm afraid sorrow doesn't suit that arrogant face at all well. How it's a very long story, she says. And I'm afraid we're somewhat pressed for time. I sit dumbly, struggling to take everything in, wishing for the clarity of Ravencourt's mind. So much has happened, so much I can't quite piece together. I already felt as if I was staring at the clues through a foggy magnifying glass, and now Evelyn's here, tugging a bedsheet over Millicent's face, calm as a summer day. Try as I might, I can't keep up. Quite clearly, that little tantrum at dinner regarding her engagement was an act because there's no trace of that crippling sadness about her now. Her eyes are clear, her tone contemplative. So I'm not the only one dying tonight, she says, stroking the old lady's hair. What a miserable thing. The glass falls from my hand in shock. You know about the reflecting pool, yes. Curious affair, isn't it? She has a dreamy tone as though describing something she once heard and now only half remembers. I'd suspect her mind of having buckled in some way, if it weren't for the hard edge to her words. You seem to be taking the news rather well, I say cautiously. You should have seen me this morning, I was so angry I was kicking holes in the walls. Evelyn's running her hand along the edge of the dressing table, opening Millicent's jewelry box, touching the pearl-handled brush. I'd describe her actions as covetous, if there didn't appear to be an equal amount of reverence. Who wants you dead, Evelyn? I ask, unnerved by this curious display. I don't know, she says. There was a letter pushed under my door when I woke up. The instructions were quite specific. But you don't know who sent it. Constable Rashton has a theory, but he's kept it rather close to his chest. Rashton. Your friend. He told me you were helping him investigate. Doubt and distaste seep out of every word, 
but I'm too intrigued to take it personally. Could this Rashton be another host? Maybe even the same man who asked Cunningham to deliver that all of them message, and gather some people together. Either way, he seems to have swept me up into his plan. Whether I can trust it is another matter. Where did Rashton approach you? I ask. Mr. Derby, she says firmly. I'd love nothing more than to sit down and answer all your questions, but we don't really have time. I'm expected at the reflecting pool in ten minutes and I can't be late. In fact, that's why I'm here, I need the silver pistol you took from the doctor. You can't mean to go through with this, I say, jumping up from my seat in alarm. As I understand it, your friends are close to unmasking my would-be killer. They simply need a little more time. If I don't go, the killer will know something is wrong, and I can't risk that. I'm beside her in two steps, my pulse racing. Are you saying they know who's behind all of this? I say excitedly. Did they give you any indication who it might be? Evelyn's holding one of Millicent Derby's cameos up to the light, an ivory face on blue lace. Her hand is shaking. It's the first sign of fear I've seen from her. They didn't, but I hope they find out soon. I'm trusting your friends to save me before I'm forced to do something, final. Final. I say. The note was specific, either I take my life out by the reflecting pool at 11 p.m. or somebody I care about very deeply dies in my stead. Felicity. I ask. I know you collected a note from her at the well, and that you asked her for her assistance with your mother. Michael said she was an old friend. Is she in danger? Is somebody holding her against her will? That would explain why I haven't been able to find her. The jewelry box clatters shut. Evelyn turns to face me, hands now pressed flat against the dressing table. I don't mean to sound impatient, but don't you have somewhere to be, she says. I was asked to remind you about a rock that needs watching. Does that make any sense to you? I nod remembering the favor Anna asked of me earlier this afternoon. I'm to be standing by it when Evelyn kills herself. I wasn't to move. Not an inch, she'd said. In that case my work here is done and I should go, says Evelyn. Where's the silver pistol? Even in her small fingers, it seems an inconsequential thing, more decoration than weapon, an embarrassing way to end a life. I wonder if that's the point if there's not some quiet rebuke in the instrument of death, as there is in the method. Evelyn isn't merely being murdered, she's being embarrassed, dominated. Every choice has been taken from her. What a pretty way to die, says Evelyn, staring at the pistol. Please don't be late, Mr. Derby, I suspect my life depends upon it. After a final glance towards the jewelry box, she's gone. 31 Hugging myself against the cold, I stand over Anna's carefully placed rock, terrified of taking even a small step to my left, where at least I'd be warmed by one of the braziers. I don't know why I'm here, but if it's part of a plan to save Evelyn, I'll stand in this spot until my blood turns to ice. Glancing towards the trees I catch sight of the plague doctor in his usual location, half hidden by gloom. He's not looking at the reflecting pool as I thought when I witnessed this moment through Ravencourt's eyes, but away to his right. The angle of his head suggests he's talking to somebody, though I'm too far away to see who. Either way, it's an encouraging sign. Evelyn suggested she'd found allies among my hosts, and surely, in those bushes, somebody is waiting to come to her aid? Evelyn arrives at eleven exactly, the silver pistol hanging limp in her hand. Drifting from shadow to flame, she follows the braziers, her blue ball gown trailing in the grass. I long to tear the pistol from her grasp, but somewhere beyond my sight an invisible hand is working, pulling levers I can't possibly understand. Any minute now somebody will call out, I'm certain of it. One of my future hosts will come sprinting into the darkness, telling Evelyn it's over and the murderer is captured. She'll drop the gun and sob her thanks while Daniel presents his plan for both Anna and me to escape. For the first time since all this began, I feel myself part of something bigger. Encouraged by this, 
I root my feet, hovering over my rock. Evelyn's come to a stop at the edge of the water, looking around at the trees. For a second, I think she'll spot the plague doctor, but she pulls her gaze back before reaching him. She's unsteady, swaying slightly as though moved by some music only she can hear. The flames from the brazier are reflected in the diamonds of her necklace, liquid fire pouring down her throat. She's trembling, desperation mounting on her face. Something's wrong. I glance back towards the ballroom to find Ravencourt at the window, looking longingly towards his friend. Words are forming on his lips, but they're too late to do any good. God help me, Evelyn whispers to the night. Tears streaming down her cheeks, she turns the gun towards her stomach and pulls the trigger. The shot is so loud it cracks the world, drowning out my anguished scream. In the ballroom, the party holds its breath. Surprised faces turn towards the reflecting pool, their eyes seeking out Evelyn. She's clutching her stomach, blood seeping out from between her fingers. She looks confused, as though she's been handed something she shouldn't have been, but before she can make sense of it, she buckles, falling forwards into the water. Fireworks explode in the night sky, as guests stream through the French doors, pointing and gasping. Somebody's running towards me their footsteps pounding the dirt. I turn in time to take their full weight in my chest, sending me sprawling to the ground. Trying to scramble to their feet, they only succeed in scraping my face with their fingers, a knee jabbing into my stomach. Derby's temper, already clawing to be let out, takes hold of me. With a scream of rage, I begin pounding at this shape in the darkness, clutching their clothing even as they try to wrestle their way free. Howling in frustration, I'm pulled off the ground, my opponent similarly lofted away, both of us held fast by servants. Lantern light spills across us, revealing a furious Michael Hardcastle desperately trying to break free of Cunningham's strong arms, which are keeping him from Evelyn's stricken form. I stare at him in astonishment. It's changed. The revelation knocks the fight out of me my body going limp in the servant's arms as I stare at the reflecting pool. When I saw this event as Raven Court, Michael clung to his sister, unable to move her. Now a tall fellow in a trench coat is pulling her out of the water, covering her blood-soaked body with Dickie's jacket. The servant lets me go and I drop to my knees in time to see a sobbing Michael Hardcastle led away by Cunningham. Determined to soak up as much of this miracle as possible, my gaze darts this way and that. Up by the reflecting pool, Dr. Dickey's kneeling by Evelyn's body, discussing something with the other man, who appears to be in charge. Ravencourt's retreated to a couch in the ballroom, and is sitting slumped over his cane, lost in thought. The band is being harangued by drunken guests who, oblivious to the horror outside, want them to carry on playing, while servants stand idle, crossing themselves when they draw closer to the body under the jacket. Heaven knows how long I sit there in the darkness, watching all this unfold. Long enough for everybody else to be ushered into the house by the fellow in the trench coat. Long enough for Evelyn's limp body to be carried away. Long enough to grow cold, to grow stiff. Long enough for the footman to find me. He appears around the far corner of the house, a small sack tied to his waist, blood dripping off his hands. Taking out his knife he begins drawing the blade back and forth across the rim of a brazier. I can't tell whether he's sharpening it, or simply warming it, but I suspect it's irrelevant. He wants me to see it, to hear that unsettling scrape of metal against metal. He's watching me, waiting for my reaction, and, looking at him now, I wonder how anybody ever mistook him for a servant. Though he's dressed in a footman's red and white livery, he possesses none of the traditional subservience. He's tall and thin, languid in his movements, with dirty blonde hair and a teardrop face, dark eyes above a smirk that would be charming if it weren't so empty. And then there's that broken nose. It's purple and swollen, distorting his features. By the light of the fire, he looks like a creature dressing up as human, the mask slipping. The footman holds up the knife to better inspect his work. Satisfied, he uses it to cut the sack from his waist tossing it at my feet. It hits the ground with a thud, 
the material soaked through with blood and tied shut with a drawstring. He wants me to open it, but I have no intention of indulging him. Getting to my feet, I peel off my jacket and work loose the kinks in my neck. In the back of my mind, I can hear Anna screaming at me, demanding I run. She's right, I should be afraid, and in any other host, I would be. This is clearly a trap, but I'm tired of fearing this man. It's time to fight, if only to convince myself I can. For a moment, we watch each other, the rain falling and the wind swirling. Unsurprisingly, it's the footman who forces the issue, turning on his heel and sprinting into the darkness of the forest. Bellowing like a lunatic, I charge after him. As I cross into the forest, the trees huddle around me, branches scratch my face, the foliage thickening. My legs are tiring, but I keep running until I realize I can't hear him anymore. Skidding to a halt, I spin on the spot, panting. He's on me in seconds, covering my mouth to stifle my scream as the blade enters my side and tears up into my ribcage, blood burbling into my throat. My knees buckle, but I'm prevented from falling by his strong arms around me. He's breathing shallowly, eagerly. This isn't the sound of tiredness, it's excitement and anticipation. A match flares, a tiny point of light held in front of my face. He's kneeling down directly opposite, his pitiless black eyes boring into me. Brave rabbit, he says, slitting my throat. 32 day 6 wake up. Wake up, Aiden. Somebody's banging on my door. You have to wake up, Aiden. Aiden. Swallowing my tiredness, I blink at my surroundings. I'm in a chair, clammy with sweat, my clothes twisted tight around me. It's night time, a candle guttering on a nearby table. There's a tartan blanket over my lap, old man's hands laid across a dog-eared book. Veins bulge in wrinkled flesh, crisscrossing dry ink stains and liver spots. I flex my fingers, stiff with age. Aiden, please says the voice in the corridor. Rising from my chair, I move to the door, old aches stirring throughout my body like swarms of disturbed hornets. The hinges are loose, the bottom corner of the door scraping against the floor, revealing the lanky figure of Gregory Gold on the other side, slumped against the door frame. He looks much as he will when he attacks the butler, though his dinner jacket's torn and caked with mud, his breathing ragged. He's clutching the chess piece Anna gave me, and that, together with his use of my real name, is enough to convince me that he's another of my hosts. Normally, I'd welcome such a meeting, but he's in a frightful state, agitated and disheveled, a man dragged to hell and back. Upon seeing me, he grips my shoulders. His dark eyes are bloodshot, flicking this way and that. Don't get out of the carriage, he says, spittle hanging off his lips. Whatever you do, don't get out of the carriage. His fear is a disease, the infection spreading through me. What happened to you? I ask, a tremor in my voice. He, he never stops, never stops what? I ask. Gold's shaking his head, pounding his temples. Tears stream down his cheeks, but I don't know how to begin comforting him. Never stops what, Gold? I ask again. Cutting, he says, drawing up his sleeve to reveal the slices beneath. They look exactly like the knife wounds Bell woke up with that first morning. You won't want to, you won't, but you'll give her up, you'll tell, you'll tell them everything, you won't want to, but you'll tell, he babbles. There's two of them. Two. They look the same, but there's two. His mind's broken, I can see that now. There isn't an ounce of sanity left to the man. I reach out a hand, hoping to draw him into the room, but he takes fright, backing away until he bumps into the far wall, only his voice remaining. Don't get out of the carriage, he hisses at me, wheeling away down the corridor. I take a step out after him, but it's too dark to see anything and by the time I return with a candle, the corridor's empty. 33 Day 2, Continued the butler's body, the butler's pain, heavy with sedative. It's like coming home. 
I'm barely awake, and already slipping back towards sleep. It's getting dark. A man's pacing back and forth across the tiny room, a shotgun in his arms. It's not the plague doctor. It's not gold. He hears me stir, and turns around. He's in shade, I can't make him out. I open my mouth, but no words come out of it. I close my eyes, and slip away again. 34 Day 6, Continued, Father I'm startled to find the freckled face of a young man with red hair and blue eyes inches from my own. I'm old again, sitting in my chair with the tartan blanket across my lap. The boy is bent at 90 degrees, hands clasped behind his back as though he doesn't trust them in company. My scowl shoves him a step backwards. You asked me to wake you at 9.15, he says apologetically. He smells of scotch, tobacco, and fear. It wells up within him, staining the whites of his eyes yellow. They're wary and hunted, like an animal waiting for the shot. It's light beyond the window, my candle long gone out and the fire down to ash. My vague memory of being the butler proves I dozed off after Gold's visit, but I don't remember doing so. The horror of what Gold endured what I must soon endure kept me pacing into the early hours. Don't get out of the carriage. It was a warning and a plea. He wants me to change the day, and while that's exhilarating, it's also disturbing. I know it can be done, I've seen it, but if I'm clever enough to change things, the footman is as well. For all I know, we're running in circles undoing each other's work. This is no longer simply about finding the right answer, it's about holding onto it long enough to deliver it to the plague doctor. I have to speak with the artist at the first opportunity. I shift in my seat, tugging aside the tartan blanket, bringing the slightest flinch from the boy. He stiffens, looking at me sideways to see if I've noticed. Poor child, he's had all the bravery beaten out of him and now he's kicked for being a coward. My sympathy fares ill with my host, whose distaste for his son is absolute. He considers this boy's meekness infuriating his silence and affront. He's a failure, an unforgivable failure. My only one. I shake my head, trying to free myself of this man's regrets. The memories of Bell, Ravencourt, and Derby were objects in a fog, but the clutter of this current life is scattered around me. I cannot help but trip over it. Despite the suggestion of infirmity given by the blanket, I rise with only a little stiffness, stretching to a respectable height. My sons retreated to the corner of the room, draping himself in shadows. Though the distance is not great, it's too far for my host, whose eyes falter at half the span. I search for spectacles, knowing it's pointless. This man considers age a weakness, the result of a faltering will. There'll be no spectacles, no walking stick, no aid of any sort. Whatever burdens are heaped upon me, they're mine to endure alone. I can feel my son weighing my mood, watching my face as one watches the clouds for an approaching storm. Spit it out, I say gruffly, agitated by his reticence. I was hoping I might be excused this afternoon's hunt, he says. The words are laid at my feet, two dead rabbits for a hungry wolf. Even this simple request grates upon me. What young man doesn't want to hunt? What young man creeps and crawls? tiptoeing around the edges of the world rather than trampling across the top of it. My urge is to refuse, to make him suffer for the temerity of being who he is, but I bite the desire back. We'll both be happier beyond each other's company. Very well, I say, waving him away. Thank you, father, he says, escaping the room before I can change my mind. In his absence my breathing eases, my hands unclench. Anger takes its arms from around my chest, leaving me free to investigate the room for some reflection of its owner. Books lie three thick on the bedside table, all dealing in the murky details of law. My invitation to the ball is being used as a bookmark and is addressed to Edward and Rebecca Dance. That name alone is enough to make me crumble. I remember Rebecca's face, her smell. The feeling of being near her. My fingers find the locket around my neck her portrait cradled inside. Dance's grief is a quiet ache, 
a single tear once a day. It's the only luxury he allows himself. Pushing aside the grief, I drum the invite with my finger. Dance, I murmur. A peculiar name for such a joyless man. Knocking perforates the silence, the handle turning and the door opening seconds later. The fellow who enters is large and shambling, scratching a head full of white hair, dislodging dandruff in every direction. He's wearing a rumpled blue suit below white whiskers and bloodshot red eyes, and would look quite frightful if it weren't for the comfort with which he carries his dishevelment. He pauses mid-scratch, blinking at me in bewilderment. This your room is it, Edward, asks the stranger. Well, I woke up here, I say warily. Blast, I can't remember where they put me. Where did you sleep last night? Sunroom, he says scratching an armpit. Harrington bet me I couldn't finish a bottle of port in under 15 minutes, and that's the last thing I remember until that scoundrel gold woke me up this morning, ranting and raving like a lunatic. The mention of gold takes me back to his rambling warning last night, and the scars on his arm. Don't get out of the carriage, he'd said. Does that suggest I'll be leaving at some point? Or taking a journey? I already know I can't reach the village, so it seems unlikely. Did Gold say anything? I ask. Do you know where he was going, or what his plans were? I didn't stop and sup with the man, Dance, he says dismissively. I took his measure, and let him know in no uncertain terms I had my eye on him. He glances around. Did I leave a bottle in here? Need something to quieten this damnable headache. I've barely opened my mouth to respond when he starts rooting through my drawers, leaving them standing open as he turns his assault upon the wardrobe. After patting down the pockets of my suits, he spins, surveying the room as though he's just heard a lion in the bushes. Another knock, another face. This one belongs to Commander Clifford Harrington, the boring naval chap who was sitting next to Ravencourt at dinner. Come along, you two, he says checking his watch. Old hard castles waiting for us. Freed from the blight of strong alcohol, he's straight-backed and authoritative. Any idea what he wants from us? I ask. None whatsoever, but I expect he'll tell us when we get there, he responds, briskly. I need my walking scotch, says my companion. There's sure to be some over at the gatehouse, Sutcliffe, says Harrington not bothering to hide his impatience. Besides, you know Hardcastle, he's damned serious these days, probably best if we don't turn up half-cut. Such is the strength of my connection to dance that the mere mention of Lord Hardcastle causes me to puff out my cheeks in annoyance. My host's presence in Blackheath is a matter of obligation, a fleeting visit lasting only so long as it takes to conclude his business with the family. In contrast, I'm desperate to question the master of the house about his missing wife, and my enthusiasm for our meeting is rubbing up against Dance's agitation like sandpaper on skin. Somehow, I'm annoying myself. Badgered once again by the impatient naval officer, the shambling Sutcliffe holds up a hand, begging an extra minute, before turning his desperate fingers loose among my shelves. Sniffing the air, he lurches towards the bed lifting the mattress to reveal a pilfered bottle of scotch on the springs. Lead on, Harrington, old boy, he says magnanimously, unscrewing the cap and taking a hearty slug. Shaking his head, Harrington gestures us out into the corridor, where Sutcliffe begins telling a boisterous joke at the top of his voice, his friend trying, unsuccessfully, to quieten him. They're buffoons both, their good cheer possessing an arrogance that sets my teeth on edge. My host has little time for excess of any kind and would happily stride off ahead, but I do not want to walk these corridors alone. As a compromise, I follow two steps behind, far enough away that I don't have to join the conversation, but close enough to give the footman pause should he be lurking nearby. We're met at the bottom of the stairs by somebody called Christopher Pettigrew, who turns out to be the oily chap Daniel was conferring with at dinner. He's a thin man, built to sneer with dark, greasy hair swept over to one side. He's as stooping and sly as I remember, 
his gaze running its hands through my pockets before taking in my face. I wondered two nights ago if he might be a future host, but if so I must have given myself freely to his vices as he's already soft with alcohol, happily taking up the bottle being shared between his chums. It never veers in my direction, meaning I never have to refuse. Clearly, Edward Dance stands apart from this rabble and I'm happy it's so. They're a queer bunch, friends certainly, but desperately so, like three men stranded on the same island. 